Chapter 11 of The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt. Chapter 11 The Big Flap. In early June 1952, Project Blue Book was operating according to the operational plan that had been set up in January 1952. It had taken six months to put the plan into effect, and to a person who has never been indoctrinated into the ways of the military, this may seem like a long time. But consult your nearest government worker, and you'll find that it was about par for the red tape course. We had learned early in the project that about 60% of the reported UFOs were actually balloons, airplanes, or astronomical bodies viewed under unusual conditions, so our operational plan was set up to quickly weed out this type of report. This would give us more time to concentrate on the unknown cases. To weed out reports in which balloons, airplanes, and astronomical bodies were reported as UFOs, we utilized a flow of data that continually poured into Project Blue Book. We received position reports on all flights of the big skyhook balloons, and by merely picking up the telephone, we could get the details about the flight of any other research balloon or regularly scheduled weather balloon in the United States. The location of aircraft in an area where a UFO had been reported was usually checked by the intelligence officer who made the report, but we double-checked his findings by requesting the location of flights from CAA and military air bases. Astronomical almanacs and journals, star charts, and data that we got from observatories furnished us with clues to UFOs that might be astronomical bodies. All of our investigations in this category of report were double-checked by Project Bear's astronomer. Then we had our newspaper clipping file, which gave us many clues. Hydrographic bulletins and NOTAMs, notices to airmen, published by the government, sometimes gave us other clues. Every six hours we received a complete set of weather data. A dozen or more other sources of data that might shed some light on a reported UFO were continually being studied. To get all this information on balloons, aircraft, astronomical bodies, and what have you, I had to coordinate Project Blue Book's operational plan with the Air Force's Air Weather Service, Flight Service, Research and Development Command, and Air Defense Command, with the Navy's Office of Naval Research, and the aerology branch of the Bureau of Aeronautics, and with the Civil Aeronautics Administration, Bureau of Standards, several astronomical observatories, and our own Project Bear. Our entire operational plan was similar to a Model A Ford I had while I was in high school, but just about the time you would get one part working, another part would break down. When a report came through our screening process and still had the unknown tag on it, it went to the M.O. file, where we checked its characteristics against other reports. For example, on May 25th, we had a report from Randolph Air Force Base, Texas. It went through the screening process and came out unknown. It wasn't a balloon, airplane, or astronomical body. So then it went to the M.O. file. It was a flock of ducks reflecting the city lights. We knew that the Texas UFOs were ducks because our M.O. file showed that we had an identical report from Moorhead, Minnesota, and the UFOs at Moorhead were ducks. Radar reports that came into Blue Book went to the radar specialists of ATIC's electronics branch. Sifting through reams of data in search of the answers to the many reports that were pouring in each week required many hours of overtime work, but when a report came out with the final conclusion, unknown, we were sure that it was unknown. To operate Project Blue Book, I had four officers, two airmen, and two civilians on my permanent staff. 
In addition, there were three scientists employed full-time on Project Bear, along with several others who worked part-time. In the Pentagon, Major Fournay, who had taken on the Blue Book liaison job as an extra duty, was now spending full time on it. If you add to this the number of intelligence officers all over the world who were making preliminary investigations and interviewing UFO observers, Project Blue Book was a sizable effort. Only the best reports we received could be personally investigated in the field by Project Blue Book personnel. The vast majority of the reports had to be evaluated on the basis of what the intelligence officer who had written the report had been able to uncover, or what data we could get by telephone or by mailing out a questionnaire. Our instructions for what to do before the Blue Book Man arrives, which had been printed in many service publications, were beginning to pay off and the reports were continually getting more detailed. The questionnaire we were using in June 1952 was the one that had recently been developed by Project Bear. Project Bear, along with psychologists from a Midwestern university, had worked on it for five months. Many test models had been tried before it reached its final form, the standard questionnaire that Blue Book is using today. It ran eight pages and had 68 questions which were booby-trapped in a couple of places to give us a cross-check on the reliability of the reporter as an observer. We received quite a few questionnaires answered in such a way that it was obvious that the observer was drawing heavily on his imagination. From this standard questionnaire, the project worked up two more specialized types. One dealt with radar sightings of UFOs, the other with sightings made from airplanes. In Air Force terminology, a flap is a condition or situation or state of being of a group of people characterized by an advanced degree of confusion that has not quite yet reached panic proportions. It can be brought on by any number of things, including the unexpected visit of an inspecting general, a major administrative reorganization the arrival of a hot piece of intelligence information, or the dramatic entrance of a well-stacked female into an officer's club bar. In early June 1952, the Air Force was unknowingly in the initial stages of a flap, a flying saucer flap, THE flying saucer flap of 1952. The situation had never been duplicated before, and it hasn't been duplicated since. All records for the number of UFO reports were not just broken, they were disintegrated. In 1948, 167 UFO reports had come into ATIC. This was considered a big year. In June 1952, we received 149. During the four years the Air Force had been in the UFO business, 615 reports had been collected. During the big flap, our incoming message log showed 717 reports. To anyone who had anything to do with flying saucers, the summer of 1952 was just one big swirl of UFO reports, hurried trips, midnight telephone calls, reports to the Pentagon, press interviews, and very little sleep. If you can pin down a date that the big flap started, it would probably be about June 1st. It was also on June 1st that we received a good report of a UFO that had been picked up on radar. June 1st was a Sunday, but I'd been at the office all day getting ready to go to Los Alamos the next day. About 5 o'clock p.m. the telephone rang, and the operator told me that I had a long-distance call from California. My caller was the chief of a radar test section for Hughes Aircraft Company in Los Angeles, and he was very excited about a UFO he had to report. That morning he and his test crew had been checking out a new late-model radar to get it ready for some tests they planned to run early Monday morning. To see if their set was functioning properly, they had been tracking jets in the Los Angeles area. 
About mid-morning, the Hughes test engineer told me, the jet traffic had begun to drop off and they were about ready to close down their operation when one of the crew picked up a slow-moving target coming across the San Gabriel Mountains north of Los Angeles. He tracked the target for a few minutes and, from the speed and altitude, decided that it was a DC-3. It was at 11,000 feet and traveling about 180 miles an hour toward Santa Monica. The operator was about ready to yell at the other crew members to shut off the set when he noticed something mighty odd. There was a big gap between the last and the rest of the regularly spaced bright spots on the radar scope. The man on the scope called the rest of the crew in because DC-3s just don't triple their speed. They watched the target as it made a turn and started to climb over Los Angeles. They plotted one, two, three, and then four points during the target's climb. Then one of the crew grabbed a slide rule. Whatever it was, it was climbing 35,000 feet per minute and traveling about 550 miles an hour in the process. Then, as they watched the scope, the target leveled out for a few seconds, went into a high-speed dive, and again leveled out at 55,000 feet. When they lost the target, it was heading southeast somewhere near Riverside, California. During the sighting, my caller told me that when the UFO was only about 10 miles from the radar site, two of the crew had gone outside, but they couldn't see anything. But, he explained, even the high-flying jets that they had been tracking hadn't been leaving vapor trails. The first thing I asked when the Hughes test engineer finished his story was if the radar set had been working properly. He said that as soon as the UFO had left the scope, they had run every possible check on the radar, and it was okay. I was just about to ask my caller if the target might not have been some experimental airplane from Edwards Air Force Base when he second-guessed me. He said that after sitting around looking at each other for about a minute, someone suggested that they call Edwards. They did, and Edwards Flight Operations told him that they had nothing in the area. I asked him about the weather. The target didn't look like a weather target, was the answer, but just to be sure, the test crew had checked. One of his men was an electronics weather specialist, whom he had hired because of his knowledge of the idiosyncrasies of radar under certain weather conditions. This man had looked into the weather angle. He had gotten the latest weather data and checked it, but there wasn't the slightest indication of an inversion or any other weather that would cause a false target. Just before I hung up, I asked the man what he thought he and his crew had picked up, and once again I got the same old answer. Yesterday, at this time, any of us would have argued for hours that flying saucers were a bunch of nonsense, but now, regardless of what you'll say about what we saw, it was something damned real. I thanked the man for calling and hung up. We couldn't make any more of an analysis of this report than had already been made. It was another unknown. I went over to the M.O. file and pulled out the stack of cards behind the tab High Speed Climb. There must have been at least a hundred cards, each one representing a UFO report, in which the reported object made a high-speed climb. But this was the first time radar had tracked a UFO during a climb. During the early part of June, Project Blue Book took another jump up on the organizational chart. A year before, the UFO project had consisted of one officer. It had risen from the one-man operation to a project within a group, then to a group, and now it was a section. Neither Project Sign nor the old Project Grudge had been higher than the project within a group level. The chief of a group normally calls for a lieutenant colonel and since I was just a captain, this caused some consternation in the ranks. 
There was some talk about putting Lieutenant Colonel Ray Taylor of Colonel Dunn's staff in charge. Colonel Taylor was very much interested in UFOs. He had handled some of the press contacts prior to turning this function over to the Pentagon and had gone along with me on briefings, so he knew something about the project. But in the end, Colonel Donald Bauer, who was my division chief, decided rank be damned and I stayed on as chief of Project Blue Book. The location within the organization chart is always indicative of the importance placed on a project. In June 1952, the Air Force was taking the UFO problem seriously. One of the reasons was that there were a lot of good UFO reports coming in from Korea. Fighter pilots reported seeing silver-colored spheres or disks on several occasions, and radar in Japan, Okinawa, and in Korea had tracked unidentified targets. In June, our situation map, on which we kept a plot of all of our sightings, began to show an ever-so-slight trend toward reports beginning to bunch up on the East Coast. We discussed this build-up, but we couldn't seem to find any explainable reason for it, so we decided that we'd better pay special attention to reports coming from the eastern states. I had this build-up of reports in mind one Sunday night, June 15th to be exact, when the O.D. at ATIC called me at home and said that we were getting a lot of reports from Virginia. Each report by itself wasn't too good, the O.D. told me, but together they seemed to mean something. He suggested that I come out and take a look at them, so I did. Individually, they weren't too good, but when I lined them up chronologically and plotted them on a map, they took the form of a hot report. At 3.40 p.m., a woman in Unionville, Virginia, had reported a very shiny object at high altitude. At 4.20 p.m., the operators of the CAA radio facility at Gordonsville, Virginia, had reported that they saw a round, shiny object. It was southeast of their station, or directly south of Unionville. At 4.25 p.m., the crew of an airliner northwest of Richmond, Virginia, reported a silver sphere at 11 o'clock high. At 4.43 p.m., a marine pilot in a jet tried to intercept a round shiny sphere south of Gordonsville. At 5.43 p.m., an Air Force T-33 jet tried to intercept a shiny sphere south of Gordonsville. He got above 35,000 feet, and the UFO was still far above him. At 7.35 p.m., many people in Blackstone, Virginia, about 80 miles south of Gordonsville, reported it. It was a round, shiny object with a golden glow, moving from north to south. By this time, radio commentators in central Virginia were giving a running account of the UFO's progress. At 7.59 p.m., the people in the CAA radio facility at Blackstone saw it. At 8 o'clock p.m., jets arrived from Langley Air Force Base to attempt to intercept it, but at 8.05 p.m. it disappeared. This was a good report because it was the first time we ever received a series of reports on the same object, and there was no doubt that all these people had reported the same object. Whatever it was, it wasn't moving too fast, because it had traveled only about 90 miles in 4 hours and 25 minutes. I was about ready to give up until morning and go home when my wife called. The local Associated Press man had called our home, and she assumed that it was about this sighting. She had said that I was out, so he might not call the base. I decided that I'd better keep working so I'd have the answer in time to keep the story out of the papers. A report like this could cause some excitement. The UFO obviously wasn't a planet because it was moving from north to south, 
and it was too slow to be an airplane. I called the Balloon Plotting Center at Lowry Air Force Base, where the tracks of the big skyhook balloons are plotted, but the only big balloons in the air were in the western United States, and they were all accounted for. It might have been a weather balloon. The wind charts showed that the high-altitude winds were blowing in different directions at different altitudes above 35,000 feet, so there was no one flow of air that could have brought a balloon in from a certain area, and I knew that the UFO had to be higher than 35,000 feet because the T-33 jet had been this high and the UFO was still above it. The only thing to do was to check with all of the weather stations in the area. I called Richmond, Roanoke, several places in the vicinity of Washington, D.C., and four or five other weather stations. But all of their balloons were accounted for, and none had been anywhere close to the central part of Virginia. A balloon can travel only so far, so there was no sense in checking stations too far away from where the people had seen the UFO, but I took a chance and called Norfolk, Charleston, West Virginia, Altoona, Pennsylvania, and other stations within a 150-mile radius of Gordonsville and Blackstone. Nothing. I still thought it might be a balloon, so I started to call more stations. At Pittsburgh, I hit a lead. Their radiosond balloon had gone up to about 60,000 feet and evidently had sprung a slow leak because it had leveled off at that altitude. Normally, balloons go up till they burst at 80,000 or 90,000 feet. The weather forecaster at Pittsburgh said that their records showed they had lost contact with the balloon when it was about 60 miles southeast of their station. He said that the winds at 60,000 feet were constant, so it shouldn't be too difficult to figure out where the balloon went after they had lost it. Things must be dull in Pittsburgh at 2 a.m. on Monday mornings, because he offered to plot the course that the balloon probably took and call me back. In about 20 minutes, I got my call. It probably was their balloon, the forecaster said. Above 50,000 feet there was a strong flow of air southeast from Pittsburgh, and this fed into a stronger southerly flow that was paralleling the Atlantic coast just east of the Appalachian Mountains. The balloon would have floated along in this flow of air like a log floating down a river. As close as he could estimate, he said, the balloon would arrive in the Gordonsville-Blackstone area in the late afternoon or early evening. This was just about the time the UFO had arrived. Probably a balloon was a good enough answer for me. The next morning at 8 o'clock a.m., Al Chop called from the Pentagon to tell me that people were crawling all over his desk wanting to know about a sighting in Virginia. The reports continued to come in. At Walnut Lake, Michigan, a group of people with binoculars watched a soft white light go back and forth across the western sky for nearly an hour. A UFO paced an Air Force B-25 for 30 minutes in California. Both of these happened on June 18th, and although we checked and rechecked them, they came out as unknowns. On June 19th, radar at Goose Air Force Base in Newfoundland picked up some odd targets. The targets came across the scope, suddenly enlarged, and then became smaller again. One unofficial comment was that the object was flat or disc-shaped, and that the radar target had gotten bigger because the disc had banked in flight to present a greater reflecting surface. ATIC's official comment was weather. Goose Air Force Base was famous for unusual reports. In early UFO history, someone had taken a very unusual colored photo of a split cloud. The photographer had seen a huge ball of fire streak down through the sky and pass through a high layer of stratus clouds. 
as the fireball passed through the cloud it cut out a perfect swath. The conclusion was that the fireball was a meteor, but the case is still one of the most interesting in the file because of the photograph. Then, in early 1952, there was another good report from this area. It was an unknown. The incident started when the pilot of an Air Force C-54 transport radioed Goose Air Force Base and said that at 10.42 p.m. a large fireball had buzzed his airplane. It had come in from behind the C-54, and nobody had seen it until it was just off the left wing. The fireball was so big that the pilot said it looked as if it was only a few hundred feet away. The C-54 was 200 miles southwest, coming into Goose Air Force Base from Westover Air Force Base, Massachusetts, when the incident occurred. The base officer of the day, who was also a pilot, happened to be in the flight operations office at Goose when the message came in, and he overheard the report. He stepped outside, walked over to his command car, and told his driver about the radio message, so the driver got out and both of them looked toward the south. They searched the horizon for a few seconds, then suddenly they saw a light closing in from the southwest. Within a second it was near the airfield. It had increased in size till it was as big as a golf ball at arm's length, and it looked like a big ball of fire. It was so low that both the O.D. and his driver dove under the command car, because they were sure it was going to hit the airfield. When they turned and looked up, they saw the fireball make a 90-degree turn over the airfield and disappear into the northwest. The time was 10.47 p.m. The control tower operator saw the fireball, too, but didn't agree with the O.D. and his driver on how low it was. They did think that it had made a 90-degree turn, and they didn't think that it was a meteor. In the years they'd been in towers, they'd seen hundreds of meteors, but they'd never seen anything like this, they reported. And reports continued to pour into Project Blue Book. It was now not uncommon to get ten or eleven wires in one day. If the letters reporting UFO sightings were counted, the total would rise to twenty or thirty a day. The majority of the reports that came in by wire could be classified as being good. They were reports made by reliable people, and they were full of details. Some were reports of balloons, airplanes, etc., but the percentage of unknowns hovered right around 22 percent. To describe and analyze each report, or even the unknowns, would require a book the size of an unabridged dictionary, so I am covering only the best and most representative cases. One day in mid-June, Colonel Dunn called me. He was leaving for Washington, and he wanted me to come in the next day and give a briefing at a meeting. By this time I was taking these briefings as a matter of course. We usually gave the briefings to General Garland and a general from the Research and Development Board who passed the information on to General Samford, the Director of Intelligence. But this time General Samford, some of the members of his staff, two Navy captains from the Office of Naval Intelligence, and some people I can't name were at the briefing. When I arrived in Washington, Major Fournay told me that the purpose of the meetings, and my briefing, was to try to find out if there was any significance to the almost alarming increase in UFO reports over the past few weeks. By the time that everyone had finished signing into the briefing room in the restricted area of the fourth floor B ring of the Pentagon, it was about 9.15 a.m., I started my briefing as soon as everyone was seated. I reviewed the last month's UFO activities, then I briefly went over the more outstanding unknown UFO reports, and pointed out how they were increasing in number, breaking all previous records. 
I also pointed out that even though the UFO subject was getting a lot of publicity, it wasn't the scare-type publicity that had accompanied the earlier flaps. In fact, much of the present publicity was anti-saucer. Then I went on to say that even though the reports we were getting were detailed and contained a great deal of good data, we still had no proof the UFOs were anything real. We could, I said, prove that all UFO reports were merely the misinterpretation of known objects if we made a few assumptions. At this point, one of the colonels on General Samford's staff stopped me. Isn't it true, he asked, that if you make a few positive assumptions instead of negative assumptions, that you can just as easily prove that the UFOs are interplanetary spaceships? Why, when you have to make an assumption to get an answer to a report, do you always pick the assumption that proves the UFOs don't exist? You could almost hear the colonel add, Okay, so now I've said it. For several months, the belief that Project Blue Book was taking a negative attitude and the fact that the UFOs could be interplanetary spaceships had been growing in the Pentagon, but these ideas were usually discussed only in the privacy of offices with doors that would close tight. No one said anything, so the colonel who had broken the ice plunged in. He used the sighting from Goose Air Force Base, where the fireball had buzzed the C-54 and sent the O.D. and his driver belly-whopping under the command car as an example. The colonel pointed out that even though we had labeled the report unknown, it wasn't accepted as proof. He wanted to know why. I said that our philosophy was that the fireball could have been two meteors, one that buzzed the C-54 and another that streaked across the airfield at Goose Air Force Base. Granted, a meteor doesn't come within feet of an airplane or make a 90-degree turn, but these could have been optical illusions of some kind. The crew of the C-54, the O.D., his driver, and the tower operators didn't recognize the UFOs as meteors because they were used to seeing the normal shooting stars that are most commonly seen. But the colonel had some more questions. What are the chances of having two extremely spectacular meteors in the same area, traveling the same direction, only five minutes apart? I didn't know the exact mathematical probability, but it was rather small, I had to admit. Then he asked, What kind of an optical illusion would cause a meteor to appear to make a ninety-degree turn? I had asked our Project Bear astronomer this same question, and he couldn't answer it either. So the only answer I could give the colonel was, I don't know. I felt as if I were on a witness stand being cross-examined, and that is exactly where I was, because the colonel cut loose. Why not assume a point that is more easily proved, he asked. Why not assume that the C-54 crew, the O.D., his driver, and the tower operators did know what they were talking about. Maybe they had seen spectacular meteors during the hundreds of hours that they had flown at night and the many nights that they had been on duty in the tower. Maybe the ball of fire had made a ninety-degree turn. Maybe it was some kind of an intelligently controlled craft that had streaked northeast across the Gulf of St. Lawrence and Quebec province at 2,400 miles an hour. Why not just simply believe that most people know what they saw, the colonel said with no small amount of sarcasm in his voice. This last comment started a lively discussion, and I was able to retreat. The colonel had been right in a sense. We were being conservative, but maybe this was the right way to be. In any scientific investigation, you always assume that you don't have enough proof until you get a positive answer. I don't think that we had a positive answer, yet. The colonel's comment split the group, and a hot exchange of ideas, pros and cons, and insinuations that some people were imitating ostriches to keep from facing the truth followed. 
The outcome of the meeting was a directive to take further steps to obtain positive identification of the UFOs. Our original idea of attempting to get several separate reports from one sighting so we could use triangulation to measure speed, altitude, and size wasn't working out. We had given the idea enough publicity, but reports where triangulation could be used were few and far between. Mr. or Mrs. Average Citizen just doesn't look up at the sky unless he or she sees a flash of light or hears a sound. Then, even if he or she does look up and sees a UFO, it is very seldom that the report ever gets to Project Blue Book. I think that it would be safe to say that Blue Book only heard about 10% of the UFOs that were seen in the United States. After the meeting, I went back to ATIC, and the next day Colonel Don Bauer and I left for the West Coast to talk to some people about how to get better UFO data. We brought back the idea of using an extremely long focal-length camera equipped with a diffraction grating. The cameras would be placed at various locations throughout the United States where UFOs were most frequently seen. We hoped that photos of the UFOs taken through the diffraction gratings would give us some proof one way or the other. The diffraction gratings we planned to use over the lenses of the cameras were the same thing as prisms. They would split up the light from the UFO into its component parts so that we could study it and determine whether it was a meteor, an airplane, or balloon reflecting sunlight, etc. Or we might be able to prove that the photographed UFO was a craft completely foreign to our knowledge. A red-hot A-1 priority was placed on the camera project, and a section at ATIC that developed special equipment took over the job of obtaining the cameras, or, if necessary, having them designed and built. But the UFOs weren't waiting around till they could be photographed. Every day the tempo and confusion were increasing a little more. By the end of June, it was very noticeable that most of the better reports were coming from the eastern United States. In Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Maryland, jet fighters had been scrambled almost nightly for a week. On three occasions, radar-equipped F-94s had locked on aerial targets, only to have the lock-on broken by the apparent violent maneuvers of the target. By the end of June, there was also a lull in the newspaper publicity about the UFOs. The forthcoming political conventions had wiped out any mention of flying saucers. But on July 1st, there was a sudden outbreak of good reports. The first one came from Boston. Then they worked down the coast. About 7.25 on the morning of July 1st, two F-94s were scrambled to intercept a UFO that a ground observer corps spotter reported was traveling southwest across Boston. Radar couldn't pick it up, so the two airplanes were just vectored into the general area. The F-94s searched the area but couldn't see anything. We got the report at ATIC and would have tossed it out if it hadn't been for other reports from the Boston area at the same time. One of these reports came from a man and his wife at Lynn, Massachusetts, nine miles northeast of Boston. At 7.30 they had noticed the two vapor trails from the climbing jet interceptors. They looked around the sky to find out if they could see what the jets were after, and off to the west they saw a bright silver cigar-shaped object about six times as long as it was wide, traveling southwest across Boston. It appeared to be traveling just a little faster than the two jets. As they watched, they saw that an identical UFO was following the first one some distance back. The UFOs weren't leaving vapor trails, but, as the man mentioned in his report, this didn't mean anything, because you can get above the vapor trail level and the two UFOs appeared to be at a very high altitude. The two observers watched as the two F-94s searched back and forth far below the UFOs. 
Then there was another report, also made at 7.30. An Air Force captain was just leaving his home in Bedford, about 15 miles northwest of Boston and straight west of Lynn, when he saw the two jets. In his report, he said that he, too, had looked around the sky to see if he could see what they were trying to intercept when off to the east he saw a silvery cigar-shaped object traveling south. His description of what he observed was almost identical to what the couple in Lynn reported, except that he saw only one UFO. When we received the report, I wanted to send someone up to Boston immediately, in the hope of getting more data from the civilian couple and the Air Force captain. This seemed to be a tailor-made case for triangulation. But on July 1st we were completely snowed under with reports, and there just wasn't anybody to send. Then, to complicate matters, other reports came in later in the day. Just two hours after the sighting in the Boston area, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey popped back into UFO history. At 9.30 in the morning, twelve student radar operators and three instructors were tracking nine jets on an SCR-584 radar set when two UFO targets appeared on the scope. The two targets came in from the northeast at a slow speed, much slower than the jets that were being tracked, hovered near Fort Monmouth at 50,000 feet for about five minutes, and then took off in a terrific burst of speed to the southwest. When the targets first appeared, some of the class went outside with an instructor, and after searching the sky for about a minute, they saw two shiny object in the same location as the radar showed the two unidentified targets to be. They watched the two UFOs for several minutes and saw them go zipping off to the southwest at exactly the same time that the two radar targets moved off the scope in that direction. We had plotted these reports, the ones from Boston and the one from Fort Monmouth, on a map, and without injecting any imagination or wild assumptions, it looked as if two somethings had come down across Boston on a southwesterly heading, crossed Long Island, hovered for a few minutes over the Army's secret laboratories at Fort Monmouth, then proceeded toward Washington. In a way, we half expected to get a report from Washington. Our expectations were rewarded, because in a few hours a report arrived from that city. A physics professor at George Washington University reported a dull, gray, smoky-colored object which hovered north-northwest of Washington for about eight minutes. Every once in a while, the professor reported, it would move through an arc of about 15 degrees to the right or left, but it always returned to its original position. While he was watching the UFO, he took a 25-cent piece out of his pocket and held it at arm's length so that he could compare its size to that of the UFO. The UFO was about half the diameter of the quarter. When he first saw the UFO, it was about 30 to 40 degrees above the horizon, but during the eight minutes it was in sight, it steadily dropped lower and lower until buildings in downtown Washington blocked off the view. Besides being an unknown, this report was exceptionally interesting to us because the sighting was made from the center of downtown Washington, D.C., the professor reported that he had noticed the UFO when he saw people all along the street looking up in the air and pointing. He estimated that at least 500 people were looking at it, yet this was the only report we received. This seemed to substantiate our theory that people are very hesitant to report UFOs to the Air Force. But they evidently do tell the newspapers because later on we picked up a short account of the sighting in the Washington papers. It merely said that hundreds of calls had been received from people reporting a UFO. When reports were pouring in at the rate of 20 or 30 a day, we were glad that people were hesitant to report UFOs, but when we were trying to find the answer to a really naughty sighting, 
we always wished that more people had reported it. The old adage of having your cake and eating it too held even for the UFO. Technically, no one in Washington, besides, of course, Major General Samford and his superiors, had anything to do with making policy decisions about the operation of Project Blue Book or the handling of the UFO situation in general. Nevertheless, everyone was trying to get into the act. The split in opinions on what to do about the rising tide of UFO reports, the split that first came out in the open at General Samford's briefing, was widening every day. One group was getting dead serious about the situation. They thought we now had plenty of evidence to back up an official statement that the UFOs were something real and, to be specific, not something from this earth. This group wanted Project Blue Book to quit spending time investigating reports from the standpoint of trying to determine if the observer of a UFO had actually seen something foreign to our knowledge and start assuming that he or she had. They wanted me to aim my investigation at trying to find out more about the UFO. Along with this switch in operating policy, they wanted to clamp down on the release of information. They thought that the security classification of the project should go up to top secret until we had all of the answers. Then the information should be released to the public. The investigation of UFOs along these lines should be a maximum effort, they thought, and their plans called for lining up many top scientists to devote their full time to the project. Someone once said that enthusiasm is infectious, and he was right. The enthusiasm of this group took a firm hold in the Pentagon, at Air Defense Command headquarters, on the Research and Development Board, and many other agencies throughout the government. But General Samford was still giving the orders, and he said to continue to operate just as we had, keeping an open mind to any ideas. After the minor flurry of reports on July 1st, we had a short breathing spell and found time to clean up a sizable backlog of reports. People were still seeing UFOs, but the frequency of the sighting curve was dropping steadily. During the first few days of July, we were getting only two or three good reports a day. On July 5th, the crew of a non-scheduled airliner made page two of many newspapers by reporting a UFO over the AEC's super-secret Hanford, Washington installation. It was a skyhook balloon. On the 12th, a huge meteor sliced across Indiana, southern Illinois, and Missouri that netted us 20 or 30 reports. Even before they had stopped coming in, we had confirmation from our astronomer that the UFO was a meteor. But 42 minutes later, there was a sighting in Chicago that wasn't so easily explained. According to our weather records, on the night of July 12th, it was hot in Chicago. At 9.42, there were at least 400 people at Montrose Beach trying to beat the heat. Many of them were lying down looking at the stars, so that they saw the UFO as it came in from the west-northwest, made a 180-degree turn directly over their heads, and disappeared over the horizon. It was a large red light with small white lights on the side most of the people reported. Some of them said that it changed to a single yellow light as it made its turn. It was in sight about five minutes, and during this time no one reported hearing any sound. One of the people at the beach was the weather officer from O'Hare International Airport, an Air Force captain. He immediately called O'Hare. They checked on balloon flights and with radar, but both were negative. Radar said that there had been no aircraft in the area of Montrose Beach for several hours. I sent an investigator to Chicago, and although he came back with a lot of data on the sighting, it didn't add up to be anything known. The next day, Dayton had its first UFO sighting in a long time, when a Mr. Roy T. Ellis 
president of the Rubber Seal Products Company, and many other people reported a teardrop-shaped object that hovered over Dayton for several minutes about midnight. This sighting had an interesting twist because two years later I was in Dayton and stopped in at ATIC to see a friend who was one of the technical advisors at the center. Naturally, the conversation got around to the subject of UFOs, and he asked me if I remembered this specific sighting. I did, so he went on to say that he and his wife had seen this UFO that night, but they had never told anybody. He was very serious when he admitted that he had no idea what it could have been. Now, I'd heard this statement a thousand times before from other people, but coming from this person, it was really something, because he was as anti-saucer as anyone I knew. Then he added, From that time on, I didn't think your saucer reporters were as crazy as I used to think they were. The Dayton sighting also created quite a stir in the press. In conjunction with the sighting, the Dayton Daily Journal had interviewed Colonel Richard H. McGee, the Dayton Oakwood Civil Defense Director, they wanted to know what he thought about the UFOs. The colonel's answer made news. There's something flying around in our skies, and we wish we knew what it was. When the story broke in other papers, the colonel's affiliation with civil defense wasn't mentioned, and he became merely a colonel from Dayton. Dayton was quickly construed by the public to mean Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and specifically ATIC. Some people in the Pentagon screamed while others gleefully clapped their hands. The gleeful hand claps were from those people who wanted the UFOs to be socially recognized, and they believed that if they couldn't talk their ideas into being, they might be able to force them in with the help of this type of publicity. The temporary lull in reporting that Project Blue Book had experienced in early July proved to be only the calm before the storm. By mid-July, we were getting about 20 reports a day, plus frantic calls from intelligence officers all over the United States, as every Air Force installation in the U.S. was being swamped with reports. We told the intelligence officers to send in the ones that sounded the best, the build-up in UFO reports wasn't limited to the United States. Every day we would receive reports from our air attaches in other countries. England and France led the field, with the South American countries running a close third. Needless to say, we didn't investigate or evaluate foreign reports because we had our hands full right at home. Most of us were putting in 14 hours a day, six days a week. It wasn't at all uncommon for Lieutenant Andy Flues, Bob Olson, or Kerry Rothstein, my investigators, to get their sleep on an airliner going out or coming back from an investigation. TWA airliners out of Dayton were more like home than home. But we hadn't seen anything yet. All the reports that were coming in were good ones, ones with no answers. Unknowns were running about 40 percent. Rumors persist that in mid-July 1952, the Air Force was braced for an expected invasion by flying saucers. Had these rumor mongers been at ATIC in mid-July, they would have thought that the invasion was already in full swing. And they would have thought that one of the beachheads for the invasion was Patrick Air Force Base, the Air Force's guided missile long-range proving ground on the east coast of Florida. On the night of July 18th, at 10.45, two officers were standing in front of base operations at Patrick when they noticed a light at about a 45-degree angle from the horizon and off to the west. It was an amber color and quite a bit brighter than a star. Both officers had heard flying saucer stories, and both thought the light was a balloon. But, to be comedians, they called to several more officers and airmen inside the operations office and told them to come out and see the flying saucer. The people came out and looked. 
a few were surprised and took the mysterious light seriously, at the expense of considerable laughter from the rest of the group. The discussion about the light grew livelier, and bets that it was a balloon were placed. In the meantime, the light had drifted over the base, had stopped for about a minute, turned, and was now heading north. To settle the bet, one of the officers stepped into the base weather office to find out about the balloon. Yes, one was in the air and being tracked by radar, he was told. The weather officer said that he would call to find out exactly where it was. He called and found out that the weather balloon was being tracked due west of the base and that the light had gone out about ten minutes before. The officer went back outside to find that what was first thought to be a balloon was now straight north of the field and still lighted. To add to the confusion, a second amber light had appeared in the west, about twenty degrees lower than where the first one was initially seen, and it was also heading north, but at a much greater speed. In a few seconds, the first light stopped and started moving back south over the base. While the group of officers and airmen were watching the two lights, the people from the weather office came out to tell the UFO observers that the balloon was still traveling straight west. They were just in time to see a third light come tearing across the sky, directly overhead, from west to east. A weatherman went inside and called the balloon tracking crew again. Their balloon was still far to the west of the base. Inside of fifteen minutes, two more amber lights came in from the west, crossed the base, made a 180-degree turn over the ocean, and came back over the observers. In the midst of the melee, a radar set had been turned on, but it couldn't pick up any targets. This did, however, eliminate the possibility of the lights being aircraft. They weren't stray balloons, either, because the winds at all altitudes were blowing in a westerly direction. They obviously weren't meteors. They weren't searchlights on a haze layer, because there was no weather conducive to forming a haze layer, and there were no searchlights. They could have been some type of natural phenomenon, if one desires to take the negative approach. Or, if you take the positive approach, they could have been spaceships. The next night, radar at Washington National Airport picked up UFOs, and one of the most highly publicized sightings of UFO history was in the making. It marked the beginning of the end of the Big Flap. End of Chapter 11 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 12 of The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt. Chapter 12 The Washington Merry Go Round. No flying saucer report in the history of the UFO ever won more world acclaim than the Washington National Sightings. When radars at the Washington National Airport and at Andrews Air Force Base, both close to the nation's capital, picked up UFOs, the sightings beat the Democratic National Convention out of headline space. They created such a furor that I had inquiries from the office of the President of the United States and from the press in London, Ottawa, and Mexico City. A junior-sized riot was only narrowly averted in the lobby of the Roger Smith Hotel in Washington when I refused to tell U.S. newspaper reporters what I knew about the sightings. Besides being the most highly publicized UFO sightings in the Air Force annals, they were also the most monumentally fouled-up messes that repose in the files. Although the Air Force said that the incident had been fully investigated, the Civil Aeronautics Authority wrote a formal report on the sightings, and numerous magazine writers studied them, 
the complete story has never fully been told. The pros have been left out of the con accounts, and the cons were nearly overlooked by the pro writers. For a year after the twin sightings, we were still putting little pieces in the puzzle. In some aspects, the Washington National sightings could be classed as a surprise. We used this as an excuse when things got fouled up, but in other ways they weren't. A few days prior to the incident, a scientist from an agency that I can't name and I were talking about the build-up of reports along the east coast of the United States. We talked for about two hours, and I was ready to leave when he said that he had one last comment to make, a prediction. From his study of the UFO reports that he was getting from Air Force headquarters and from discussions with his colleagues, he said that he thought that we were sitting right on top of a big keg full of loaded flying saucers. Within the next few days, he told me, and I remember that he punctuated his slow, deliberate remarks by hitting the desk with his fist, they're going to blow up and you're going to have the granddaddy of all UFO sightings. The sighting will occur in Washington or New York, he predicted probably Washington. The trend in the UFO reports that this scientist based his prediction on hadn't gone unnoticed. We on Project Blue Book had seen it, and so had the people in the Pentagon. We all had talked about it. On July 10th, the crew of a National Airlines plane reported a light too bright to be a lighted balloon and too slow to be a big meteor while they were flying south at 2,000 feet near Quantico, Virginia, just south of Washington. On July 13th, another airliner crew reported that when they were 60 miles southwest of Washington, at 11,000 feet, they saw a light below them. It came up to their level, hovered off to the left for several minutes, and then it took off in a fast, steep climb when the pilot turned on his landing lights. On July 14th, the crew of a Pan American airliner, en route from New York to Miami, reported eight UFOs near Newport News, Virginia, about 130 miles south of Washington. Two nights later, there was another sighting in exactly the same area, but from the ground. At 9 o'clock p.m., a high-ranking civilian scientist from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics Laboratory at Langley Air Force Base and another man were standing near the ocean, looking south over Hampton Roads, when they saw two amber-colored lights, much too large to be aircraft lights, off to their right, silently traveling north. Just before the two lights got abreast of the two men, they made a 180-degree turn and started back toward the spot where they had first been seen. As they turned, the two lights seemed to jockey for position in the formation. About this time, a third light came out of the west and joined the first two. Then, as the three UFOs climbed out of the area toward the south, several more lights joined the formation. The entire episode had lasted only three minutes. The only possible solution to the sighting was that the two men had seen airplanes. We investigated this report and found that there were several B-26s from Langley Air Force Base in the area at the time of the sighting, but none of the B-26 pilots remembered being over Hampton Roads. In fact, all of them had generally stayed well south of Norfolk until about 10.30 p.m. because of thunderstorm activity northwest of Langley. Then there were other factors. The observers heard no sound, and they were away from all city noises. Aircraft don't carry just one or two amber lights, and the distance between the two lights was such that, had they been on an airplane, the airplane would have been huge or very close to the observers. And last but not least, the man from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics was a very famous aerodynamicist, 
and of such professional stature that if he said the lights weren't airplanes, they weren't. This, then, was the big build-up to the first Washington National sighting and the reason why my friend predicted that the Air Force was sitting on a big powder keg of loaded flying saucers. When the keg blew the best-laid schemes of the mice and men at ATIC, they went the way best-laid schemes are supposed to. The first one of the highly publicized Washington National sightings started, according to the CAA's logbook at the airport, at 11.40 p.m. on the night of July 19th, when two radars at National Airport picked up eight unidentified targets east and south of Andrews Air Force Base. The targets weren't airplanes because they would loaf along at 100 to 130 miles an hour, then suddenly accelerate to fantastically high speeds and leave the area. During the night, the crews of several airliners saw mysterious lights in the same locations that the radar showed the targets. Tower operators also saw lights, and jet fighters were brought in. But nobody bothered to tell Air Force Intelligence about the sighting. When reporters began to call Intelligence and ask about the big sighting behind the headlines, interceptors chase flying saucers over Washington, D.C., they were told that no one had ever heard of such a sighting. In the next edition, the headlines were supplemented by Air Force Won't Talk. Thus, intelligence was notified about the first Washington national sighting. I heard about the sighting about 10 o'clock Monday morning when Colonel Donald Bauer and I got off an airliner from Dayton and I bought a newspaper in the lobby of the Washington National Airport Terminal Building. I called the Pentagon from the airport and talked to Major Dewey Fournay, but all he knew was what he'd read in the papers. He told me that he had called the intelligence officer at Bowling Air Force Base and that he was making an investigation. We would get a preliminary official report by noon. It was about 1 o'clock p.m. when Major Fournay called me and said that the intelligence officer from Bowling was in his office with the preliminary report on the sightings. I found Colonel Bauer, we went up to Major Fournay's office and listened to the intelligence officer's briefing. The officer started by telling us about the location of the radars involved in the incident. Washington National Airport which is located about three miles south of the heart of the city, had two radars. One was a long-range radar in the air route traffic control section. This radar had 100-mile range and was used to control all air traffic approaching Washington. It was known as the ARTC radar. The control tower at National Airport had a shorter range radar that it used to control aircraft in the immediate vicinity of the airport. Bowling Air Force Base, he said, was located just east of National Airport, across the Potomac River. Ten miles farther east, in almost a direct line with National and Bowling, was Andrews Air Force Base. It also had a short range radar. All of these airfields were linked together by an intercom system. Then the intelligence officer went on to tell about the sighting. When a new shift took over at the ARTC radar room at National Airport, the air traffic was light, so only one man was watching the radar scope. The senior traffic controller and the six other traffic controllers on the shift were out of the room at 11.40, when the man watching the radar scope noticed a group of seven targets appear. From their position on the scope, he knew that they were just east and a little south of Andrews Air Force Base. In a way, the targets looked like a formation of slow airplanes, but no formations were due in the area. As he watched, the targets loafed along at 100 to 130 miles an hour, then, in an apparent sudden burst of speed, two of them streaked out of radar range. 
These were no airplanes, the man thought. So he let out a yell for the senior controller. The senior controller took one look at the scope and called in two more of the men. They all agreed that these were no airplanes. The targets could be caused by a malfunction in the radar, they thought, so a technician was called in. The set was in perfect working order. The senior controller then called the control tower at National Airport. They reported that they also had unidentified targets on their scopes. So did Andrews. And both of the other radars reported the same slow speeds followed by a sudden burst of speed. One target was clocked at 7,000 miles an hour. By now, the targets had moved into every sector of the scope and had flown through the prohibited flying areas over the White House and the Capitol. Several times during the night, the targets passed close to commercial airliners in the area, and on two occasions the pilots of the airliners saw lights that they couldn't identify, and the lights were in the same spots where the radar showed UFOs to be. Other pilots to whom the ARTC radar men talked on the radio didn't see anything odd, at least that's what they said, but the senior controller knew airline pilots and knew that they were very reluctant to report UFOs. The first sighting of a light by an airline pilot took place shortly after midnight when an ARTC controller called the pilot of a Capital Airlines flight just taking off from National. The controller asked the pilot to keep watch for unusual lights, or anything. Soon after the pilot cleared the traffic pattern, and while ARTC was still in contact with him, he suddenly yelled, "'There's one, off to the right, and there it goes!' The controller had been watching the scope, and a target that had been off to the right of the capital liner was gone. During the next fourteen minutes, this pilot reported six more identical lights. About two hours later, another pilot, approaching National Airport from the south, excitedly called the control tower to report that a light was following him at eight o'clock level. The tower checked their radar scope, and there was a target behind and to the left of the airliner. The ARTC radar also had the airliner and the UFO target. The UFO tagged along behind and to the left of the airliner until it was within four miles of touchdown on the runway. When the pilot reported the light was leaving, the two radar scopes showed that the target was pulling away from the airliner. Once during the night all three radars, the two at Washington and the one at Andrews Air Force Base, picked up a target three miles north of the Riverdale radio beacon, north of Washington. For thirty seconds the three radar operators compared notes about the target over the intercom, then suddenly the target was gone and it left all three radar scopes simultaneously. But the clincher came in the wee hours of the morning when an ARTC traffic controller called the control tower at Andrews Air Force Base and told the tower operators that ARTC had a target just south of their tower, directly over the Andrews radio range station. The tower operators looked, and there was a huge fiery orange sphere hovering in the sky directly over their range station. Not too long after this excitement had started, in fact, just after the technician had checked the radar and found that the targets weren't caused by a radar malfunction, ARTC had called for Air Force interceptors to come in and look around. But they didn't show and finally ARTC called again, then again. Finally, just about daylight, an F-94 arrived, but by that time the targets were gone. The F-94 crew searched the area for a few minutes, but they couldn't find anything unusual, so they returned to their base. So ended Phase 1 of the Washington National Sightings. 
the Bowling Air Force Base Intelligence Officer said he would write up the complete report and forward it to ATIC. That afternoon, things bustled in the Pentagon. Down on the first floor, Al Chop was doing his best to stave off the press, while up on the fourth floor, intelligence officers were holding some serious conferences. There was talk of temperature inversions and the false targets they could cause, but the consensus was that a good radar operator could spot inversion-caused targets, and the traffic controllers who operated the radar at Washington National Airport weren't just out of radar school. Every day the lives of thousands of people depended upon their interpretation of the radar targets they saw on their scopes, and you don't get a job like this unless you've spent a good many years watching a luminous line paint targets on a good many radar scopes. Targets caused by inversions aren't rare. In the years that these men had been working with radar, they had undoubtedly seen every kind of target, real or false, that radar can detect. They had told the Bowling Air Force Base intelligence officer that the targets they saw were caused by the radar waves bouncing off a hard, solid object. The Air Force radar operator at Andrews backed them up. So did two veteran airline pilots who saw lights right where the radar showed a UFO to be. Then on top of all this, there were the reports from the Washington area during the previous two weeks, all good, all from airline pilots or equally reliable people. To say the least, the sightings at Washington National was a jolt. Besides trying to figure out what the Washington National UFOs were, we had the problem of what to tell the press. They were now beginning to put on a squeeze by threatening to call a congressman, and nothing chills blood faster in the military. They wanted some kind of an official statement, and they wanted it soon. Some people in intelligence wanted to say just, we don't know, but others held out for a more thorough investigation. I happened to be in this latter category. Many times in the past I had seen what first seemed to be a good UFO report completely fall apart under a thorough investigation. I was forestalling the press and working all night if necessary to go into every aspect of the sighting. But to go along with the theme of the Washington National sightings, confusion, there was a lot of talk but no action and the afternoon passed with no further investigation. Finally, about four o'clock p.m., it was decided that the press, who still wanted an official comment, would get an official no comment, and that I would stay in Washington and make a more detailed investigation. I called Lieutenant Andy Flues, who was in charge of Project Blue Book while I was gone, to tell him that I was staying over, and I found out that they were in a deluxe flap back in Dayton. Reports were pouring out of the teletype machines at the rate of thirty a day, and many were as good, if not better, than the Washington incident. I talked this over with Colonel Bauer, and we decided that even though things were popping back at ATIC, the Washington sighting, from the standpoint of national interest, was more important. Feeling like a national martyr, because I planned to work all night if necessary, I laid the course of my investigation. I would go to Washington National Airport, Andrews Air Force Base, Airlines Offices, the Weather Bureau, and a half dozen other places scattered all over the capital city. I called the transportation section at the Pentagon to get a staff car but it took me only seconds to find out that the regulations said no staff cars except for senior colonels or generals. Colonel Bauer tried. Same thing. General Samford and General Garland were gone, so I couldn't get them to try to pressure a staff car out of the hillbilly who was dispatching vehicles. I went down to the finance office. Could I rent a car and charge it as travel expense? No, 
city buses are available. But I didn't know the bus system, and it could take me hours to get to all the places I had to visit, I pleaded. You can take a cab if you want to pay for it out of your per diem, was the answer. Nine dollars a day per diem, and I should pay for a hotel room, meals, and taxi fares all over the District of Columbia. Besides, the lady in finance told me, my travel orders to Washington covered only a visit to the Pentagon. In addition, she said, I was supposed to be on my way back to Dayton right now, and if I didn't go through all the red tape of getting the orders amended, I couldn't collect any per diem, and technically I'd be AWOL. I couldn't talk to the finance officer, the lady informed me, because he always left at 4.30 to avoid the traffic, and it was now exactly 5 o'clock, and she was quitting. At 5.01, I decided that if saucers were buzzing Pennsylvania Avenue in formation, I couldn't care less. I called Colonel Bauer, explained my troubles, and said that I was through. He concurred, and I caught the next airliner to Dayton. When I returned, I dropped in to see Captain Roy James in the radar branch and told him about the sighting. He said that he thought it sounded as if the radar targets had been caused by weather, but since he didn't have the finer details, he naturally couldn't make any definite evaluation. The good UFO reports that Lieutenant Flues had told me about when I called him from Washington had tripled in number before I got around to looking at them. Our daily take had risen to forty a day, and about a third of them were classified as unknowns. More amber-red lights like those seen on July 18th had been observed over the guided missile long-range proving ground at Patrick Air Force Base, Florida. In Uvalde, Texas, a UFO described as a large, round, silver object that spun on its vertical axis was seen to cross 100 degrees of afternoon sky in 48 seconds. During part of its flight, it passed between two towering cumulus clouds. At Los Alamos and Holyoke, Massachusetts, jets had chased UFOs. In both cases, the UFOs had been lost as they turned into the sun. In two night encounters, one in New Jersey and one in Massachusetts, F-94s tried unsuccessfully to intercept unidentified lights reported by the Ground Observer Corps. In both cases, the pilots of the radar-nosed jet interceptors saw a light. They closed in, and their radar operators got a lock-on but the lock-ons were broken in a few seconds in both cases as the light apparently took violent evasive maneuvers. Copies of these and other reports were going to the Pentagon, and I was constantly on the phone or having teleconferences with Major Fournay. When the second Washington National sighting came along, almost a week to the hour from the first one, by a stroke of luck things weren't too fouled up. The method of reporting the sighting didn't exactly follow the official reporting procedures that are set forth in Air Force Letter 200-5, dated 5 April 1952, subject, Reporting of Unidentified Flying Objects, but it worked. I first heard about the sighting about 10 o'clock in the evening when I received a telephone call from Bob Ginna, Life Magazine's UFO expert. He had gotten the word from Life's Washington News Bureau and wanted a statement about what the Air Force planned to do. I decided that instead of giving a mysterious no comment, I would tell the truth. I have no idea what the Air Force is doing. In all probability, it's doing nothing. When he hung up, I called the intelligence duty officer in the Pentagon, and I was correct. Intelligence hadn't heard about the sighting. I asked the duty officer to call Major Fournay and ask him if he would go out to the airport, which was only two or three miles from his home. When he got the call from the duty officer, Major Fournay called Lieutenant Holcomb. 
they drove to the ARTC radar room at National Airport and found Al Chop already there. So at this performance the UFOs had an official audience. Al Chop, Major Dewey Fournay, and Lieutenant Holcomb, a Navy electronics specialist assigned to the Air Force Directorate of Intelligence, all saw the radar targets and heard the radio conversations as jets tried to intercept the UFOs. Being in Dayton, 380 miles away, there wasn't much that I could do, but I did call Captain Roy James, thinking possibly he might want to talk on the phone to the people who were watching the UFOs on the radar scopes. But Captain James has a powerful dislike for UFOs, especially on Saturday night. About five o'clock Sunday morning, Major Fournay called and told me the story of the second sighting at Washington National Airport. About 10.30 p.m. on July 26th, the same radar operators who had seen the UFOs the week before picked up several of the same slow-moving targets. This time, the mysterious craft, if that is what they were, were spread out in an arc around Washington from Herndon, Virginia to Andrews Air Force Base. This time there was no hesitation in following the targets. The minute they appeared on the big 24-inch radar scope, one of the controllers placed a plastic marker representing an unidentified target near each blip on the scope. When all the targets had been carefully marked, one of the controllers called the tower and the radar station at Andrews Air Force Base. They also had the unknown targets. By 11.30 p.m., four or five of the targets were continually being tracked at all times, so once again a call went out for jet interceptors. Once again there was some delay, but by midnight, two F-94s from Newcastle County Air Force Base were airborne and headed south. The reporters and photographers were asked to leave the radar room on the pretext that classified radio frequencies and procedures were being used in vectoring the interceptors. All civilian air traffic was cleared out of the area and the jets moved in. When I later found out that the press had been dismissed on the grounds that the procedures used in an intercept were classified, I knew that this was absurd, because any ham radio operator worth his salt could build equipment and listen in on any intercept. The real reason for the press dismissal, I learned, was that not a few people in the radar room were positive that this night would be the big night in UFO history, the night when a pilot would close in on and get a good look at a UFO, and they didn't want the press to be in on it. But just as the 294s arrived in the area, the targets disappeared from the radar scopes. The two jets were vectored into the areas where the radar had shown the last target plots, but even though the visibility was excellent, they could see nothing. The two airplanes stayed around a few minutes more, made a systematic search of the area, but since they still couldn't see anything or pick up anything on their radars, they returned to their base. A few minutes after the F-94s left the Washington area, the unidentified targets were back on the radar scopes in that same area. What neither Major Fournay nor I knew at this time was that a few minutes after the targets left the radar scopes in Washington, people in the area around Langley Air Force Base near Newport News, Virginia, began to call Langley Tower to report that they were looking at weird bright lights that were rotating and giving off alternating colors. A few minutes after the calls began to come in, the tower operators themselves saw the same or a similar light, and they called for an interceptor. An F-94 in the area was contacted and visually vectored to the light by the tower operators. The F-94 saw the light and started toward it, but suddenly it went out, like somebody turning off a light bulb. 
the F-94 crew continued their run and soon got a radar lock-on, but it was broken in a few seconds as the target apparently sped away. The fighter stayed in the area for several more minutes and got two more lock-ons, only to have them also broken after a few seconds. A few minutes after the F-94 over Newport News had the last lock-on broken, the targets came back on the scopes at Washington National. With the targets back at Washington, the traffic controllers again called Air Defense Command, and once again two F-94s roared south toward Washington. This time the targets stayed on the radar scopes when the airplanes arrived. The controllers vectored the jets toward group after group of targets, but each time, before the jets could get close enough to see anything more than just a light, the targets had sped away. Then one stayed put. The pilot saw a light right where the ARTC radar said a target was located. He cut in the F-94's afterburner and went after it. But just like the light that the F-94 had chased near Langley Air Force Base, this one also disappeared. All during the chase, the radar operator in the F-94 was trying to get the target on his set, but he had no luck. After staying in the area about 20 minutes, the jets began to run low on fuel and returned to their base. Minutes later, it began to get light, and when the sun came up, all the targets were gone. Early Sunday morning, in an interview with the press, the Korean veteran who piloted the F-94, Lieutenant William Patterson, said, I tried to make contact with the bogies below 1,000 feet, but they, the radar controllers, vectored us around. I saw several bright lights. I was at my maximum speed but even then I had no closing speed. I ceased chasing them because I saw no chance of overtaking them. I was vectored into new objects. Later I chased a single bright light which I estimated about ten miles away. I lost visual contact with it about two miles. When Major Fournay finished telling me about the night's activity, my first question was, how about the radar targets? Could they have been caused by weather? I knew that Lieutenant Holcomb was a sharp electronics man, and that Major Fournay, although no electronics specialist, was a crackerjack engineer, so their opinion meant a lot. Dewey said that everybody in the radar room was convinced that the targets were very probably caused by solid, metallic objects. There had been weather targets on the scope, too, he said, but these were common to the Washington area, and the controllers were paying no attention to them. And this something solid could poke along at 100 miles an hour, or outdistance a jet, I thought to myself. I didn't ask Dewey any more, because he'd been up all night and wanted to get to bed. Monday morning, Major Ed Gregory another intelligence officer at ATIC, and I left for Washington, but our flight was delayed in Dayton, so we didn't arrive until late afternoon. On the way through the terminal building to get a cab downtown, I picked up the evening papers. Every headline was about the UFOs. Fiery objects outrun jets over capital. Investigation veiled in secrecy following vain chase. Jets alerted for saucers. Interceptors chase lights in D.C. skies. Experts here to push study as objects and skies reported again. I jokingly commented about wondering who the expert was. In a half hour, I found out. I was. When Major Gregory and I walked into the lobby of the Roger Smith Hotel to check in, reporters and photographers rose from the easy chairs and divans like a covey of quail. They wanted my secrets, but I wasn't going to tell, nor would I pose for pictures while I wasn't telling anything. 
Newspaper reporters are a determined lot, but Greg ran interference and we reached the elevator without even a no comment. The next day was one of confusion. After the first Washington sightings, the prevailing air in the section of the Pentagon's fourth floor, which is occupied by Air Force intelligence, could be described as excitement, but this day it was confusion. There was a maximum of talk and a minimum of action. Everyone agreed that both sightings should be thoroughly investigated, but nobody did anything. Major Fournay and I spent the entire evening just leaving for somewhere to investigate something. Every time we would start to leave, something more pressing would come up. About 10 o'clock a.m., the President's air aide, Brigadier General Landry, called intelligence at President Truman's request to find out what was going on. Somehow, I got the call. I told General Landry that the radar target could have been caused by weather, but that we had no proof. To add to the already confused situation, new UFO reports were coming in hourly. We kept them quiet mainly because we weren't able to investigate them right away, or even confirm the facts. And we wanted to confirm the facts because some of the reports, even though they were from military sources, were difficult to believe. Prior to the Washington sightings, in only a very few of the many instances in which radar had picked up UFO targets, had the targets themselves supposedly been seen visually. Radar experts had continually pointed out this fact to us as an indication that maybe all of the radar targets were caused by freak weather conditions. If people had just seen a light or an object near where the radar showed the UFO target to be, you would have a lot more to worry about, radar technicians had told me many times. Now people were seeing the same targets that the radars were picking up, and not just at Washington. On the same night as the second Washington sighting, we had a really good report from California. An ADC radar had picked up an unidentified target, and an F-94C had been scrambled. The radar vectored the jet interceptor into the target, the radar operator in the 94 locked onto it, and as the airplane closed in, the pilot and RO saw that they were headed directly toward a large, yellowish-orange light. For several minutes they played tag with the UFO. Both the radar on the ground and the radar in the F-94 showed that as soon as the airplane would get almost within gunnery range of the UFO, it would suddenly pull away at a terrific speed. Then in a minute or two it would slow down enough to let the F-94 catch it again. When I talked to the F-94 crew on the phone, the pilot said that they felt as if this were just a big aerial cat-and-mouse game, and they didn't like it. At any moment they thought the cat might have pounced. Needless to say, this was an unknown. About mid-morning on Tuesday, July 29th, Major General John Samford sent word down that he would hold a press conference that afternoon in an attempt to straighten out the UFO situation with the press. Donald Kehoe reports on the press conference and the events leading up to it in detail in his book Flying Saucers from Outer Space. He indicates that before the conference started, General Samford sat behind his big walnut desk in room 3A-138 in the Pentagon and battled with his conscience. Should he tell the public the real truth, that our skies are loaded with spaceships? No, the public might panic. The only answer would be to debunk the UFOs. This bit of reporting makes Major Kehoe the greatest journalist in history. This beats wiretapping. He reads minds. 
and not only that, he can read them right through the walls of the Pentagon. But I'm glad that Kehoe was able to read the General's mind, and that he wrote the true and accurate facts about what he was really thinking, because I spent quite a bit of time talking to the General that day, and he sure fooled me. I had no idea he was worried about what he should tell the public. When the press conference, which was the largest and longest the Air Force had held since World War II, convened at 4 o'clock p.m., General Samford made an honest effort to straighten out the Washington National sightings, but the cards were stacked against him before he started. He had to hedge on many answers to questions from the press because he didn't know the answers. This hedging gave the impression that he was trying to cover up something more than just the fact that his people had fouled up in not fully investigating the sightings. Then he had brought in Captain Roy James from ATIC to handle all the queries about radar. James didn't do any better because he'd just arrived in Washington that morning and didn't know very much more about the sightings than he'd read in the papers. Major Dewey Fournay and Lieutenant Holcomb, who had been at the airport during the sightings, were extremely conspicuous by their absence, especially since it was common knowledge among the press that they weren't convinced the UFOs picked up on radars were weather targets. But somehow, out of this chaotic situation, came exactly the result that was intended. The press got off our backs. Captain James's answers about the possibility of the radar targets being caused by temperature inversions had been construed by the press to mean that this was the Air Force's answer, even though today the twin sightings are still carried as unknowns. The next morning, headlines from Bangor to Bogota read, Air Force debunked saucers as just natural phenomena. The Washington National sightings proved one thing, something that many of us already knew. In order to forestall any more trouble similar to what we'd just been through, we always had to get all of the facts and not try to hide them. A great deal of the press's interest was caused by the Air Force's reluctance to give out any information, and the reluctance on the part of the Air Force was caused by simply not having gone out to find the answers. But had someone gone out and made a more thorough investigation, a few big questions would have popped up and taken some of the intrigue out of the two reports. It took me a year to put the question marks together, because I just picked up the information as I happened to run across it. But it could have been collected in a day of concentrated effort. There was some doubt about the visual sighting of the large, fiery orange-colored sphere that the tower operators at Andrews Air Force Base saw when the radar operators at National Airport told them they had a target over the Andrews Radio Range Station. When the tower operators were later interrogated, they completely changed their story and said that what they saw was merely a star. They said that on the night of the sighting they had been excited. According to astronomical charts, there were no exceptionally bright stars where the UFO was seen over the range station, however, and I heard from a good source that the tower men had been persuaded a bit. Then the pilot of the F-94C changed his mind, even after he'd given the press and later told me his story about vainly trying to intercept unidentified lights. In an official report, he says that all he saw was a ground light reflecting off a layer of haze. Another question mark arose about the lights that the airline pilots saw. Months after the sighting, I heard from one of the pilots whom the ARTC controllers called to learn if he could see a UFO. This man's background was also impressive. He had been flying in and out of Washington since 1936. This is what he had to say. 
The most outstanding incident happened just after a takeoff one night from Washington National. The tower man advised us that there was a UFO ahead of us on the takeoff path and asked if we would aid in tracking it down. We were giving headings to follow, and shortly we were advised that we had passed the UFO and would be given a new heading. None of us in the cockpit had seen anything unusual. Several runs were made. Each time the tower man advised us we were passing the UFO, we noticed that we were over one certain section of the Potomac River, just east of Alexandria. Finally, we were asked to visually check the terrain below for anything which might cause such an illusion. We looked, and the only object we could see where the radar had a target turned out to be the Wilson Lines moonlight steamboat trip to Mount Vernon. Whether there was an altitude gimmick on the radar unit at the time, I do not know, but the radar was sure as hell picking up the steamboat. The pilot went on to say that there is such a conglomeration of lights around the Washington area that no matter where you look, you see a mysterious light. Then there was another point. Although the radars at Washington National and Andrews overlap, and many of the targets appeared in the overlap area, only once did the three radars simultaneously pick up a target. The investigation brought out a few more points on the pro side, too. We found out that the UFOs frequently visited Washington. On May 23rd, 50 targets had been tracked from 8 o'clock p.m. till midnight. They were back on the Wednesday night between the two famous Saturday night sightings, the following Sunday night, and again the night of the press conference. Then during August they were seen eight more times. On several occasions, military and civilian pilots saw lights exactly where the radar showed the UFOs to be. On each night that there was a sighting, there was a temperature inversion, but it was never strong enough to affect the radar the way inversions normally do. On each occasion, I checked the strength of the inversion according to the methods used by the Air Defense Command Weather Forecast Center. Then there was another interesting fact. Hardly a night passed in June, July, and August in 1952 that there wasn't an inversion in Washington, yet the slow-moving, solid radar targets appeared on only a few nights. But the one big factor on the pro side of the question is the people involved. Good radar men, men who deal in human lives. Each day they use their radar to bring thousands of people into Washington National Airport, and with a responsibility like this, they should know a real target from a weather target. So the Washington National Airport sightings are still unknowns. Had the press been aware of some of the other UFO activity in the United States during this period, the Washington sightings might not have been the center of interest. True, they could be classed as good reports, but they were not the best that we were getting. In fact, less than six hours after the ladies and gentlemen of the press said thank you to General Samford for his press conference, and before the UFOs could read the newspapers and find out that they were natural phenomena, one of them came down across the Canadian border into Michigan. The incident that occurred that night was one of those that even the most ardent skeptic would have difficulty explaining. I've heard a lot of them try, and I've heard them all fail. At 9.40 on the evening of the 29th, an Air Defense Command radar station in central Michigan started to get plots on a target that was coming straight south across Saginaw Bay on Lake Huron at 625 miles an hour. A quick check of flight plans on file showed that it was an unidentified target. Three F-94s were in the area just northeast of the radar station, 
so the ground controller called one of the F-94s and told the pilot to intercept the unidentified target. The F-94 pilot started climbing out of the practice area on an intercept heading that the ground controller gave him. When the F-94 was at 20,000 feet, the ground controller told the pilot to turn to the right and he would be on the target. The pilot started to bring the F-94 around, and at that instant both he and the radar operator in the back seat saw that they were turning toward a large bluish-white light, many times larger than a star. In the next second or two, the light took on a reddish tinge and slowly began to get smaller, as if it were moving away. Just then the ground controller called and said that he still had both the F-94 and the unidentified target on his scope and that the target had just made a tight 180 degree turn. The turn was too tight for a jet and at the speed the target was traveling it would have to be a jet if it were an airplane. Now the target was heading back north. The F-94 pilot gave the engine full power and cut in the afterburner to give chase. The radar operator in the back seat got a good radar lock on. Later, he said, It was just as solid a lock on as you can get from a B-36. The object was at four miles range and the F-94 was closing slowly. For thirty seconds they held the lock on, then, just as the ground controller was telling the pilot that he was closing in, the light became brighter and the object pulled away to break the lock on. Without breaking his transmission, the ground controller asked if the radar operator still had the lock on, because on the scope the distance between the two blips had almost doubled in one sweep of the antenna. This indicated that the unknown target had almost doubled its speed in a matter of seconds. For ten minutes the ground radar followed the chase. At times the unidentified target would slow down and the F-94 would start to close the gap. But always, just as the F-94 was getting within radar range, the target would put on a sudden burst of speed and pull away from the pursuing jet. The speed of the UFO, for by this time all concerned had decided that was what it was, couldn't be measured too accurately because its bursts of speed were of such short duration. But on several occasions the UFO traveled about four miles in one ten-second sweep of the antenna, or about fourteen hundred miles an hour. The F-94 was getting low on fuel, and the pilot had to break off the chase a minute or two before the UFO got out of range of the ground radar. The last few plots on the UFO weren't too good, but it looked as if the target slowed down to 200 to 300 miles an hour as soon as the F-94 turned around. What was it? It obviously wasn't a balloon or a meteor. It might have been another airplane, except that in 1952 there was nothing flying, except a few experimental airplanes that were far from Michigan, that could so easily outdistance an F-94. Then there was the fact that radar clocked it at 1,400 miles an hour. The F-94 was heading straight for the star Capella, which is low on the horizon and is very brilliant, but what about the radar contacts? Some people said weather targets, but the chances of a weather target's making a 180 degree turn, just as an airplane turns into it, giving a radar lock on, then changing speed to stay just out of range of the airplane's radar, and then slowing down when the airplane leaves, is as close to nil as you can get. What was it? A lot of people I knew were absolutely convinced this report was the key, the final proof. 
even if all of the thousands of other UFO reports could be discarded on a technicality, this one couldn't be. These people believed that this report in itself was proof enough to officially accept the fact that UFOs were interplanetary spaceships. And when some people refused to believe even this report, the frustration was actually pitiful to see. As the end of July approached, there was a group of officers in intelligence fighting hard to get the UFO recognized. At ATIC, Project Blue Book was still trying to be impartial, but sometimes it was difficult. End of Chapter 12 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 13 of The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt. Chapter 13 Hoax or Horror. To the military and the public who weren't intimately associated with the higher levels of Air Force intelligence during the summer of 1952, and few were, General Samford's press conference seemed to indicate the peak in official interest in flying saucers. It did take the pressure off Project Blue Book. Reports dropped from 50 per day to 10 a day inside of a week. But behind the scenes, the press conference was only the signal for an all-out drive to find out more about the UFO. Work on the special cameras continued on a high-priority basis, and General Samford directed us to enlist the aid of top-ranking scientists. During the past four months, we had collected some 750 comparatively well-documented reports and we hoped that something in these reports might give us a good lead on the UFO. My orders were to tell the scientists to whom we talked that the Air Force was officially still very much interested in the UFO, and that their assistance, even if it was only in giving us ideas and comments on the reports, was badly needed. Although the statement of the problem was worded much more loosely, in essence it was, do the UFO reports we have collected indicate that the Earth is being visited by a people from another planet? Such questions had been asked of the scientists before, but not in such a serious vein. Then a secondary program was to be started, one of educating the military. The old idea that UFO reports would die out when the thrill wore off had long been discarded. We all knew that UFO reports would continue to come in, and that in order to properly evaluate them, we had to have every shred of evidence. The big flap had shown us that our chances of getting a definite answer on a sighting was directly proportional to the quality of the information we received from the intelligence officers in the field. But soon after the press conference, we began to get wires from intelligence officers saying they had interpreted the newspaper accounts of General Samford's press conference to mean that we were no longer interested in UFO reports. A few other intelligence officers had evidently also misinterpreted the General's remarks, because their reports of excellent sightings were sloppy and incomplete. All of this was bad, so to forestall any misconceived ideas about the future of the Air Force's UFO project, Summaries of General Samford's press conference were distributed to intelligence officers. General Samford had outlined the future of the UFO project when he'd said, So our present course of action is to continue on this problem with the best of our ability, giving it the attention that we feel it very definitely warrants. We will give it adequate attention, but not frantic attention. The summary of the press conference straightened things out to some extent, and our flow of reports got back to normal. I was anxious to start enlisting the aid of scientists, 
as General Samford had directed, but before this could be done we had a backlog of UFO reports that had to be evaluated. During July we had been swamped and had picked off only the best ones. Some of the reports we were working on during August had simple answers, but many were unknowns. There was one report that was of special interest because it was an excellent example of how a UFO report can at first appear to be absolutely unsoluble, then suddenly fall apart under thorough investigation. It also points up the fact that our investigation and analysis were thorough and that when we finally stamped a report unknown, it was unknown. We weren't infallible, but we didn't often let a clue slip by. At exactly 10.45 on the morning of August 1st, 1952, an ADC radar near Bellefontaine, Ohio, picked up a high-speed unidentified target moving southwest, just north of Dayton. Two F-86s from the 97th Fighter Interceptor Squadron at Wright-Patterson were scrambled, and in a few minutes they were climbing out toward where the radar showed the UFO to be. The radar didn't have any height-finding equipment, so all that the ground controller at the radar site could do was to get the two F-86s over or under the target, and then they would have to find it visually. When the two airplanes reached 30,000 feet, the ground controller called them and told them that they were almost on the target, which was still continuing its southwesterly course at about 525 miles an hour. In a few seconds, the ground controller called back and told the lead pilot that the targets of his airplane and the UFO had blended on the radar scope and that the pilot would have to make a visual search. This was as close in as radar could get him. Then the radar broke down and went off the air. But at almost that exact second, the lead pilot looked up and there in the clear blue sky, several thousand feet above him, was a silver-colored sphere. The lead pilot pointed it out to his wingman and both of them started to climb. They went to their maximum altitude, but they couldn't reach the UFO. After ten minutes of unsuccessful attempts to identify the huge silver sphere or disk, because at times it looked like a disk, one of the pilots hauled the nose of his F-86 up in a stall and exposed several feet of gun camera film. Just as he did this, the warning light on his radar gun sight blinked on, indicating that something solid was in front of him. He wasn't photographing a sundog, hallucination, or refracted light. The two pilots broke off the intercept and started back to Wright-Patterson when they suddenly realized that they were still northwest of the base, in almost the same location they had been when they started the intercept ten minutes before. The UFO had evidently slowed down from the speed that the radar had measured, 525 miles an hour, until it was hovering, almost completely motionless. As soon as the pilots were on the ground, the magazine of film from the gun camera was rushed to the photo lab and developed. The photos showed only a round, indistinct blob, no details, but they were proof that some type of unidentified flying object had been in the air north of Dayton. Lieutenant Andy Flues was assigned to this one. He checked the locations of balloons and found out that a 20-foot diameter radio sonde weather balloon from Wright-Patterson had been very near the area when the unsuccessful intercept took place but the balloon wasn't traveling 525 miles an hour, and it couldn't be picked up by the ground radar, so he investigated further. The UFO couldn't have been another airplane, because airplanes don't hover in one spot, and it was no atmospheric phenomenon. Andy wrote it off as an unknown, but it still bothered him. That balloon in the area was mighty suspicious. He talked to the two pilots a half dozen times and spent a day at the radar site in Bellefontaine before he reversed his unknown decision and came up with the answer. 
the unidentified target that the radar had tracked across Ohio was a low-flying jet. The jet was unidentified because there was a mix-up and the radar station didn't get its flight plan. Andy checked and found that a jet out of Cleveland had landed at Memphis at about 1140. At 1045, this jet would have been north of Dayton on a southwesterly heading. When the ground controller blended the targets of the two F-86s into the unidentified target, they were at 30,000 feet and were looking for the target at their altitude or higher, so they missed the low-flying jet, but they did see the balloon. Since the radar went out just as the pilot saw the balloon, the ground controller couldn't see that the unidentified target he'd been watching was continuing on to the southwest. The pilots didn't bother to look around anymore once they'd spotted the balloon because they thought they had the target in sight. The only part of the sighting that still wasn't explained was the radar pickup on the F-86's gun sight. Lieutenant Flues checked around, did a little experimenting, and found out that the small transmitter box on a radiosond balloon will give an indication on the radar used in F-86 gun sights. To get a final bit of proof, Lieutenant Flues took the gun camera photos to the photo lab. The two F-86s had been at about 40,000 feet when the photos were taken, and the 20-foot balloon was at about 70,000 feet. Andy's question to the photo lab was, how big should a 20-foot balloon appear on a frame of 16-millimeter movie film when the balloon is 30,000 feet away? The people in the photo lab made a few calculations and measurements and came up with the answer, a 20-foot balloon photographed from 30,000 feet away would be the same size as the UFO in the gun camera photos. By the middle of August, Project Blue Book was back to normal. Lieutenant Flues's Coca-Cola consumption had dropped from 20 bottles a day in mid-July to his normal five. We were all getting a good night's sleep, and it was now a rare occasion when my home telephone would ring in the middle of the night to report a new UFO. But then, on the morning of August 20th, I was happily taking a shower, getting ready to go to work, when one of these rare occasions occurred and the phone rang. It was the ATIC OD. An operational immediate wire had just come in for Blue Book. He had gone over to the message center and gotten it. He thought that it was important and wanted me to come right out. For some reason he didn't want to read it over the phone, although it was not classified. I decided that if he said so, I should come out, so I left in a hurry. The wire was from the intelligence officer at an air base in Florida. The previous night, a scoutmaster and three boy scouts had seen a UFO. The scoutmaster had been burned when he approached too close to the UFO. The wire went on to give a few sketchy details and state that the scoutmaster was a solid citizen. I immediately put in a long-distance call to the intelligence officer. He confirmed the data in the wire. He had talked briefly to the scoutmaster on the phone, and from all he could gather, it was no hoax. The local police had been contacted, and they verified the story and the fact of the burns. I asked the intelligence officer to contact the scoutmaster and ask if he would submit to a physical examination immediately. I could imagine the rumors that could start about the scoutmaster's condition, and I wanted proof. The report sounded good, so I told the intelligence officer I'd get down to see him as soon as possible. I immediately called Colonel Dunn, then chief at ATIC, and gave him a brief rundown. He agreed that I should go down to Florida as soon as possible and offered to try to get an Air Force B-25, which would save time over the airlines. I told Bob Olson to borrow a Geiger counter at Wright Field, then check out a camera. 
I called my wife and asked her to pack a few clothes and bring them out to me. Bob got the equipment, ran home and packed a bag, and in two hours he and I and our two pilots, Captain Bill Hoey and Captain David Douglas, were on our way to Florida to investigate one of the weirdest UFO reports that I came up against. When we arrived, the intelligence officer arranged for the scoutmaster to come out to the air base. The latter knew we were coming, so he arrived at the base in a few minutes. He was a very pleasant chap, in his early thirties, not at all talkative, but apparently willing to cooperate. While he was giving us a brief personal history, I had the immediate impression that he was telling the truth. He'd lived in Florida all of his life. He'd gone to a private military prep school, had some college, and then had joined the Marines. He told us that he had been in the Pacific most of the war and repeated some rather hairy stories of what he'd been through. After the war, he'd worked as an auto mechanic, then gone to Georgia for a while to work in a turpentine plant. After returning to Florida, he opened a gas station, but some hard luck had forced him to sell out. He was now working as a clerk in a hardware store. Some months back, a local church had decided to organize a Boy Scout troop, and he had offered to be the scoutmaster. On the night before, the weekly scout meeting had broken up early. He said that he had offered to give four of the boys a ride home. He had let one of the boys out when the conversation turned to a stock car race that was to take place soon. They talked about the condition of the track. It had been raining frequently, and they wondered if the track was flooded, so they drove out to look at it. Then they started south toward a nearby town to take another of the boys home. They took a blacktop road about ten miles inland from the heavily traveled coastal highway that passes through sparsely settled areas of scrub pine and palmetto thickets. They were riding along when the scoutmaster said that he noticed a light off to his left in the pines. He slowed down and asked the boys if they'd seen it. None of them had. He started to drive on when he saw the lights again. This time all of the boys saw them too, so he stopped. He said that he wanted to go back into the woods to see what was going on, but that the boys were afraid to stay alone. Again he started to drive on, but in a few seconds decided he had to go back. So he turned the car around, went back, and parked beside the road at a point just opposite where he'd seen the lights. I stopped him at this point to find out a little bit more about why he'd decided to go back. People normally didn't go running off into palmetto thickets infested with rattlesnakes at night. He had a logical answer. The lights looked like an airplane crashing into the woods some distance away. He didn't believe that was what he saw, but the thought that this could be a possibility bothered him. After all, he had said, he was a scoutmaster, and if somebody was in trouble, his conscience would have bothered him the rest of his life if he hadn't investigated and it had been somebody in need of help. A fifteen-minute radio program had just started, and he told the boys that he was going to go into the woods and that if he wasn't back by the time the program ended, they should run down the road to a farmhouse that they had passed and get help. He got out and started directly into the woods, wearing a faded denim-billed cap and carrying machete and two flashlights. One of the lights was a spare he carried in his back pocket. He had traveled about fifty yards off the road when he ran into a palmetto thicket, so he stopped and looked for a clear path. But finding none, he started pushing his way through the waist-high tangle of brush. When he stopped, he recalled later, he had first become aware of an odd odor. He couldn't exactly describe it to us, except to say that it was sharp or pungent. It was very faint, actually more like a subconscious awareness at first. 
Another sensation he recalled after the incident was a very slight difference in temperature, hardly perceivable, like walking by a brick building in the evening after the sun has set. He hadn't thought anything about either the odor or the heat at the time, but later, when they became important, he remembered them. Paying no attention to these sensations then, he pushed on through the brush, looking up occasionally to check the North Star, so that he could keep traveling straight east. After struggling through about thirty yards of palmetto undergrowth, he noticed a change in the shadows ahead of him, and stopped to shine the flashlight farther ahead of him to find out if he was walking into a clearing or into one of the many ponds that dot that particular Florida area. It was a clearing. The Boy Scouts in the car had been watching the Scoutmaster's progress, since they could see his light bobbing around. Occasionally he would shine it up at a tree or across the landscape for an instant, so they knew where he was in relation to the trees and thickets. They saw him stop at the edge of the open, shadowed area and shine his light ahead of him. The scoutmaster then told us that when he stopped the second time, he first became consciously aware of the odor and the heat. Both became much more noticeable as he stepped into the clearing. In fact, the heat became almost unbearable, or, as he put it, oppressively moist, making it hard to breathe. He walked a few more paces and suddenly got a horrible feeling that somebody was watching him. He took another step, stopped, and looked up to find the North Star. But he couldn't see the North Star, or any stars. Then he suddenly saw that almost the whole sky was blanked out by a large dark shape about thirty feet above him. He said that he had stood in this position for several seconds, or minutes, he didn't know how long, because now the feeling of being watched had overcome any power of reasoning he had. He managed to step back a few paces, and apparently got out from under the object because he could see the edge of it silhouetted against the sky. As he backed up, he said, the air became much cooler and fresher, helping him to think more clearly. He shone his light up at the edge of the object and got a quick but good look. It was circular shaped and slightly concave on the bottom. The surface was smooth and a grayish color. He pointed to a gray linoleum topped desk in the intelligence officer's room. Just like that, he said. The upper part had a dome in the middle like a turret. The edge of the saucer-shaped object was thick and had veins spaced about every foot, like buckets on a turbine wheel. Between each vein was a small opening, like a nozzle. The next reaction that the scoutmaster recalled was one of fury. He wanted to harm or destroy whatever it was that he saw. All he had was a machete but he wanted to try to jump up and strike at whatever he was looking at. No sooner did he get this idea than he noticed the shadows on the turret change ever so slightly and heard a sound like the opening of a well-oiled safe door. He froze where he stood and noticed a small ball of red light begin to drift toward him. As it floated down, it expanded into a cloud of red mist. He dropped his fight and machete and put his arms over his face. As the mist enveloped him, he passed out. The Boy Scouts, in the car, estimated that their scoutmaster had been gone about five minutes when they saw him stop at the edge of the clearing, then walk on in. They saw him stop seconds later, hesitate a few more seconds, then shine the light up in the air. They thought he was just looking at the trees again. The next thing they said they saw was a big red ball of fire engulfing him. They saw him fall, so they spilled out of the car and took off down the road toward the farmhouse. The farmer and his wife had a little difficulty getting the story out of the boys. They were so excited. 
all they could get was something about the boy's scoutmaster being in trouble down the road. The farmer called the Florida State Highway Patrol, who relayed the message to the county sheriff's office. In a few minutes, a deputy sheriff and the local constable arrived. They picked up the scouts and drove to where their car was parked. The scoutmaster had no idea of how long he had been unconscious. He vaguely remembered leaning against a tree, the feeling of wet, dew-covered grass, and suddenly regaining his consciousness. His first reaction was to get out to the highway, so he started to run. About halfway through the palmetto thicket, he saw a car stop on the highway. He ran toward it and found the deputy and constable with the boys. He was so excited he could hardly get his story told coherently. Later, the deputy said that in all his years as a law enforcement officer, he had never seen anyone as scared as the scoutmaster was as he came up out of the ditch beside the road and walked into the glare of the headlights. As soon as he'd told his story, they all went back into the woods, picking their way around the palmetto thicket. The first thing they noticed was the flashlight, still burning, in a clump of grass. Next to it was a place where the grass was flattened down, as if a person had been lying there. They looked around for the extra light that the scoutmaster had been carrying, but it was gone. Later searches for this missing flashlight were equally fruitless. They marked the spot where the crushed grass was located and left. The constable took the Boy Scouts home, and the scoutmaster followed the deputy to the sheriff's office. On the way to town, the scoutmaster said he first noticed that his arms and face burned. When he arrived at the sheriff's office, he found that his arms, face, and cap were burned. The deputy called the Air Force. There were six people listening to his story. Bob Olson, the two pilots, the intelligence officer, his sergeant, and I. We each had previously agreed to pick one insignificant detail from the story and then re-question the scoutmaster when he had finished. Our theory was that if he made up the story, he would either repeat the details perfectly or not remember what he'd said. I'd used this many times before, and it was a good indicator of a lie. He passed the test with flying colors. His story sounded good to all of us. We talked for about another hour, discussing the event and his background. He kept asking, What did I see? Evidently thinking that I knew. He said that the newspapers were after him since the sheriff's office had inadvertently leaked the story, but that he had been stalling them off pending our arrival. I told him it was Air Force policy to allow people to say anything they wanted to about a UFO sighting. We had never muzzled anyone. It was his choice. With that, we thanked him, arranged to pick up the cap and machete to take back to Dayton, and sent him home in a staff car. By this time it was getting late, but I wanted to talk to the flight surgeon who had examined the man that morning. The intelligence officer found him at the hospital, and he said he would be right over. His report was very thorough. The only thing he could find out of the ordinary were minor burns on his arms and the back of his hands. There were also indications that the inside of his nostrils might be burned. The degree of burn could be compared to a light sunburn. The hair had also been singed, indicating a flash heat. The flight surgeon had no idea how this specifically could have happened. It could have even been done with a cigarette lighter, and he took his lighter and singed a small area of his arm to demonstrate. He had been asked only to make a physical check, so that is what he had done. But he did offer a suggestion. Check his marine records. Something didn't ring true. I didn't quite agree. The story sounded good to me. 
The next morning, my crew from ATIC, three people from the intelligence office, and the two law officers, went out to where the incident had taken place. We found the spot where somebody had apparently been lying, and the scoutmaster's path through the thicket. We checked the area with a Geiger counter, as a precautionary measure, not expecting to find anything. We didn't. We went over the area inch by inch, hoping to find a burned match with which a flare or fireworks could have been lighted, drippings from a flare, or anything that shouldn't have been in a deserted area of woods. We looked at the trees. They hadn't been hit by lightning. The blades of grass under which the UFO supposedly hovered were not burned. We found nothing to contradict the story. We took a few photos of the area and went back to town. On the way back, we talked to the constable and the deputy. All they could do was to confirm what we had heard. We talked to the farmer and his wife, but they couldn't help. The few facts that the Boy Scouts had given them before they had a chance to talk to their scoutmaster correlated with his story. We talked to the scoutmaster's employer and some of his friends. He was a fine person. We questioned people who might have been in a position to also observe something. They saw nothing. The local citizens had a dozen theories, and we thoroughly checked each one. He hadn't been struck by lightning. He hadn't run across a still. There was no indication that he'd surprised a gang of illegal turtle butcherers, smugglers, or bootleggers. There was no indication of marsh gas or swamp fire. The mysterious blue lights in the area turned out to be a farmer arc welding at night. The other flying saucers were the landing lights of airplanes landing at a nearby airport. To be very honest, we were trying to prove that this was a hoax, but were having absolutely no success. Every new lead we dug up pointed to the same thing, a true story. We finished our work on a Friday night and planned to leave early Saturday morning. Bob Olson and I planned to fly back on a commercial airliner, as the B-25 was grounded for maintenance. Just after dinner that night, I got a call from the sheriff's office. It was from a deputy I had talked to, not the one who met the scoutmaster coming out of the woods, but another one, who had been very interested in the incident. He had been doing a little independent checking, and found that our singed UFO observer's background was not as clean as he led one to believe. He had been booted out of the Marines after a few months for being AWOL and stealing an automobile, and had spent some time in a federal reformatory in Chillicothe, Ohio. The deputy pointed out that this fact alone meant nothing, but that he thought I might be interested in it. I agreed. The next morning, early, I was awakened by a phone call from the intelligence officer. The morning paper carried the UFO story on the front page. It quoted the scoutmaster as saying that High Brass from Washington had questioned him late into the night. There was no High Brass, just four captains, a second lieutenant, and a sergeant. He knew we were from Dayton because we had discussed who we were and where we were stationed. The newspaper story went on to say that he, the scoutmaster, and the Air Force knew what he'd seen, but he couldn't tell. It would create a national panic. He'd also hired a press agent. I could understand the high brass from the Pentagon as literary license by the press. But this national panic pitch was too much. I had just about decided to give up on this incident and write it off as unknown until this happened. From all appearances, our scoutmaster was going to make a fast buck on his experience. Just before leaving for Dayton, I called Major Dewey Fournay in the Pentagon and asked him to do some checking. Monday morning, the machete went to the materials lab at Wright-Patterson. The question we asked was, 
Is there anything unusual about this machete? Is it magnetized? Is it radioactive? Has it been heated? No knife was ever tested so thoroughly for so many things. As in using a Geiger counter to check the area over which the UFO had hovered in the Florida woods, our idea was to investigate every possible aspect of the sighting. They found nothing, just a plain, unmagnetized, unradioactive, unheated, common, everyday knife. The cap was sent to a laboratory in Washington, D.C., along with the scoutmaster's story. Our question here was, does the cap in any way, burns, chemicals, etc., substantiate or refute the story? I thought that we'd collected all the items that could be analyzed in a lab until somebody thought of one I'd missed, the most obvious of them all. Soil and grass samples from under the spot where the UFO had hovered. We'd had samples, but in the last-minute rush to get back to Dayton, they had been left in Florida. I called Florida, and they were shipped to Dayton and turned over to an agronomy lab for analysis. By the end of the week, I received a report on our ex-Marines military and reformatory records. They confirmed a few suspicions and added new facts. They were not complimentary. The discrepancy between what we had heard about the scoutmaster while we were in Florida and the records was considered a major factor. I decided that we should go back to Florida and try to resolve this discrepancy. Since it was hurricane season, we had to wait a few days, then sneak back between two hurricanes. We contacted a dozen people in the city where the scoutmaster lived. All of them had known him for some time. We traced him from his early boyhood to the time of the sighting. To be sure that the people we talked to were reliable, we checked on them. The specific things we found out cannot be told since they were given to us in confidence, but we were convinced that the whole incident was a hoax. We didn't talk to the scoutmaster again, but we did talk to all the Boy Scouts one night at their scout meeting, and they retold how they had seen their scoutmaster knocked down by the ball of fire. The night before, we had gone out to the area of the sighting and, under approximately the same lighting conditions as existed on the night of the sighting, had reenacted the scene, especially the part where the Boy Scouts saw their scoutmaster fall, covered with red fire. We found that not even by standing on top of the car could you see a person silhouetted in the clearing where the scoutmaster supposedly fell. The rest of their stories fell apart to some extent, too. They were not as positive of details as they had been previously. When we returned to Dayton, the report on the cap had come back. The pattern of the scorch showed that the hat was flat when it was scorched, but the burned holes, the lab found some minute holes we had missed, had very probably been made by an electrical spark. This was all the lab could find. During our previous visit, we repeatedly asked the question, was the hat burned before you went into the woods? And had the cap been ironed? We had received the same answers each time. The hat was not burned because we the Boy Scouts, were playing with it at the scout meeting and would have noticed the burns, and the cap was new. It had not been washed or ironed. It is rumored that the cap was never returned because it was proof of the authenticity of the sighting. The hat wasn't returned simply because the scoutmaster said that he didn't want it back. No secrets, no intrigue. It's as simple as that. Everyone who was familiar with the incident, except a few people in the Pentagon, were convinced that this was a hoax until the lab called me about the grass samples we'd sent in. How did the roots get charred? Roots charred? I didn't even know what my caller was talking about. He explained that when they'd examined the grass, they had knocked the dirt and sand off the roots of the grass clumps and found them charred. 
The blades of grass themselves were not damaged. They had never been heated except on the extreme tips of the longer blades. These had evidently been bending over, touching the ground, and were also charred. The lab had duplicated the charring and had found that by placing live grass clumps in a pan of sand and dirt and heating it to about 300 degrees Fahrenheit over a gas burner, the charring could be duplicated. How it was actually done outside the lab, they couldn't even guess. As soon as we got the lab report, we checked a few possibilities ourselves. There were no hot underground springs to heat the earth, no chemicals in the soil, not a thing we found could explain it. The only way it could have been faked would have been to heat the earth from underneath to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And how do you do this without using big and cumbersome equipment and disturbing the ground? You can't. Only a few people handled the grass specimens, the lab, the intelligence officer in Florida, and I. The lab wouldn't do it as a joke, then write an official report, and I didn't do it. This leaves the intelligence officer. I'm positive that he wouldn't do it. There may be a single answer everyone is overlooking, but as of now, the charred grass roots from Florida are still a mystery. Writing an official report on this incident was difficult. On one side of the ledger was a huge mass of circumstantial evidence very heavily weighted against the scoutmaster's story being true. On our second trip to Florida, Lieutenant Olson and I heard story after story about the man's aptitude for dreaming up tall tales. One man told us, If he told me the sun was shining, I'd look up to make sure. There were parts of his story and those of the Boy Scouts that didn't quite mesh. None of us ever believed the Boy Scouts were in on the hoax. They were undoubtedly so impressed by the story that they imagined a few things they didn't actually see. The scoutmaster's burns weren't proof of anything. The flight surgeon had duplicated these by burning his own arm with a cigarette lighter. But we didn't make step one in proving the incident to be a hoax. We thought up dozens of ways that the man could have set up the hoax, but couldn't prove one. In the scoutmaster's favor were the two pieces of physical evidence we couldn't explain, the holes burned in the cap and the charred grass roots. The deputy sheriff who had first told me about the scoutmaster's marine and prison record had also said, Maybe this is the one time in his life he's telling the truth, but I doubt it. So did we. We wrote off the incident as a hoax, the best hoax in UFO history. Many people have asked why we didn't give the scoutmaster a lie detector test. We seriously considered it and consulted some experts in this field. They advised against it. In some definite types of cases, the lie detector will not give valid results. This, they thought, was one of those cases. Had we done it, and had he passed on the faulty results, the publicity would have been a headache. There is one way to explain the charred grass roots, the burned cap, and a few other aspects of the incident. It's pure speculation. I don't believe that it is the answer, yet it is interesting. Since the blades of the grass were not damaged and the ground had not been disturbed, this one way is the only way, nobody has thought of any other way, the soil could have been heated. It could have been done by induction heating. To quote from a section entitled Induction Heating from an electrical engineering textbook, a rod of solid metal or any electrical conductor when subjected to an alternating magnetic field has electromotive forces set up in it. These electromotive forces cause what are known as eddy currents. A rise in temperature results from eddy currents. Induction heating is a common method of melting metals in a foundry. Replace the rod of solid metal mentioned above with damp sand 
an electrical conductor, and assume that a something that was generating a powerful alternating magnetic field was hovering over the ground, and you can explain how the grass roots were charred. To get an alternating magnetic field, some type of electrical equipment was needed. Electricity, electrical sparks, the holes burned in the cap by electric sparks. UFO propulsion comes into the picture when one remembers Dr. Einstein's unified field theory concerning the relationship between electromagnetism and gravitation. If this alternating magnetic field can heat metal, why didn't everything the scoutmaster had that was metal get hot enough to burn him? He had a flashlight, machete, coins in his pocket, etc. The answer... He wasn't under the UFO for more than a few seconds. He said that when he stopped to really look at it, he had backed away from under it. He did feel some heat, possibly radiating from the ground. To further pursue this line of speculation, the scoutmaster repeatedly mentioned the unusual odor near the UFO. He described it as being sharp or pungent, Ozone gas is sharp or pungent. To quote from a chemistry book, Ozone is prepared by passing air between two plates which are charged at a high electrical potential. Electrical equipment again. Breathing too high a concentration of ozone gas will also cause you to lose consciousness. I used to try out this induction heating theory on people to get their reaction. I tried it out one day on a scientist from Rand. He practically leaped at the idea. I laughed when I explained that I thought this theory just happened to tie together the unanswered aspects of the incident in Florida and was not the answer. He was slightly perturbed. "'What do you want?' he said. Does a UFO have to come in and land on your desk at ATIC? End of chapter 13 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 14 of The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt. Chapter 14. Digesting the Data. It was soon after we had written a fini to the case of the scoutmaster that I went into Washington to give another briefing on the latest UFO developments. Several reports had come in during early August that had been read with a good deal of interest in the military and other governmental agencies. By late August 1952, several groups in Washington were following the UFO situation very closely. The sighting that had stirred everyone up came from Haneda Air Force Base, now Tokyo International Airport, in Japan. Since the sighting came from outside the U.S., we couldn't go out and investigate it, but the intelligence officers in the Far East Air Force had done a good job, so we had the complete story of this startling account of an encounter with the UFO. Only a few minor questions had been unanswered, and a quick wire to FEAF brought back these missing data. Normally, it took up to three months to get routine questions back and forth, but this time the exchange of wires took only a matter of hours. Several months after the sighting, I talked to one of the FEAF intelligence officers who had investigated it, and in his estimation it was one of the best to come out of the Far East. The first people to see the UFO were two control tower operators, who were walking across the ramp at the airbase heading toward the tower to start the midnight shift. They were about a half hour early, so they weren't in any big hurry to get up into the tower. 
at least not until they saw a large, brilliant light off to the northeast, over Tokyo Bay. They stopped to look at the light for a few seconds, thinking that it might be an exceptionally brilliant star, but both men had spent many lonely nights in a control tower when they had nothing to look at except stars, and they had never seen anything this bright before. Besides, the light was moving. The two men had lined it up with the corner of a hangar and could see that it was continually moving closer and drifting a little off to the right. In a minute they had run across the ramp, up the several hundred steps to the tower, and were looking at the light through seven-by-fifty binoculars. Both of the men and the two tower operators, whom they were relieving, got a good look at the UFO. The light was circular in shape and had a constant brilliance. It appeared to be the upper portion of a large, round, dark shape, which was about four times the diameter of the light itself. As they watched, the UFO moved in closer, or at least it appeared to be getting closer, because it became more distinct. When it moved in, the men could see a second and dimmer light on the lower edge of the dark, shadowy portion. In a few minutes, the UFO had moved off to the east, getting dimmer and dimmer as it disappeared. The four tower men kept watching the eastern sky, and suddenly the light began to reappear. It stayed in sight a few seconds, was gone again, and then for the third time it came back, heading toward the air base. This time one of the tower operators picked up a microphone, called the pilot of a C-54 that was crossing Tokyo Bay, and asked if he could see the light. The pilot didn't see anything unusual. At 11.45 p.m., according to the logbook in the tower, one of the operators called a nearby radar site and asked if they had an unidentified target on their scopes. They did. The FEAF intelligence officers who investigated the sighting made a special effort to try to find out if the radar's unidentified target and the light were the same object. They deduced that they were, since when the tower operators and the radar operators compared notes over the telephone, the light and the radar target were in the same location and were moving in the same direction. For about five minutes, the radar tracked the UFO as it cut back and forth across the central part of Tokyo Bay, sometimes traveling so slowly that it almost hovered, and then speeding up to 300 miles an hour. All of this time, the tower operators were watching the light through binoculars. Several times, when the UFO approached the radar station, once it came within ten miles, a radar operator went outside to find out if he could see the light, but no one at the radar site ever saw it. Back at the air base, the tower operators had called other people, and they saw the light. Later on, the tower man said that he had the distinct feeling that the light was highly directional, like a spotlight. Some of the people who were watching thought that the UFO might be a lighted balloon, so, for the sake of comparison, a lighted weather balloon was released. But the light on the balloon was much more yellowish than the UFO, and in a matter of seconds it had traveled far enough away that the light was no longer visible. This gave the observers a chance to compare the size of the balloon and the size of the dark, shadowy part of the UFO. Had the UFO been ten miles away, it would have been fifty feet in diameter. Three minutes after midnight, an F-94 scrambled from nearby Johnson Air Force Base came into the area. The ground controller sent the F-94 south of Yokohama, up Tokyo Bay, and brought him in behind the UFO. The second that the ground controller had the F-94 pilot lined up and told him that he was in line for a radar run, the radar operator in the rear seat of the F-94 called out that he had a lock on. His target was at 6,000 yards, 10 degrees to the right 
and ten degrees below the F-94. The lock-on was held for ninety seconds as the ground controller watched both the UFO and the F-94 make a turn and come toward the ground radar site. Just as the target entered the ground clutter, the permanent and solid target was near the radar station caused by the radar beams striking the ground. The lock-on was broken. The target seemed to pull away swiftly from the jet interceptor. At almost this exact instant, the tower operators reported that they had lost visual contact with the UFO. The tower called the F-94 and asked if they had seen anything visually during the chase. They hadn't. The F-94 crew stayed in the area ten or fifteen more minutes but couldn't see anything or pick up any more targets on their radar. Soon after the F-94 left the area, both the ground radar and the tower operators picked up the UFO again. In about two minutes, radar called the tower to say that their target had just broken into three pieces and that the three pieces, spaced about a quarter of a mile apart, were leaving the area, going northeast. Seconds later, tower operators lost sight of the light. The FEAF intelligence officers had checked every possible angle, but they could offer nothing to account for the sighting. There were lots of opinions, weather targets, for example, but once again the chances of a weather target's being in exactly the same direction as a bright star and having the star appear to move with the false radar target aren't too likely, to say the least. And then the same type of thing had happened twice before inside of a month's time, once in California and once in Michigan. As one of the men at the briefing I gave said, It's incredible, and I can't believe it, but those boys in FEAF are in a war. They're veterans, and by damn, I think they know what they're talking about when they say they've never seen anything like this before. I could go into a long discourse on the possible explanations for this sighting. I heard many, but in the end there would be only one positive answer. The UFO could not be identified as something we knew about. It could have been an interplanetary spaceship. Many people thought this was the answer, and were all for sticking their necks out and establishing a category of conclusions for UFO reports and labeling it spacecraft. But the majority ruled, and a UFO remained an unidentified flying object. On my next trip to the Pentagon, I spent the whole day talking to Major Dewey Fournay and two of his bosses, Colonel W. A. Adams and Colonel Weldon Smith, about the UFO subject in general. One of the things we talked about was a new approach to the UFO problem, that of trying to prove that the motion of a UFO as it flew through the air was intelligently controlled. I don't know who would get credit for originating the idea of trying to analyze the motion of the UFOs. It was one of those kinds of ideas that are passed around, with everyone adding a few modifications. We'd been talking about making a study of this idea for a long time, but we hadn't had many reports to work with. But now, with the mass of data that we had accumulated in June and July and August, the prospects of such a study looked promising. The basic aim of the study would be to learn whether the motion of the reported UFOs was random or ordered. Random motion is an unordered, helter-skelter motion very similar to a swarm of gnats or flies milling around. There is no apparent pattern or purpose to their flight paths. But take, for example, swallows flying around a chimney. They wheel, dart, and dip, but if you watch them closely, they have a definite pattern in their movements. An ordered motion. The definite pattern is intelligently controlled because they are catching bugs or getting in line to go down the chimney. By the fall of 1952, 
we had a considerable number of well-documented reports in which the UFOs made a series of maneuvers. If we could prove that these maneuvers were not random, but ordered, it would be proof that the UFOs were things that were intelligently controlled. During our discussion, Major Fournet brought up two reports in which the UFO seemed to know what it was doing and wasn't just aimlessly darting around. One of these was the recent sighting from Haneda Air Force Base, Japan, and the other was the incident that happened on the night of July 29th, when an F-94 attempted to intercept a UFO over eastern Michigan. In both cases, radar had established the track of the UFO. In the Haneda incident, according to the sketch of the UFO's track, each turn the UFO made was constant, and the straight legs between the turns were about the same length. The sketch of the UFO's flight path as it moved back and forth over Tokyo Bay reminded me very much of the crisscross search patterns we used to fly during World War II when we were searching for the crew of a ditched airplane. The only time the UFO seriously deviated from this pattern was when the F-94 got on its tail. The Michigan sighting was even better, however. In this case, there was a definite reason for every move that the UFO made. It made a 180-degree turn because the F-94 was closing on it head-on. It alternately increased and decreased its speed, but every time it did this, it was because the F-94 was closing in, and it evidently put on speed to pull out ahead far enough to get out of range of the F-94's radar. To say that this motion was random and that it was just a coincidence that the UFO made the 180-degree turn when the F-94 closed in head-on and that it was just a coincidence that the UFO speeded up every time the F-94 began to get within radar range is pushing the chance of coincidence pretty hard. The idea of the motion analysis study sounded interesting to me but we were so busy on Project Blue Book, we didn't have time to do it. So Major Fournet offered to look into it further, and I promised him all the help we could give him. In the meantime, my people in Project Blue Book were contacting various scientists in the U.S. and indirectly in Europe, telling them about our data and collecting opinions. We did this in two ways. In the United States, we briefed various scientific meetings and groups. To get the word to the other countries, we enlisted the gratis aid of scientists who were planning to attend conferences or meetings in Europe. We would brief these European-bound scientists on all the aspects of the UFO problem so they could informally discuss the problem with their European colleagues. The one thing about these briefings that never failed to amaze me, although it happened time and time again, was the interest in UFOs within scientific circles. As soon as the word spread that Project Blue Book was giving official briefings to groups with the proper security clearances, we had no trouble in getting scientists to swap free advice for a briefing. I might add that we briefed only groups who were engaged in government work, and who had the proper security clearances solely because we could discuss any government project that might be of help to us in pinning down the UFO. Our briefings weren't just squeezed in either. In many instances we would arrive at a place to find that a whole day had been set aside to talk about UFOs. And never once did I meet anyone who laughed off the whole subject of flying saucers even though publicly these same people had jovially sloughed off the press with answers of hallucinations, absurd, or a waste of time and money. They weren't wild-eyed fans, but they were certainly interested. Colonel S. H. Kirkland and I once spent a whole day briefing and talking to the Beacon Hill group, the code name for a collection of some of the world's leading scientists and industrialists. 
This group, formed to consider and analyze the toughest of military problems, took a very serious interest in our project and gave much good advice. At Los Alamos and again at Sandia Base, our briefings were given in auditoriums to standing room only crowds. In addition, I gave my briefings at National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics Laboratories, at Air Research and Development Centers, at Office of Naval Research Facilities, and at the Air Force University. Then we briefed special groups of scientists. Normally, scientists are a cautious lot and stick close to proven facts, keeping their personal opinions confined to small groups of friends, but when they know that there is a sign on a door that says, Classified Briefing in Progress, inhibitions collapse like the theories that explain all the UFOs away. People say just what they think. I could jazz up this part of the UFO story, as so many other historians of the UFO have, and say that Dr. So-and-so believes that the reported flying saucers are from outer space, or that Dr. Husitz is firmly convinced that Mars is inhabited. I talked to plenty of Dr. So-and-sos who believed that flying saucers were real and who were absolutely convinced that other planets or bodies in the universe were inhabited. But we were looking for proven facts and not just personal opinions. However, some of the questions we asked the scientists had to be answered by personal opinions because the exact answers didn't exist. When such questions came up, about all we could do was to try to get the largest and most representative cross-section of personal opinions upon which to base our decisions. In this category of questions, probably the most frequently discussed was the possibility that other celestial bodies in the universe were populated with intelligent beings. The exact answer to this is that no one knows, but the consensus was that it wouldn't be at all surprising. All the briefings we were giving added to our workload because UFO reports were still coming in in record amounts. The lack of newspaper publicity after the Washington sightings had had some effect because the number of reports dropped from nearly 500 in July to 175 in August, but this was still far above the normal average of 20 to 30 reports a month. September 1952 started out with a rush, and for a while it looked as if UFO sightings were on the upswing again. For some reason, we never could determine why, we suddenly began to get reports from all over the southeastern United States. Every morning, for about a week or two, we'd have a half dozen or so new reports. Georgia and Alabama led the field. Many of the reports came from people in the vicinity of the then-new Super Hush Hush Atomic Energy Commission facility at Savannah River, Georgia, and many were coming from the port city of Mobile, Alabama. Our first thought, when the reports began to pour in, was that the newspapers in these areas were possibly stirring things up with scare stories. But our newspaper clipping service covered the majority of the southern papers, and although we kept looking for publicity, none showed up. In fact, the papers only barely mentioned one or two of the sightings. As they came in, each of the sighting reports went through our identification process, they were checked against all balloon flights, aircraft flights, celestial bodies, and the M.O. file, but more than half of them came out as unknowns. When the reports first began to come in, I had called the intelligence officers at all of the major military installations in the southeast, unsuccessfully trying to find out if they could shed any light on the cause of the sightings. One man, the man who was responsible for UFO reports made to Brookley Air Force Base, just outside of Mobile, Alabama, took a dim view of all the proceedings. "'They're all nuts,' 
he said. About a week later, his story changed. It seems that one night, about the fourth night in a row that UFOs had been reported near Mobile, this man and several of his assistants decided to try to see these famous UFOs. About 10 o'clock p.m., the time that the UFOs were usually reported, they were gathered around the telephone in the man's office at Brookley Air Force Base. Soon a report came in. The first question that the investigator who answered the phone asked was, Can you still see it? The answer was yes, so the officer took off to see the UFO. The same thing happened twice more, and two more officers left for different locations. The fourth time the phone rang, the call was from the base radar station. They were picking up a UFO on radar, so the boss himself took off. He saw the UFO in air out over Mobile Bay, and he saw the return of the UFO on the radar scope. The next morning he called me at ATIC, and for over an hour he told me what had happened. Never have I talked to four more ardent flying saucer believers. We did quite a bit of work on the combination radar visual sighting at Berkeley. First of all, radar visual sightings were the best type of UFO sightings we received. There are no explanations for how radar can pick up a UFO target that is being watched visually at the same time. Maybe I should have said there are no proven explanations on how this can happen, because, like everything else associated with the UFO, there was a theory. During the Washington National sightings, several people proposed the idea that the same temperature inversion layer that was causing the radar beam to bend down and pick up a ground target was causing the target to appear to be in the air. They went on to say that we couldn't get a radar visual sighting unless the ground target was a truck, car, house, or something else that was lighted and could be seen at a great distance. The second reason the Brookley Air Force Base sighting was so interesting was that it knocked this theory cold. The radar at Brookley Air Force Base was so located that part of the area that it scanned was over Mobile Bay. It was in this area that the UFO was detected. We thought of the theory that the same inversion layer that bent the radar beam also caused the radar to appear to be in the air, and we began to do a little checking. There was a slight inversion, but, according to our calculations, it wasn't enough to affect the radar. More important was the fact that in the areas where the target appeared, there were no targets to pick up, let alone lighted targets. We checked and rechecked, and found that at the time of the sighting there were no ships, buoys, or anything else that would give a radar return in the area of Mobile Bay in which we were interested. Although this sighting wasn't as glamorous as some we had, it was highly significant because it was possible to show that the UFO couldn't have been a lighted surface target. While we were investigating the sighting, we talked to several electronics specialists about our radar visual sightings. One of the most frequent comments we heard was, Why do all of these radar visual sightings occur at night? The answer was simple. They don't. On August 1st, just before dawn, an ADC radar station outside of Yak, Montana, on the extreme northern border of the United States, picked up a UFO. The report was very similar to the sighting at Brookley, except it happened in the daylight, and instead of seeing a light, the crew at the radar station saw a dark, cigar-shaped object right where the radar had the UFO pinpointed. What these people saw is a mystery to this day. Late in September, I made a trip out to headquarters, ADC, to brief General Chidlaw and his staff on the past few months' UFO activity. 
Our plans for periodic briefings, which we had originally set up with ADC, had suffered a bit in the summer because we were all busy elsewhere. They were still giving us the fullest cooperation, but we hadn't been keeping them as thoroughly read in as we would have liked to. I'd finished the briefing and was eating lunch at the officers' club with Major Vern Sadowski, Project Blue Book's liaison officer in ADC intelligence, and several other officers. I had a hunch that something was bothering these people. Then finally Major Sadowski said, Look, Roop, are you giving us the straight story on these UFOs? I thought he meant that I was trying to spice things up a little, so I said that since he had copies of most of our reports and had read them, he should know that I was giving them the facts straight across the board. Then one of the other officers at the table cut in, That's just the point. We do have the reports, and we have read them. None of us can understand why intelligence is so hesitant to accept the fact that something we just don't know about is flying around in our skies, unless you are trying to cover up something big. Everyone at the table put in his ideas. One radar man said that he'd looked over several dozen radar reports and that his conclusion was that the UFOs couldn't be anything but interplanetary spaceships. He started to give his reasons when another radar man leaped into the conversation. This man said that he'd read every radar report, too, and that there wasn't one that couldn't be explained as a weather phenomenon. Even the radar visual sightings. In fact, he wasn't even convinced that we had ever gotten such a thing as radar visual sighting. He wanted to see proof that an object that was seen visually was the same object that the radar had picked up. Did we have it? I got back into the discussion at this point with the answer. No, we didn't have proof, if you want to get technical about the degree of proof needed. But we did have reports where the radar and visual bearings of the UFO coincided almost exactly. Then we had a few reports where airplanes had followed the UFOs, and the maneuvers of the UFO that the pilot reported were the same as the maneuvers of the UFO that was being tracked by radar. A lieutenant colonel who had been sitting quietly by interjected a well-chosen comment, It seems the difficulty that Project Blue Book faces is what to accept and what not to accept as proof. The colonel had hit the proverbial nail on its proverbial head. Then he went on, Everyone has a different idea of what proof really is. Some people think we should accept a new model of an airplane after only five or ten hours of flight testing. This is enough proof for them that the airplane will fly. But others wouldn't be happy unless it was flight tested for five or ten years. These people have set an unreasonably high value on the word proof. The answer is somewhere in between these two extremes. But where is this point when it comes to UFOs? There was about a thirty-second pause for thought after the colonel's little speech. Then someone asked, What about these recent sightings at Mainbrace? In late September 1952, the NATO naval forces had held maneuvers off the coast of Europe. They were called Operation Mainbrace. Before they had started, someone in the Pentagon had half-seriously mentioned that naval intelligence should keep an eye open for UFOs, but no one really expected the UFOs to show up. Nevertheless, once again, the UFOs were their old, unpredictable selves. They were there. On September 20th, a U.S. newspaper reporter, aboard an aircraft carrier in the North Sea, was photographing a carrier takeoff in color when he happened to look back down the flight deck 
and saw a group of pilots and flight deck crew watching something in the sky. He went back to look, and there was a silver sphere moving across the sky just behind the fleet of ships. The object appeared to be large, plenty large enough to show up in a photo, so the reporter shot several pictures. They were developed right away and turned out to be excellent. He had gotten the superstructure of the carrier in each one and, judging by the size of the object in each successive photo, one could see that it was moving rapidly. The intelligence officers aboard the aircraft studied the photos. The object looked like a balloon. From its size it was apparent that if it were a balloon it would have been launched from one of the ships, so the word went out on the TBS radio, Who launched a balloon? The answer came back on the TBS, Nobody! Naval intelligence double-checked, triple-checked, and quadruple-checked every ship near the carrier, but they could find no one who had launched the UFO. We kept after the Navy. The pilots and the flight deck crew who saw the UFO had mixed feelings. Some were sure that the UFO was a balloon, while others were just as sure that it couldn't have been. It was traveling too fast, and although it resembled a balloon in some ways, it was far from being identical to the hundreds of balloons that the crew had seen the aerologists launch. We probably wouldn't have tried so hard to get a definite answer to the main brace photos if it hadn't been for the events that took place during the rest of the operation, I explained to the group of ADC officers. The day after the photos had been taken, six RAF pilots flying a formation of jet fighters over the North Sea saw something coming from the direction of the main brace fleet. It was a shiny, spherical object, and they couldn't recognize it as anything friendly, so they took after it. But in a minute or two they lost it. When they neared their base, one of the pilots looked back and saw that the UFO was now following him. He turned, but the UFO also turned, and again it outdistanced the meteor in a matter of minutes. Then on the third consecutive day, a UFO showed up near the fleet, this time over Topcliff Aerodome in England. A pilot in a meteor was scrambled and managed to get his jet fairly close to the UFO, close enough to see that the object was round, silvery, and white, and seemed to rotate around its vertical axis and sort of wobble. But before he could close in to get a really good look, it was gone. It was these sightings, I was told by an RAF exchange intelligence officer in the Pentagon, that caused the RAF to officially recognize the UFO. By the time I'd finished telling about the main brace sightings, it was after the lunch hour in the club, and we were getting some get-the-hell-out-of-here looks from the waiters, who wanted to clean up the dining room. But before I could suggest that we leave, Major Sadowski repeated his original question, the one that started the whole discussion. Are you holding out on us? I gave him an unqualified no. We wanted more positive proof, and until we had it, UFOs would remain unidentified flying objects and no more. The horizontal shaking of heads illustrated some of the group's thinking. We had plans for getting more positive proof, however, and I said that just as soon as we returned to Major Sadowski's office, I'd tell them what we contemplated doing. We moved out onto the sidewalk in front of the club and, after discussing a few more sightings, went back into the security area to Sadowski's office and I laid out our plans. First of all, in November or December, the U.S. was going to shoot the first H-bomb during Project Ivy. Although this was top secret at the time, 
it was about the most poorly kept secret in history. Everybody seemed to know all about it. Some people in the Pentagon had the idea that there were beings, earthly or otherwise, who might be interested in our activities in the Pacific, as they seemed to be in Operation Mainbrace. Consequently, Project Blue Book had been directed to get transportation to the test area to set up a reporting net, brief people on how to report, and analyze their reports on the spot. Secondly, Project Blue Book was working on plans for an extensive system to track UFOs by instruments. Brigadier General Garland, who had been General Samford's deputy director for production, and who had been riding herd on the UFO project for General Samford, was now chief at ATIC, having replaced Colonel Dunn, who went to the Air War College. General Garland had long been in favor of trying to get some concrete information, either positive or negative, about the UFOs. This planned tracking system would replace the diffraction grid cameras that were still being developed at ATIC. Thirdly, as soon as we could, we were planning to gather together a group of scientists and let them spend a full week or two studying the UFO problem. When I left ADC, Major Sadowski and crew were satisfied that we weren't just sitting around twiddling our UFO reports. During the fall of 1952, reports continued to drop off steadily. By December, we were down to the normal average of 30 per month, with about 20% of these falling into the unknown category. Our proposed trip to the Pacific to watch for UFOs during the H-bomb test was canceled at the last minute because we couldn't get space on an airplane. But the crews of Navy and Air Force security forces who did go out to the tests were thoroughly briefed to look for UFOs, and they were given the procedures on how to track and report them. Back at Dayton, we stood by to make quick analysis of any reports that might come in. None came. Nothing that fell into the UFO category was seen during the entire Project Ivy series of atomic shots. By December, work on the planning phase of our instrumentation program was completed. During the two months we had been working on it, we had considered everything from giving ground observer corps spotters simple wooden tracking devices to building special radars and cameras. We had talked over our problems with the people at Wright Field who knew about missile tracking equipment, and we had consulted the camera technicians at the Air Force Aerial Reconnaissance Laboratory. Astronomers explained their equipment and the techniques to use and we went to Rome, New York, and Boston to enlist the aid of the people who developed the Air Force's electronic equipment. Our final plan called for visual spotting stations to be established all over northern New Mexico. We'd picked this test location because northern New Mexico still consistently produced more reports than any other area in the U.S., these visual spotting stations would be equipped with a sighting device similar to a gun sight on a bomber. All the operator would have to do would be to follow the UFO with the tracking device, and the exact time and the UFO's azimuth and elevation angles would be automatically recorded. The visual spotting stations would all be tied together with an interphone system so that as soon as the tracker at one station saw something, he could alert the other spotters in the area. If two stations tracked the same object, we could immediately compute its speed and altitude. This visual spotting net would be tied into the existing radar defense net in the Albuquerque-Los Alamos area. At each radar site we proposed that a long focal length camera be synchronized to the turning radar antenna, so that any time the operator saw a target, he could press a button and, 
photographed the portion of the sky exactly where the radar said a UFO was located. These cameras would actually be astronomical telescopes so that even the smallest light or object could be photographed. In addition to this photography system, we proposed that a number of sets of instruments be set out around the area. Each set would contain instruments to measure nuclear radiation, any disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field, and the passage of a body that was giving off heat. The instruments would continually be sending their information to a central UFO command post, which would also get reports directly from the radars and the visual spotting stations. This instrumentation plan would cost about $250,000 because we planned to use as much surplus equipment as possible and tie it into existing communication systems where they already existed. After the setup was established, it would cost about $25,000 a year to operate. At first glance, this seemed like a lot of money, but when we figured out how much the UFO project had cost the Air Force in the past and how much it would probably cost in the future, the price didn't seem too bad, especially if we could solve the UFO problem once and for all. The powers that be at ATIC okayed the plan in December, and it went to Washington, where it would have to be approved by General Samford, before it went to ADC and then back to the Pentagon for higher Air Force official blessing. From all indications, it looked as if we would get the necessary blessings. But the majority of the effort at Project Blue Book during the fall of 1952 had gone toward collecting together all of the bits and pieces of data that we had accumulated over the past year and a half. We had sorted out the best of the unknowns and made studies of certain aspects of the UFO problem so that when we could assemble a panel of scientists to review the data, we could give them the overall picture, not just a basketful of parts. Everyone who knew about the proposed panel meeting was eager to get started because everyone was interested in knowing what this panel would have to say. Although the group of scientists wouldn't be empowered to make the final decision, their recommendations were to go to the president if they decided that the UFOs were real. And any recommendations made by the group of names we planned to assemble would carry a lot of weight. In the Pentagon and at ATIC, book was being made on what their recommendations would be. When I put my money down, the odds were five to three in favor of the UFO. End of chapter 14. Recording by Roger Moline. Chapter 15 of the Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt. Chapter 15. The Radiation Story. The idea for gathering together a group of scientists to whom we referred to as our panel of experts had been conceived early in 1952 as soon as serious talk about the possibility that the UFOs might be interplanetary spaceships had taken hold in both military and scientific circles. In fact, when Project Grudge was reorganized in the summer of 1951, the idea had been mentioned, and this was the main reason that our charter had said we were to be only a fact-finding group. The people on previous UFO projects had gone off on tangents of speculation about the identity of the UFOs. They first declared that they were spacecraft, then later, in a complete about-face, they took the whole UFO problem as one big belly laugh. 
Both approaches had gotten the Air Force into trouble. Why they did this, I don't know, because from the start we realized that no one at ATIC, in the Air Force, or in the whole military establishment, was qualified to give a final yes or no answer to the UFO problem. Giving a final answer would require a serious decision, probably one of the most serious since the beginning of man. During 1952, many highly qualified engineers and scientists had visited Project Blue Book and had spent a day or two going over our reports. Some were very much impressed with the reports. Some had all the answers. But all of the scientists who read our reports readily admitted that even though they may have thought that the reports did or did not indicate visitors from outer space, they would want to give the subject a good deal more study before they ever committed themselves in writing. Consequently, the people's opinions, although they were valuable, didn't give us enough to base a decision upon. We still needed a group to study our material thoroughly and give us written conclusions and recommendations which could be sent to the President if necessary. Our panel of experts was to consist of six or eight of the top scientists in the United States. We fully realized that even the Air Force didn't have enough pull just to ask all of these people to drop the important work they were engaged in and spend a week or two studying our reports. Nor did we want to do it this way. We wanted to be sure that we had something worthwhile before asking for their valuable time. So, working through other government agencies, we organized a preliminary review panel of four people. All of them were competent scientists, and we knew their reputations were such that, if they recommended that a certain top scientist sit on a panel to review our material, he would do it. In late November 1952, the preliminary review panel met at ATIC for three days. When the meeting ended, the group unanimously recommended that a higher court be formed to review the case of the UFO. In an hour, their recommendation was accepted by higher Air Force authorities, and the men proceeded to recommend the members for our proposed panel. They picked six men who had reputations as being both practical and theoretical scientists, and who were known to have no biased opinions regarding the UFOs. The meeting of the panel, which would be held in Washington, was tentatively scheduled for late December or early January, depending upon when all of the scientists who had been asked to attend would be free. At Project Blue Book, activity went into high gear as we made preparations for the meeting. But before we were very far along, our preparations were temporarily sidetracked. I got a lead on the facts behind a rumor. Normally, we didn't pay attention to rumors, but this one was in a different class. Ever since the Air Force had become interested in UFO reports, the comment of those who had been requested to look them over and give a professional opinion was that we lacked the type of data you could get your teeth into. In even our best reports, we had to rely upon what someone had seen. I'd been told many times that if we had even one piece of information that was substantiated by some kind of recorded proof, a set of cinetheodolite movies of a UFO, a spectrum photograph, or any other kind of instrumented data that one could sit down and study, we would have no difficulty getting almost any scientist in the world interested in actively helping us find the answer to the UFO riddle. The rumor that caused me to temporarily halt our preparations for the high-level conference involved data that we might be able to get our teeth into. This is the way it went. In the fall of 1949, at some unspecified place in the United States, a group of scientists had set up equipment to measure background radiation, the small amount of harmless radiation that is always present in our atmosphere. 
this natural radiation varies to a certain degree, but will never increase by any appreciable amount unless there is a good reason. According to the rumor, two of the scientists at the unnamed place were watching the equipment one day when, for no apparent reason, a sudden increase of radiation was indicated. The radiation remained high for a few seconds, then dropped back to normal. The increase over normal was not sufficient to be dangerous, but it definitely was unusual. All indications pointed to equipment malfunction as the most probable explanation. A quick check revealed no obvious trouble with the gear, and the two scientists were about to start a more detailed check when a third member of the radiation crew came rushing into the lab. Before they could tell the newcomer about the unexplained radiation they had just picked up, he blurted out a story of his own. He had driven to a nearby town, and on his return trip, as he approached the research lab, something in the sky suddenly caught his eye. High in the cloudless blue he saw three silvery objects moving in a V formation. They appeared to be spherical in shape, but he wasn't sure. The first fact that hit him was that the objects were traveling too fast to be conventional aircraft. He jammed on the brakes, stopped his car, and shut off the engine. No sound. All he could hear was the quiet whir of a generator in the research lab. In a few seconds the objects had disappeared from sight. After the first two scientists had briefed their excited colleague on the unusual radiation they had detected, the three men asked each other the $64 question. Was there any connection between the two incidents? Had the UFOs caused the excessive radiation? They checked the time. Knowing almost exactly when the instruments had registered the increased radiation, they checked on how long it took to drive to the lab from the point where the three silver objects had been seen. The times correlated within a minute or two. The three men proceeded to check their radiation equipment thoroughly. Nothing was wrong. The rumor stopped here. Nothing that I or anyone else on Project Blue Book could find out shed any further light on the source of the story. People associated with the projects, similar to the research lab that was mentioned in the rumor, were sought out and questioned. Many of them had heard the story, but no one could add any new details. The three unknown scientists at the unnamed lab in an unknown part of the United States, might as well never have existed. Maybe they hadn't. Almost a year after I had first heard the UFO radiation story, I got a long-distance call from a friend on the West Coast. I had seen him several months before, at which time I told him about this curious rumor and expressed my wish to find out how authentic it was. Now, on the phone, he told me he had just been in contact with two people he knew, and they had the whole story. He said they would be in Los Angeles the following night and would like very much to talk to me. I hated to fly clear to the West Coast on what might be a wild goose chase, but I did. I couldn't afford to run the risk of losing an opportunity to turn that old recurrent rumor into fact. Twenty hours later, I met the two people at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. We talked for several hours that night, and I got the details on the rumor and a lot more that I hadn't bargained for. Both of my informants were physicists working for the Atomic Energy Commission and were recognized in their fields. They wanted no publicity, and I promised them that they would get none. One of the men knew all the details behind the rumor and did most of the talking. To keep my promise of no publicity, I'll call him the scientist. 
The rumor version of the UFO radiation story that had been kicking around in Air Force and scientific circles for so long had been correct in detail, but it was by no means complete. The scientist said that after the initial sighting had taken place, word was spread at the research lab that the next time the instruments registered abnormal amounts of radiation, some of the personnel were to go outside immediately and look for some object in the sky. About three weeks after the first incident, a repetition did occur. While excessive radiation was registered on the instruments in the lab, a lone dark object was seen streaking across the sky. Again, the instruments were checked, but, as before, no malfunction was found. After the second sighting, according to the scientist, an investigation was started at the laboratory. The people who made the visual observation weren't sure that the object they had seen couldn't have been an airplane. Someone thought that perhaps some type of radar equipment in the airplane, if that's what the object was, might have affected the radiation detection equipment. So arrangements were made to fly all types of aircraft over the area with their radar in operation. Nothing unusual happened. All possible types of airborne research equipment were traced during similar flights in the hope that some special equipment not normally carried in aircraft would be found to have caused the jump in radiation. But nothing out of the ordinary occurred during these tests either. It was tentatively concluded, the scientist continued, that the abnormally high radiation readings were officially due to some freakish equipment malfunction, and that the objects sighted visually were birds or airplanes. A report to this effect was made to military authorities, but since the conclusion stated that no flying saucers were involved, the report went into some unknown file. Project Blue Book never got it. Shortly after the second UFO radiation episode, the research group finished its work. It was at this time that the scientist had first become aware of the incidents he related to me. A friend of his, one of the men involved in the sightings, had sent the details in a letter. As the story of the sightings spread, it was widely discussed in scientific circles with the result that the conclusion, an equipment malfunction, began to be more seriously questioned. Among the scientists who felt that further investigation of such phenomena was in order were the man to whom I was talking and some of the people who had made the original sightings. About a year later, the scientist and these original investigators were working together, they decided to make a few more tests, on their own time, but with radiation detection equipment so designed that the possibility of malfunction would be almost nil. They formed a group of people who were interested in the project, and on evenings and weekends assembled and set up their equipment in an abandoned building on a small mountain peak. To ensure privacy and to avoid arousing undue interest among people not in on the project, the scientist and his colleagues told everyone that they had formed a mineral club. The mineral club deception covered their weekend expeditions because rock hounds are notorious for their addiction to scrambling around on mountains in search for specimens. The equipment that the group had installed in the abandoned building was designed to be self-operating. Geiger tubes were arranged in a pattern so that some idea as to the direction of the radiation source could be obtained. During the original sightings, the equipment malfunction factor could not be definitely established or refuted because certain critical data had not been measured. To get data on visual sightings, the Mineral Club had to rely on the flying saucer grapevine, which exists at every major scientific laboratory in the country. By late summer of 1950, they were in business. 
For the next three months, the scientist and his group kept their radiation equipment operating 24 hours a day, but the tapes showed nothing except the usual background activity. The saucer grapevine reported sightings in the general area of the tests, but none close to the instrumented mountaintop. The trip to the instrument shack, which had to be made every two days to change tapes, began to get tiresome for the rock hounds, and there was some talk of discontinuing the watch. But persistence paid off. Early in December, about ten o'clock in the morning, the grapevine reported sightings of a silvery, circular-shaped object near the instrument shack. The UFO was seen by several people. When the rock hounds checked the recording tapes in the shack, they found that several of the Geiger tubes had been triggered at 10.17 a.m., the registered radiation increase was about 100 times greater than the normal background activity. Three more times during the next two months, the Mineral Club's equipment recorded abnormal radiation on occasions when the grapevine reported visual sightings of UFOs. One of the visual sightings was substantiated by radar. After these incidents, the Mineral Club kept its instruments in operation until June 1951, but nothing more was recorded. And curiously enough, during this period while the radiation level remained normal, the visual sightings in the area dropped off too. The Mineral Club decided to concentrate on determining the significance of the data they had obtained. Accordingly, the scientist and the group made a detailed study of their mountaintop findings. They had friends working on many research projects throughout the United States and managed to visit and confer with them while on business trips. They investigated the possibility of unusual sunspot activity, but sunspots had been normal during the brief periods of high radiation. To clinch the elimination of sunspots as a cause, their record tapes showed no burst of radiation when sunspot activity had been abnormal. The rock hounds checked every possible research project that might have produced some stray radiation for their instruments to pick up. They found nothing. They checked and rechecked their instruments, but could find no factor that might have induced false readings. They let other scientists in on their findings, hoping that these outsiders might be able to put their fingers on errors that had been overlooked. Now, more than a year after the occurrence of the mysterious incidents that they had recorded, a year spent in analyzing their data, the rockhounds had no answer. By the best scientific tests that they had been able to apply, the visual sightings and the high radiation had taken place more or less simultaneously. Intriguing ideas are hard to kill, and this one had more than one life, possibly because of the element of mystery which surrounds the subject of flying saucers. But the scientific mind thrives on taking the mystery out of unexplained events, so it is not surprising that the investigation went on. According to my friend, the scientist, a few people outside the laboratory where the rockhounds worked were told about the activities of the Mineral Club, and they started radiation detection groups of their own. For instance, two graduate astronomy students from a southwestern university started a similar watch on a modest scale using a modified standard Geiger counter as their detection unit. They did not build a recorder into their equipment, however, and consequently were forced to man their equipment continuously, which naturally cut down the time they were in operation. On two occasions they reportedly detected a burst of high radiation. Although the veracity of the two astronomers was not doubted, the scientists felt that the accuracy of their readings was poor, because of the rather low quality of their equipment. 
the scientist then told me about a far more impressive effort to verify or disprove the findings of the mineral club word of the rockhounds and their work had also spread to a large laboratory in the east an air force colonel on duty at the lab told the story to some of his friends and they decided to look personally into the situation fortunately these people were in a wonderful spot to make such an investigation at their laboratory an extensive survey of the surrounding area was being made an elaborate system of radiation detection equipment had been set up for a radius of 100 miles around the lab in addition the defenses of the area included a radar net thanks to the flashing of silver eagles the colonel's group got permission to check the records of the radiation survey station and to look over the logs of the radar stations they found instances where during the same period of time that radiation in the area had been much higher than normal radar had had a ufo on the scope these events had occurred during the period from january 1951 until about june 1951 upon learning of the tentative but encouraging findings that the colonel's group had dug out of their past records people on both the radiation survey crews and at the radar sites became interested in cooperating for further investigation a tie-in with the local saucer grapevine established a three-way check one evening in july just before sunset two of the colonel's group were driving home from the laboratory as they sped along the highway they noticed two cars stopped ahead of them the occupants were standing beside the road looking at something in the sky the two scientists stopped got out of their car and scanned the sky too low on the eastern horizon they saw a bright circular object moving slowly north they watched it for a while took a few notes then drove back to the lab some interesting news awaited them there radar had picked up an unidentified target near the spot where the scientists in the car had seen the ufo and it had been traveling north a fighter had been scrambled but when it got into the proper area the radar target was off the scope the pilot glimpsed something that looked like the reported ufo but before he could check further he had to turn into the sun to get on an interception course and he lost the object several days passed before the radiation reports from all stations could be collected when the reports did come in they showed that stations east of the laboratory on an approximate line with the radar track had shown the highest increase in radiation stations west of the lab showed nothing the possible significance of this well-covered incident spurred the colonel's group to extend and refine their activities. Their idea was to build a radiation detection instrument in an empty wing tank and hang the tank on an F-47. Then, when a UFO was reported, they would fly a search pattern in the area and try to establish whether or not a certain sector of the sky was more radioactive than other sectors. Also, they proposed to build a highly directional detector for the F-47 and attempt actually to track a UFO. The design of such equipment was started, but many delays occurred. Before the colonel's group could get any of the equipment built, some of the members left the lab for other jobs and the colonel, who sparked the operation, was himself transferred elsewhere. The entire effort collapsed. The scientist was not surprised that I hadn't heard the story of the colonel's group. All the people involved, he said, had kept it quiet in order to avoid ridicule. The scientist added that he would be glad to give me all the data he had on the sightings of his mineral club, 
and he told me where to get the information about the two astronomers and the colonel's group. Armed with the scientist's notes and recorder tapes, I left for my office at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton. With the blessings of my chief, I started to run down the rest of the radiation information. The data we had, especially that from the scientists' mineral club, had been thoroughly analyzed, but we thought that since we now had access to more general data, something new and more significant might be found. First, I contacted the government agency for which all of the people involved in these investigations had been working, the scientists who recorded the original incident, the scientist and his mineral club, the colonel's group, and the rest. The people in the agency were very cooperative, but stressed the fact that the activities I was investigating were strictly the extracurricular affairs of the scientists involved, had no official sanction, and should not be tied in with the agency in any way, shape, or form. This closed-door reaction was typical of how the words flying saucer seemed to scare some people. They did help me locate the report on the original incident, however, and since it seemed to be the only existing copy, I arranged to borrow it. About this same time, we located the two graduate astronomy students in New Mexico. Both now had their PhDs and held responsible jobs on highly classified projects. They repeated their story, which I had first heard from the scientist, but had kept no record of their activities. On one occasion, just before dawn on a Sunday morning, they were on the roof making some meteorological observations. One of them was listening to the Geiger counter when he detected a definite increase in the clicking. Just as the frequency of the clicks reached its highest peak, almost a steady buzz, a large fireball, described by them as spectacular, flashed across the sky. Both of the observers had seen several of the green fireballs and said that this object was similar in all respects except that the color was a brilliant blue-white. With the disappearance of the fireball, the counter once more settled down to a steady click per second. They added that once before they had detected a similar increase in the frequency of the clicks, but had seen nothing in the sky. In telling their story, both astronomers stressed the point that their data were open to a great deal of criticism, mainly because of the limited instrumentation they had used. We agreed. Still, their work tended to support the findings of the more elaborate and systematic radiation investigations. The gods who watch over the UFO project were smiling about this time, because one morning I got a call from a colonel on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. He was going to be in our area that morning, and planned to stop in to see me. He arrived in a few minutes, and turned out to be none other than the colonel who had headed the group which had investigated UFOs and radiation at the Eastern Laboratory. He repeated his story. It was the same as I had heard from the scientist, with a few insignificant changes. The colonel had no records of his group's operations, but knew who had them. He promised to get a wire off to the person immediately, which he did. The answer was a bit disappointing. During the intervening months, the data had been scattered out among the members of the colonel's group, and when the group broke up, so did its collection of records. So all we had to fall back on was the colonel's word, but since he now was heading a top priority project at Wright, it would be difficult not to believe him. After obtaining the colonel's story, we collected all available data concerning known incidents in which there seemed to be a correlation between the visual sighting of UFOs and the presence of excess atomic radiation in the area of the sightings. 
there was one last thing to do. I wanted to take the dates and times of all the reported radiation increases and check them against all sources of UFO reports. This project would take a lot of legwork and digging, but I felt that it would offer the most positive and complete evidence we could assemble as to whether or not a correlation existed. Accordingly, we dug into our files, ADC radar logs, press wire service files, newspaper morgues in the sighting area, and the files of individuals who collect data on saucers. Whenever we found a visual report that correlated with a radiation peak, we checked it against weather conditions, balloon tracks, astronomical reports, etc. As soon as the data had all been assembled, I arranged for a group of Air Force consultants to look it over. I got the same old answer. The data still aren't good enough. The men were very much interested in the reports, but when it came time to putting their comments on paper, they said, Not enough conclusive evidence. If in some ways the UFOs could have been photographed at the same time that the radiation detectors were going wild, it would have been a different story, they later told me. But with the data I had for them, this was the only answer they could give. No one could explain the sudden bursts of radiation but there was no proof that they were associated with UFOs. The board's ruling wrote finish to this investigation. I informed the colonel, and he didn't like the decision. Later I passed through the city where the scientist was working. I stopped over a few hours to brief him on the board's decision. He shook his head in disbelief. It is interesting to note that both the colonel and the scientist reacted in the same way. We're not fools. We were there. We saw it. They didn't. What do they want for proof? End of chapter 15 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 16 of The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt. Chapter 16 The Hierarchy Ponders. By early January 1953, the scientists who were to be members of our panel of experts had been contacted and had agreed to sit in judgment of the UFO. In turn, we agreed to give them every detail about the UFO. We had our best reports for them to read, and we were going to show them the two movies that some intelligence officers considered as the positive proof, the Tremonton movie and the Montana movie. When this high court convened on the morning of January 12th, the first thing it received was its orders. One of three verdicts would be acceptable. All UFO reports are explainable as known objects or natural phenomena, therefore the investigation should be permanently discontinued. The UFO reports do not contain enough data upon which to base a final conclusion. Project Blue Book should be continued in hopes of obtaining better data. The UFOs are interplanetary spacecraft. The written verdict, the group was told, would be given to the National Security Council, a council made up of the directors of all U.S. intelligence agencies, and thence it would go to the President of the United States, if they should decide that the UFOs were interplanetary spacecraft. Because of military regulations, the names of the panel members, like the names of so many other people associated with the UFO story, cannot be revealed. Two of the men had made names for themselves as practical physicists. 
they could transform the highest theory for practical uses. One of these men had developed the radar that pulled us out of a big hole at the beginning of World War II, and the other had been one of the fathers of the H-bomb. Another of the panel members is now the chief civilian advisor to one of our top military commanders, and another was an astronomer whose unpublished fight to get the UFO recognized is respected throughout scientific circles. There was a man who is noted for his highly theoretical physics and mathematics, and another who had pioneered operations research during World War II. The sixth member of the panel had been honored by the American Rocket Society and the International Aeronautical Federation for his work in moving space travel from the Buck Rogers realm to the point of near reality, and who is now a rocket expert. It was an impressive collection of top scientific talent. During the first two days of the meeting, I reviewed our findings for the scientists. Since June 1947, when the first UFO report had been made, ATIC had analyzed 1,593 UFO reports. About 4,400 had actually been received, but all except 1,593 had been immediately rejected for analysis. From our studies, we estimated that ATIC received reports of only 10% of the UFO sightings that were made in the United States. Therefore, in five and a half years, something like 44,000 UFO sightings had been made. Of the 1,593 reports that had been analyzed by Project Blue Book, and we had studied and evaluated every report in the Air Force files, we had been able to explain a great many. The actual breakdown was like this. Balloons, 18.51%. Known, 1.57. Probable, 4.99. Possible, 11.95. 18.51. Aircraft, 11.76%. Known, 0.98. Probable, 7.74. Possible, 3.04. 11.76. Astronomical bodies, 14.20%. Known, 2.79. Probable, 4.01. Possible, 7.40, 14.20. Other, 4.21%. Searchlights on clouds, birds, blowing paper, inversions, reflections, etc. Hoaxes, 1.66%. Insufficient data, 22.72%. In addition to those initially eliminated, Unknowns, 26.94%. By using the terms known, probable, and possible, we were able to differentiate how positive we were of our conclusions. But even in the possible cases, we were, in our own minds, sure that we had identified the reported UFO. And who made these reports? Pilots and air crews made 17.1% from the air. Scientists and engineers made 5.7%. Airport control tower operators made an even 1.0% of the reports. And 12.5% of the total were radar reports. The remaining 63.7% were made by military and civilian observers in general. The reports that we were interested in were the 26.94% or 429 unknowns, so we had studied them in great detail. We studied the reported colors of the UFOs, the shapes, the directions they were traveling, the times of day they were observed, and many more details. 
but we could find no significant pattern or trends. We did find that the most often reported shape was elliptical, and that the most often reported color was white or metallic. About the same number of UFOs were reported as being seen in daytime as at night, and the direction of travel equally covered the sixteen cardinal headings of the compass. Seventy percent of the unknowns had been seen visually from the air. Twelve percent had been seen visually from the ground. Ten percent had been picked up by ground or airborne radar, and eight percent were combination visual radar sightings. In the overall total of 1,593 sightings, women made two reports for every one made by a man, but in the unknowns the men beat out women ten to one. There were two other factors we could never resolve, the frequency of the sightings and their geographical distribution. Since the first flurry of reports in July of 1947, each July brought a definite peak in reports, then a definite secondary peak occurred just before each Christmas. We plotted these peaks and sightings against high tides, worldwide atomic tests, the positions of the moon and planets, the general cloudiness over the United States, and a dozen and one other things but we could never say what caused more people to see UFOs at certain times of the year. Then the UFOs were habitually reported from areas around technically interesting places, like our atomic energy installations, harbors, and critical manufacturing areas. Our study showed that such vital military areas as Strategic Air Command and Air Defense Command bases some A-bomb storage areas and large military depots actually produced fewer reports than could be expected from a given area in the United States. Large population centers devoid of any major technically interesting facilities also produced few reports. According to the laws of normal distribution, if UFOs are not intelligently controlled vehicles, the distribution of reports should have been similar to the distribution of population in the United States. It wasn't. Our study of the geographical locations of sightings also covered other countries. The U.S. by no means had a curb on the UFO market. In all of our unknown reports, we never found one measurement of size, speed, or altitude that could be considered to be even fairly accurate. We could say only that some of the UFOs had been traveling pretty fast. As far as radar was concerned, we had reports of fantastic speeds, up to 50,000 miles an hour, but in all of these instances there was some doubt as to exactly what caused the target. The highest speeds reported for our combination radar visual sightings, which we considered to be the best type of sighting in our files, were 700 to 800 miles an hour. We had never picked up any hardware, any whole saucers, pieces, or parts that couldn't be readily identified as being something very earthly. We had a contract with a materials testing laboratory and they would analyze any piece of material that we found or was sent to us. The tar-covered marble, aluminum broom handle, cow manure, slag, pieces of plastic balloon, and the what-have-you that we did receive and analyze only served to give the people in our material lab some practice and added nothing but laughs to the UFO project. The same went for the reports of contacts with spacemen. Since 1952, a dozen or so people have claimed that they have talked to or ridden with the crews of flying saucers. They offer affidavits, pieces of material, photographs, and other bits and pieces of junk as proof. 
we investigated some of these reports and could find absolutely no fact behind the stories. We had a hundred or so photos of flying saucers, both stills and movies. Many were fakes, some so expert that it took careful study by photo interpreters to show how the photos had been faked. Some were the crudest of fakes, automobile hubcaps thrown into the air, homemade saucers suspended by threads, and just plain retouched negatives. The rest of the still photos had been sent in by well-meaning citizens who couldn't recognize a light flare of flaw in the negative, or who had chanced to get an excellent photo of a sundog or mirage. But the movies that were sent in to us were different. In the first place, it takes an expert with elaborate equipment to fake a movie. We had or knew about four strips of movie film that fell into the unknown category. Two were the Cinetheodolite movies that had been taken at White Sands Proving Ground in April and May of 1950. One was the Montana movie, and the last was the Tremonton movie. These latter two had been subjected to thousands of hours of analysis, and since we planned to give the panel of scientists more thorough reports on them on Friday, I skipped over their details and went to the next point I wanted to cover, theories. Periodically throughout the history of the UFO, people have come up with widely publicized theories to explain all UFO reports. The one that received the most publicity was the one offered by Dr. Donald Menzel of Harvard University. Dr. Menzel, writing in Time, Look, and later in his Flying Saucers, claimed that all UFO reports could be explained as various types of light phenomena. We studied this theory thoroughly because it did seem to have merit. Project Bear's physicists studied it. ATI's scientific consultants studied it and discussed it with several leading European physicists whose specialty was atmospheric physics. In general, the comments that Project Blue Book received were, He's given the subject some thought, but his explanations are not the panacea. And there were other widely publicized theories. One man said that they were all skyhook balloons but we knew the flight path of every skyhook balloon, and they were seldom reported as UFOs. Their little brothers, the weather balloons, caused us a great deal more trouble. The Army engineers took a crack at solving the UFO problem by making an announcement that a scientist in one of their laboratories had duplicated a flying saucer in his laboratory. Major Dewey Fournay checked into this one, it had all started out as a joke, but it was picked up as fact, and the scientist was stuck with it. He gained some publicity, but lost prestige, because other scientists wondered just how competent the man really was to try to pass off such an answer. All in all, the unsolicited assistance of theorists didn't help us a bit, I told the panel members. Some of them were evidently familiar with the theories because they nodded their heads in agreement. The next topic I covered in my briefing was a question that came up quite frequently in discussions of the UFO. Did UFO reports actually start in 1947? We had spent a great deal of time trying to resolve this question. Old newspaper files, journals, and books that we found in the Library of Congress contained many reports of odd things being seen in the sky as far back as the biblical times. The old Negro spiritual says, Ezekiel saw a wheel way up in the middle of the air. We couldn't substantiate Ezekiel's sighting because many of the very old reports of odd things observed in the sky could be explained as natural phenomena that weren't fully understood in those days. The first documented reports of sightings similar to the UFO sightings as we know them today appeared in the newspapers of 1896. 
In fact, the series of sightings that occurred in that year and the next had many points of similarity with the reports of today. The sightings started in the San Francisco Bay Area on the evening of November 22, 1896, when hundreds of people going home from work saw a large, dark, cigar-shaped object with stubby wings traveling northwest across Oakland. Within hours after the mystery craft had disappeared over what is now the northern end of the Golden Gate Bridge, the stories of people in other northern California towns began to come in on the telegraph wires. The citizens of Santa Rosa, Sacramento, Chico, and Red Bluff, several thousand of them, saw it. I tried to find out if the people in these outlying communities saw the UFO before they heard the news from the San Francisco area or afterward, but trying to run down the details of a 56-year-old UFO report is almost hopeless. Once, while I was on a trip to Hamilton Air Force Base, I called the offices of the San Francisco Chronicle, and they put me in touch with a retired employee who had worked on a San Francisco paper in 1896. I called the old gentleman on the phone and talked to him for a long time. He had been a copy boy at the time and remembered the incident, but time had canceled out the details. He did tell me that he, the editor of the paper, and the news staff had seen the ship, as he referred to the UFO. His story, even though it was fifty-six years old, smacked of others I'd heard when he said that no one at the newspaper ever told anyone what they had seen. They didn't want people to think that they were crazy. On November 30th, the mystery ship was back over the San Francisco area, and those people who had maintained that people were being fooled by a wag in a balloon became believers when the object was seen moving into the wind. For four months, reports came in from villages, cities, and farms in the west, then the Midwest, as the airship moved eastward. In early April of 1897, people in Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Illinois reported seeing it. On April 10th, it was reported to be over Chicago. Reports continued to come into the newspapers until about April 20th. Then it, or stories about it, were gone. Literally thousands of people had seen it before the last report clicked in over the telegraph wires. A study of the hundreds of newspaper accounts of this sighting that rocked the world in the late 1890s was interesting because the same controversies that arose then exist now. Those who hadn't seen this stubby-winged, cigar-shaped craft said phooey, or the 19th century version thereof. Those who had seen it were almost ready to do battle to uphold their integrity. Some astronomers loudly yelled Venus, Jupiter, and Alpha Orionis, while others said, we saw it. Thomas Edison, the man of science of the day, disclaimed any knowledge of the mystery craft. I prefer to devote my time to objects of commercial value, he told a New York Herald reporter. At best, airships would only be toys. Thomas, you goofed on that prediction. I had one more important point to cover before I finished my briefing and opened the meeting to a general question-and-answer session. During the past year and a half we had had several astronomers visit Project Blue Book, and they were not at all hesitant to give us their opinions, but they didn't care to say much about what their colleagues were thinking, although they did indicate that they were thinking. We decided that the opinions and comments of astronomers would be of value, so late in 1952 we took a poll. We asked an astronomer, who we knew to be unbiased about the UFO problem and who knew every outstanding astronomer in the United States, to take a trip 
and talked to his friends. We asked him not to make a point of asking about the UFO, but just to work the subject into a friendly conversation. This way we hoped to get a completely frank opinion. To protect his fellow astronomers, our astronomer gave them all code names, and he kept the key to the code. The report we received expressed the detailed opinions of 45 recognized authorities. Their opinions varied from that of Dr. C., who regarded the UFO project as a silly waste of money to investigate an even sillier subject, to Dr. L., who has spent a great deal of his own valuable time personally investigating UFO reports because he believes that they are something real. Of the 45 astronomers who were interviewed, 36% were not at all interested in the UFO reports, 41% were interested to the point of offering their services if they were ever needed, and 23% thought that the UFOs were a much more serious problem than most people recognized. None of the astronomers, even during a friendly discussion, admitted that he thought the UFOs could be interplanetary vehicles. All of those who were interested would only go so far as to say, We don't know what they are, but they're something real. During the past few years, I have heard it said that if the UFOs were really solid objects, our astronomers would have seen them. Our study shed some light on this point. Astronomers have seen UFOs. None of them has ever seen or photographed anything resembling a UFO through his telescope, but 11% of the 45 men had seen something that they couldn't explain. Although, technically speaking, these sightings were no better than hundreds of others in our files, as far as details were concerned, they were good because of the caliber of the observer. Astronomers know what is in the sky. It is interesting to note that out of the representative cross-section of astronomers, five of them, or 11 percent, had sighted UFOs. For a given group of people, this is well above average. To check this point, the astronomer who was making our study picked 90 people at random, people he met while traveling, and got them into a conversation about flying saucers. These people were his control group, to borrow a term from the psychologists. Although the percentage of people who were interested in UFOs was higher for the control group than for the group of astronomers, only 41% of the astronomers were interested, while 86% of the control group were interested. 11% of the astronomers had seen UFOs, while only about 1% of the control group had seen one. This seemed to indicate that as a group, astronomers see many more UFOs than the average citizen. When I finished my briefing, it was too late to start the question-and-answer session, so the first day's meeting adjourned. But promptly at nine o'clock the next morning, the group was again gathered, and from the looks of the list of questions some of them had, they must have been thinking about UFOs all night. One of the first questions was about the results of photography taken by the pairs of huge meteorite patrol cameras that are located in several places throughout North America. Did they ever photograph a UFO? The cameras, which are in operation almost every clear night, can photograph very dim lights, and once a light is photographed, its speed and altitude can be very accurately established. If there were any objects giving off light as they flew through our atmosphere, there is a chance that these cameras might have photographed them. But they hadn't. At first this seemed to be an important piece of evidence, and we had just about racked this fact up as a definite score against the UFO when we did a little checking. If the UFO had been flying at an altitude of 100 miles, 
the chances of it being picked up by the cameras would be good, but the chances of photographing something flying any lower would be less. This may account for the fact that while our inquiring astronomer was at the meteorite patrol camera sites, he talked to an astronomer who had seen a UFO while operating one of the patrol cameras. Many people have asked why our astronomers haven't seen anything through their big telescopes. They are focused light years away, and their field of vision is so narrow that even if UFOs did exist and littered the atmosphere, they wouldn't be seen. Another question the panel had was about Orson Welles' famous War of the Worlds broadcast of October 1938, which caused thousands of people to panic. Had we studied this to see if there were any similarities between it and the current UFO reporting? We had. Our psychologist looked into the matter and gave us an opinion. To make a complete study and get a positive answer would require an effort that would dwarf the entire UFO project. But he did have a few comments. There were many documented cases in which a series of innocent circumstances triggered by the broadcast had caused people to completely lose all sense of good judgment, to panic. There were some similar reports in our UFO files. But we had many reports in which people reported UFOs and obviously hadn't panicked. Reports from pilots who had seen mysterious lights at night and thinking that they might be a cockpit reflection, had turned off all their cockpit lights. Or the pilots who turned and rolled their airplanes to see if they could change the angle of reflection and get rid of the UFO. Or those pilots who climbed and dove thousands of feet and then leveled out to see if the UFO would change its relative position to the airplane. Or the amateur astronomer who made an excellent sighting and before he reluctantly reported it as a UFO, had talked to a half-dozen professional astronomers and physicists in hopes of finding an explanation. All of these people were thinking clearly, questioning themselves as to what the sightings could be, then trying to answer their questions. These people weren't panicked. The question-and-answer period went on for a full day, as the scientists dug into the details of the general facts I had given them in my briefing. The following day and a half was devoted to reviewing and discussing fifty of our best sighting reports that we had classed as unknowns. The next item on the agenda, when the panel had finished absorbing all of the details of the fifty selected top reports, was a review of a very hot and very highly controversial study it was based on the idea that Major Dewey Fournay and I had talked about several months before, an analysis of the motions of the reported UFOs in an attempt to determine whether they were intelligently controlled. The study was hot because it wasn't official, and the reason it wasn't official was because it was so hot. It concluded that the UFOs were interplanetary spaceships, the report had circulated around high command levels of intelligence, and it had been read with a good deal of interest. But even though some officers at command levels, just a notch below General Samford, bought it, the space behind the words approved by was blank. No one would stick his neck out and officially send it to the top. Dewey Fournay, who had completed his tour of active duty in the Air Force and was now a civilian, was called from Houston, Texas, to tell the scientists about the study, since he had worked very closely with the group that had prepared it. The study covered several hundred of our most detailed UFO reports. By a very critical process of elimination, based on the motion of the reported UFOs, Fournay told the panel how he and any previous analysis by Project Blue Book had been disregarded, and how those reports that could have been caused by any one of the many dozen known objects, balloons, airplanes, astronomical bodies, etc., were sifted out. 
This sifting took quite a toll, and the study ended up with only ten or twenty reports that fell into the unknown category. Since such critical methods of evaluation had been used, these few reports proved beyond a doubt that the UFOs were intelligently controlled by persons with brains equal to or far surpassing ours. The next step in the study, Fournay explained, was to find out where they came from. Earthlings were eliminated, leaving the final answer, spacemen. Both Dewey and I had been somewhat worried about how the panel would react to a study with such definite conclusions, but when he finished his presentation, it was obvious from the tone of the questioning that the men were giving the conclusions serious thought. Fournay's excellent reputation was well known. On Friday morning, we presented the feature attractions of the session, the Tremonton movie and the Montana movie. These two bits of evidence represented the best photos of UFOs that Project Blue Book had to offer. The scientists knew about them, especially the Tremonton movie, because since late July, they had been the subject of many closed-door conferences. Generals, admirals, and GS-16s had seen them at command performances, and they had been flown to Kelly Air Force Base in Texas to be shown to a conference of intelligence officers from all over the world. Two of the country's best military photo laboratories the Air Force lab at Wright Field and the Navy's lab at Anacostia, Maryland, had spent many hours trying to prove that the UFOs were balloons, airplanes, or stray light reflections, but they failed. The UFOs were true unknowns. The possibility that the movie had been faked was considered, but quickly rejected, because only a Hollywood studio with elaborate equipment could do such a job, and the people who filmed the movies didn't have this kind of equipment. The Montana movie had been taken on August 15, 1950, by Nick Mariana, the manager of the Great Falls baseball team. It showed two large bright lights flying across the blue sky in an echelon formation. There were no clouds in the movie to give an indication of the UFO's speed, but at one time they passed behind a water tower. The lights didn't show any detail. They appeared to be large, circular objects. Mariana had sent his movies to the Air Force back in 1950, but in 1950 there was no interest in the UFO, so, after a quick viewing, Project Grudge had written them off as the reflections from two F-94 jet fighters that were in the area. In 1952, at the request of the Pentagon, I reopened the investigation of the Montana movie. Working through an intelligence officer at the Great Falls Air Force Base, I had Mariana reinterrogated and obtained a copy of his movie, which I sent to the photo lab. When the photo lab got the movie, they had a little something to work with because the two UFOs had passed behind a reference point the water tower. Their calculations quickly confirmed that the objects were not birds, balloons, or meteors. Balloons drift with the wind, and the wind was not blowing in the direction that the two UFOs were traveling. No exact speeds could be measured, but the lab could determine that the lights were traveling too fast to be birds and too slow to be meteors. This left airplanes as the only answer. The intelligence officer at Great Falls had dug through huge stacks of files and found that only two airplanes, two F-94s, were near the city during the sighting and that they had landed about two minutes afterwards. Both Mariana and his secretary, who had also seen the UFOs, had said that the two jets had appeared in another part of the sky only a minute or two after the two UFOs had disappeared in the southeast. This in itself would eliminate the jets as candidates for the UFOs, but we wanted to double-check. 
The two circular lights didn't look like F-94s, but anyone who has done any flying can tell you that an airplane so far away that it can't be seen can suddenly catch the sun's rays and make a brilliant flash. First we studied the flight paths of the two F-94s. We knew the landing pattern that was being used on the day of the sighting, and we knew when the two F-94s landed. The two jets just weren't anywhere close to where the two UFOs had been. Next we studied each individual light, and both appeared to be too steady to be reflections. We drew a blank on the Montana movie. It was an unknown. We also drew a blank on the Tremonton movie, a movie that had been taken by Navy Chief Photographer Warrant Officer Delbert C. Newhouse on July 2, 1952. Our report on the incident showed that Newhouse, his wife, and their two children were driving to Oakland, California from the East Coast on this eventful day. They had just passed through Tremonton, Utah, a town north of Salt Lake City, and had traveled about seven miles on U.S. Highway 30S when Mrs. Newhouse noticed a group of objects in the sky. She pointed them out to her husband. He looked, pulled over to the side of the road, stopped the car, and jumped out to get a better look. He didn't have to look very long to realize that something highly unusual was taking place, because in his twenty-one years in the Navy and two thousand hours flying time as an aerial photographer, he'd never seen anything like this. About a dozen shiny disc-like objects were milling around the sky in a rough formation. Newhouse had his movie camera, so he turned the turret around to a three-inch telephoto lens and started to photograph the UFOs. He held the camera still and took several feet of film, getting all of the bright objects in one photo. All of the UFOs had stayed in a compact group from the time the Newhouse family had first seen them, but just before they disappeared over the western horizon, one of them left the main group and headed east. Newhouse swung his camera around and took several shots of it, holding his camera steady and letting the UFO pass through the field of view before it disappeared in the east. When I received the Tremonton films, I took them right over to the Wright Field Photo Lab, along with the Montana movie, and the photo technicians and I ran them twenty or thirty times. The two movies were similar in that in both of them the objects appeared to be large circular lights. In neither one could you see any detail. But unlike the Montana movie, the lights in the Tremonton movie would fade out, then come back in again. This fading immediately suggested airplanes reflecting light, but the roar of a king-sized dogfight could have been heard for miles, and the Newhouse family had heard no sound. We called in several fighter pilots, and they watched the UFOs circling and darting in and out of the cloudless blue sky. Their unqualified comment was that no airplane could do what the UFOs were doing. Balloons came under suspicion, but the lab eliminated them just as quickly by studying the kind of a reflection given off by a balloon. It is a steady reflection, since a balloon is spherical. Then, to further scuttle the balloon theory, clusters of balloons are tied together and don't mill around. Of course, the lone UFO that took off to the east by itself was the biggest argument against balloons. Newhouse told an intelligence officer from the Western Air Defense Forces that he had held his camera still and let this single UFO fly through the field of view so the people in the lab measured its angular velocity. Unfortunately, there were no clouds in the sky, nor was he able to include any of the ground in the pictures, so our estimates of angular velocity had to be made assuming that the photographer held his camera still. 
Had the lone UFO been ten miles away, it would have been traveling several thousand miles an hour. After studying the movies for several weeks, the Air Force photo lab at Wright Field gave up. All they had to say was, We don't know what they are, but they aren't airplanes or balloons, and we don't think they are birds. While the lab had been working on the movies at Wright Field, Major Fournay had been talking to the Navy photo people at Anacostia. They thought they had some good ideas on how to analyze the movies, so as soon as we were through with them, I sent them to Major Fournay, and he took them over to the Navy lab. The Navy lab spent about two months studying the films and had just completed their analysis. The men who had done the work were on hand to brief the panel of scientists on their analysis after the panel had seen the movies. We darkened the room, and I would imagine that we ran each film ten times before every panel member was satisfied that he had seen and could remember all of the details. We ran both films together so that the men could compare them. The Navy analysts didn't use the words interplanetary spacecraft when they told of their conclusions, but they did say that the UFOs were intelligently controlled vehicles and that they weren't airplanes or birds. They had arrived at this conclusion by making a frame-by-frame -frame study of the motion of the lights and the changes in the light's intensity. When the Navy people had finished with their presentation, the scientists had questions. None of the panel members were trying to find fault with the work the Navy people had done, but they weren't going to accept the study until they had meticulously searched for every loophole. Then they found one. In measuring the brilliance of the lights, the photoanalysts had used an instrument called a densitometer. The astronomer on the panel knew all about measuring the density of an extremely small photographic image with a densitometer because he did it all the time in his studies of the stars and the astronomer didn't think that the Navy analysts had used the correct technique in making their measurements. This didn't necessarily mean that their data were all wrong, but it did mean that they should recheck their work. When the discussion of the Navy's report ended, one of the scientists asked to see the Tremonton movie again, so I had the projectionist run it several more times. The man said that he thought the UFOs could be seagulls soaring on a thermal current. He lived in Berkeley and said that he'd seen gulls high in the air over San Francisco Bay. We had thought of this possibility several months before, because the area around the Great Salt Lake is inhabited by large white gulls. But the speed of the lone UFO as it left the main group had eliminated the gulls. I pointed this out to the physicist. His answer was that the Navy warrant officer might have thought he had held the camera steady, but he could have panned with the action unconsciously. This would throw all of our computations way off. I agreed with this, but I couldn't agree that they were seagulls. But several months later I was in San Francisco waiting for an airliner to Los Angeles and I watched gulls soaring in a cloudless sky. They were riding a thermal, and they were so high that you couldn't see them until they banked just a certain way. Then they appeared to be a bright white flash, much larger than one would expect from seagulls. There was a strong resemblance to the UFOs in the Tremonton movie, but I'm not sure that this is the answer. The presentation of the two movies ended Project Blue Book's part of the meeting. In five days we had given the panel of scientists every pertinent detail in the history of the UFO, and it was up to them to tell us if they were real, some type of vehicle flying through our atmosphere. If they were real, then they would have to be spacecraft because no one at the meeting gave a second thought to the possibility that the UFOs might be a super-secret U.S. aircraft or a Soviet development. 
the scientists knew everything that was going on in the U.S., and they knew that no country in the world had developed their technology far enough to build a craft that would perform as the UFOs were reported to do. In addition, we were spending billions of dollars on the research and development and the procurement of airplanes that were just nudging the speed of sound. It would be absurd to think that these billions were being spent to cover the existence of a UFO-type weapon. And it would be equally absurd to think that the British, French, Russians, or any other country could be far enough ahead of us to have a UFO. The scientists spent the next two days pondering a conclusion. They reread reports and looked at the two movies again and again. They called other scientists to double-check certain ideas that they had, and they discussed the problem among themselves. Then they wrote out their conclusions, and each man signed the document. The first paragraph said, we as a group do not believe that it is impossible for some other celestial body to be inhabited by intelligent creatures. Nor is it impossible that these creatures could have reached such a state of development that they could visit the earth. However, there is nothing in all of the so-called flying saucer reports that we have read that would indicate that this is taking place. The Tremonton movie had been rejected as proof but the panel did leave the door open a crack when they suggested that the Navy photo lab redo their study. But the Navy lab never rechecked their report, and it was over a year later before new data came to light. After I got out of the Air Force, I met Newhouse and talked to him for two hours. I've talked to many people who have reported UFOs, but few impressed me as much as Newhouse. I learned that when he and his family first saw the UFOs, they were close to the car, much closer than when he took the movie. To use Newhouse's own words, if they had been the size of a B-29, they would have been at 10,000 feet altitude. And the Navy man and his family had taken a good look at the objects. They looked like two pie pans, one inverted on the top of the other. He didn't just think the UFOs were disc-shaped. He knew that they were. He had plainly seen them. I asked him why he hadn't told this to the intelligence officer who interrogated him. He said that he had. Then I remembered that I'd sent the intelligence officer a list of questions I wanted Newhouse to answer. The question, what did the UFOs look like, wasn't one of them because when you have a picture of something, you don't normally ask what it looks like. Why the intelligence officer didn't pass this information on to us, I'll never know. The Montana movie was rejected by the panel as positive proof, because even though the two observers said that the jets were in another part of the sky when they saw the UFOs, and our study backed them up, there was still a chance that the two UFOs could have been the two jets. We couldn't prove the UFOs were the jets, but neither could we prove they weren't. The controversial study of the UFOs' motions that Major Fournay had presented was discarded. All of the panel agreed that if there had been some permanent record of the motion of the UFOs, a photograph of a UFO's flight path or a photograph of a UFO's track on a radar scope, they could have given the study much more weight. But in every one of the ten or twenty reports that were offered as proof that the UFOs were intelligently controlled, the motions were only those that the observer had seen. And the human eye and mind are not accurate recorders. How many different stories do you get when a group of people watch two cars collide at an intersection? Each of the fifty of our best sightings that we gave the scientists to study had some kind of a loophole. In many cases the loopholes were extremely small, but scientific evaluation has no room for even the smallest of loopholes, and we had asked for a scientific evaluation. 
When they had finished commenting on the reports, the scientists pointed out the seriousness of the decision they had been asked to make. They said that they had tried hard to be objective and not to be picayunish, but actually all we had was circumstantial evidence. Good circumstantial evidence, to be sure, but we had nothing concrete, no hardware, no photos showing any detail of a UFO, no measured speeds, altitudes, or sizes, nothing in the way of good, hard, cold scientific facts. To stake the future course of millions of lives on a decision based upon circumstantial evidence would be one of the gravest mistakes in the history of the world. In their conclusions, they touched upon the possibility that the UFOs might be some type of new or yet undiscovered natural phenomenon. They explained that they hadn't given this too much credence. However, if the UFOs were a new natural phenomenon, the reports of their general appearance should follow a definite pattern. The UFO reports didn't. This ended the section of the panel's report that covered their conclusions. The next section was entitled, Recommendations. I fully expected that they would recommend that we at least reduce the activities of Project Blue Book, if not cancel it entirely. I didn't like this one bit because I was firmly convinced that we didn't have the final answer. We needed more and better proof before a final yes or no could be given. The panel didn't recommend that the activities of Blue Book be cut back, and they didn't recommend that it be dropped. They recommended that it be expanded. Too many of the reports had been made by credible observers, the report said, people who should know what they're looking at, people who think things out carefully. Data that was out of the circumstantial evidence class was badly needed, and the panel must have been at least partially convinced that an expanded effort would prove something interesting, because the expansion they recommended would require a considerable sum of money. The investigative force of Project Blue Book should be quadrupled in size, they wrote, and it should be staffed by specially trained experts in the fields of electronics, meteorology, photography, physics, and other fields of science pertinent to UFO investigations. Every effort should be made to set up instruments in locations where UFO sightings are frequent so that data could be measured and recorded during a sighting. In other locations around the country, military and civilian scientists should be alerted and instructed to use every piece of available equipment that could be used to track UFOs. And lastly, they said that the American public should be told every detail of every phase of the UFO investigation, the details of the sightings, the official conclusions, and why the conclusions were made. This would serve a double purpose. It would dispel any of the mystery that security breeds, and it would keep the Air Force on the ball. Sloppy investigations and analyses would never occur. When the panel's conclusions were made known in the government, they met with mixed reactions. Some people were satisfied, but others weren't. Even the opinions of a group of the country's top scientists couldn't overcome the controversy that had dogged the UFO for five years. Some of those who didn't like the decision had sat in on the UFO's trial as spectators, and they felt that the jury was definitely prejudiced, afraid to stick their necks out. They could see no reason to continue to assume that the UFOs weren't interplanetary vehicles. End of Chapter 16 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 17 of The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline 
The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt Chapter 17 What Are UFOs? While the scientists were in Washington, D.C., pondering over the UFO, the UFOs weren't just sitting idly by waiting to find out what they were. They were out doing a little lobbying for the cause, keeping the interest stirred up. And they were doing a good job, too. It was just a few minutes before midnight on January 28, 1953, when a message flashed into Wright-Patterson for Project Blue Book. It was sent, Operational Immediate, so it had priority handling. I was reading it by 12.30 a.m. A pilot had chased a UFO. The report didn't have many details, but it did sound good. It gave the pilot's name and said that he could be reached at Moody Air Force Base. I put in a long-distance call, found the pilot, and flipped on my recorder so that I could get his story word for word. He told me that he had been flying an F-86 on a round-robin navigation flight from Moody Air Force Base to Lawson Air Force Base to Robbins Air Force Base, then back to Moody, all in Georgia. At exactly 9.35, he was at 6,000 feet, heading toward Lawson Air Force Base on the first leg of his flight. He remembered that he had just looked down and had seen the lights of Albany, Georgia, then he'd looked up again and seen this bright white light at 10 o'clock high. It was an unusually bright light, and he said that he thought that this was why it was so noticeable among the stars. He flew on for a few minutes watching it as he passed over Albany. He decided that it must be an extremely bright star or another airplane, except it just didn't look right. It had too much of a definitely circular shape. It was a nice night to fly, and he had to get in so much time anyway, so he thought he'd try to get a little closer to it. If it was an airplane, chances were he could close in, and if it was a star, he should be able to climb up to 30,000 feet, and the light shouldn't change its relative position. He checked his oxygen supply, increased the RPM of the engine, and started to climb. In three or four minutes it was obvious that he was getting above the light, and he watched it. It had moved in relation to the stars. It must be an airplane then, he decided, an airplane so far away that he couldn't see its red and green wing tip lights. Since he'd gone this far, he decided that he'd get closer and make sure it was an airplane. So he dropped the nose of the F-86 and started down. As the needle of the Mach meter nudged the red line, he saw that he was getting closer because the light was getting bigger, but still he couldn't see any lights other than the one big white one. Then it wasn't white any longer. It was changing color. In about a two-second cycle it changed from white to red, then back to white again. It went through this cycle two or three times, and then before he could realize what was going on, he told me, the light changed in shape to a perfect triangle. Then it split into two triangles, one above the other. By this time he had leveled off and wasn't closing in any more. In a flash the whole thing was gone. He used the old standard description for a disappearing UFO. It was just like someone turning off a light. It's there then it's gone. I asked him what he thought he'd seen. He'd thought about flying saucers, he said, but he just couldn't swallow those stories. He thought he had a case of vertigo, and the more he thought about it, the surer he was that this was the answer. He'd felt pretty foolish, he told me, and he was glad that he was alone. Up ahead he saw the sprawling lights of Fort Benning and Lawson Air Force Base, his turning point on the flight, and he'd started to turn, but then he'd checked his fuel. The climb had used up quite a bit, so he changed his mind about going to Robbins Air Force Base and started right back to Moody. He called into the ground station to change his flight plan, but before he could say anything, 
the ground radio operator asked him if he'd seen a mysterious light. Well, he'd seen a light. Then the ground operator proceeded to tell him that the UFO chase had been watched on radar. First, the radar had the UFO target on the scope, and it was a UFO because it was traveling much too slowly to be an airplane. Then the radar operators saw the F-86 approach, climb, and make a shallow dive toward the UFO. At first, the F-86 had closed in on the UFO, but then the UFO had speeded up just enough to maintain a comfortable lead. This went on for two or three minutes. Then it had moved off the scope at a terrific speed. The radar site had tried to call him, the ground station told the F-86 pilot, but they couldn't raise him, so the message had to be relayed through the tower. Rack up two more points for the UFO, another unknown, and another confirmed believer. Two or three weeks after the meeting of the panel of scientists in Washington, I received word that Project Blue Book would follow the recommendations that the panel had made. I was to start implementing the plan right away. Our proposal for setting up instruments had gone to the Pentagon weeks before, so that was already taken care of. We needed more people, so I drew up a new organizational cable that called for more investigators and analysts and sent it through to ATIC's personnel section. About this time in the history of the UFO, the first of a series of snags came up. The scientists had strongly recommended that we hold nothing back, give the public everything. Accordingly, when the press got wind of the Tremonton movie, which up until this time had been a closely guarded secret, I agreed to release it for the newsmen to see. I wrote a press release, which was okayed by General Garland, then the chief of ATIC, and sent it to the Pentagon. It told what the panel had said about the movies. Until proved otherwise, there is no reason why the UFOs couldn't have been seagulls. Then the release went on to say that we weren't sure exactly what the UFOs were. The seagull theory was only an opinion. When the Pentagon got the draft of the release, they screamed, No! No movie for the press and no press release. The seagull theory was too weak, and we had a new publicity policy as of now, don't say anything. This policy, incidentally, is still in effect. The January 7, 1955 issue of the Air Force Information Services letter said, in essence, people in the Air Force are talking too much about UFOs. Shut up. The old theory that if you ignore them, they'll go away is again being followed. Inside of a month, the UFO project took a few more hard jolts. In December of 1952, I'd asked for a transfer. I'd agreed to stay on as chief of Blue Book until the end of February so that a replacement could be obtained and be broken in. But no replacement showed up and none showed up when Lieutenant Rothstein's tour of active duty ended, when Lieutenant Andy Flues transferred to the Alaskan Air Command, or when others left. When I left the UFO project for a two-month tour of temporary duty in Denver, Lieutenant Bob Olson took over as chief. His staff consisted of Airman First Class Max Futch, both men were old veterans of the UFO campaign of 52, but two people can do only so much. When I came back to ATIC in July 1953 and took over another job, Lieutenant Olson was just getting out of the Air Force, and Airman First Class Futch was now it. He said that he felt like the president of Antarctica on a non-expedition year. In a few days, I again had Project Blue Book, as an additional duty this time, and I had orders to build it up. While I had been gone, our instrumentation plan had been rejected. Higher headquarters had decided against establishing a net of manned tracking stations 
astronomical cameras tied in with radars, and our other proposed instrumentation. General Garland had argued long and hard for the plan, but he'd lost. It was decided that the cameras with diffraction gratings over the lenses, the cameras that had been under development for a year, would suffice. The camera program had started out as a top priority project, but it had lost momentum fast when we had tested these widely publicized instruments and found that they wouldn't satisfactorily photograph a million candle power flare at 450 yards. The cameras themselves were all right, but in combination with the gratings, they were no good. However, Lieutenant Olson had been told to send them out, so he sent them out. The first thing that I did when I returned to Project Blue Book was to go over the reports that had come in while I was away. There were several good reports, but only one that was exceptional. It had taken place at Luke Air Force Base, Arizona, the Air Force's advanced fighter bomber school that is named after the famous balloon buster of World War I, Lieutenant Frank Luke, Jr. It was a sighting that produced some very interesting photographs. There were only a few high cirrus clouds in the sky late on the morning of March 3rd when a pilot took off from Luke in an F-84 jet to log some time. He had been flying F-51s in Korea and had recently started to check out in the jets. He took off, cleared the traffic pattern, and started climbing toward Blythe Radio, about 130 miles west of Luke. He'd climbed for several minutes and had just picked up the coded letters BLH that identified Blythe Radio when he looked up through the corner glass in the front part of his canopy. High at about two o'clock, he saw what he thought was an airplane angling across his course from left to right, leaving a long, thin vapor trail. He glanced down at his altimeter and saw that he was at 23,000 feet. The object that was leaving the vapor trail must really be high, he remembered thinking, because he couldn't see any airplane at the head of it. He altered his course a few degrees to the right so that he could follow the trail and increased his rate of climb. Before long, he could tell that he was gaining on the object, or whatever was leaving the vapor trail, because he was under the central part of it. But he still couldn't see any object. This was odd, he thought, because vapor trails don't just happen. Something has to leave them. His altimeter had ticked off another 12,000 feet, and he was now at 35,000. He kept on climbing, but soon the 84 began to mush. It was as high as it would go. The pilot dropped down a thousand feet and continued on. Now he was below the front of the trail, but still no airplane. This bothered him, too. Nothing that we have flies over 55,000 feet except a few experimental airplanes, like the D-558 or those of the X-Series, and they don't stray far from Edwards Air Force Base in California. He couldn't be more than 15,000 feet from the front of the trail, and you can recognize any kind of an airplane 15,000 feet away in the clear air of the substratosphere. He looked and he looked and he looked. He rocked the F-84 back and forth, thinking maybe he had a flaw in the plexiglass of the canopy that was blinking out the airplane, but still no airplane. Whatever it was, it was darn high or darn small. It was moving about 300 miles an hour because he had to pull off power and S to stay under it. He was beginning to get low on fuel about this time, so he hauled up the nose of the jet, took about 30 feet of gun camera film, and started down. When he landed and told his story, the film was quickly processed and rushed to the projection room. It showed a weird, thin, forked vapor trail, but no airplane. Lieutenant Olson and Airman Futch had worked this one over thoroughly. 
the photo lab confirmed that the trail was definitely a vapor trail, not a freak cloud formation. But Air Force Flight Service said no other airplanes in the area, and so did Air Defense Command, because minutes after the F-84 pilot broke off contact, the object had passed into an ADIZ, Air Defense Identification Zone, and radar had showed nothing. There was one last possibility. Blue Book's astronomer said that the photos looked exactly like a meteor smoke trail. But there was one hitch. The pilot was positive that the head of the vapor trail was moving at about 300 miles an hour. He didn't know exactly how much ground he'd covered, but when he first picked up Blythe Radio, he was on Green 5 Airway, about 30 miles west of his base, and when he'd given up the chase, he'd gotten another radio bearing, and he was now almost up to Needles Radio, 70 miles north of Blythe. He could see a lake, Lake Mojave, in the distance. Could a high-altitude jet stream wind have been blowing the smoke cloud? Futch had checked this. No. The winds above 20,000 feet were the usual westerlies, and the jet stream was far to the north. Several months later I talked to a captain who had been at Luke when this sighting occurred. He knew the F-84 pilot, and he'd heard him tell his story in great detail. I won't say that he was a confirmed believer, but he was interested. I never thought much about these reports before, he said, but I know this guy well. He's not nuts. What do you think he saw? I don't know what he saw. Maybe he didn't travel as far as he thought he did. If he didn't, then I guess that he saw a meteor's smoke trail. But if he did know that he'd covered some eighty miles during the chase, I'd say that he saw a UFO, a real one. And I find it hard to believe that pilots don't know what they're doing. During the summer of 1953, UFO reports dropped off considerably. During May, June, and July of 1952, we'd received 637 good reports. During the same months in 1953, we received only 76. We had been waiting for the magic month of July to roll around again, because every July there had been the sudden and unexplained peak in reporting. We wanted to know if it would happen again. It didn't. Only 21 reports came in, to make July the lowest month of the year. But July did bring new developments. Project Blue Book got a badly needed shot in the arm when an unpublicized but highly important change took place. Another intelligence agency began to take over all field investigations. Ever since I'd returned to the project, the orders had been to build it up, get more people, do what the panel recommended. But when I'd asked for more people, all I got was a polite, so sorry. So I did the next best thing and tried to find some organization already in being, which could and would help us. I happened to be expounding my troubles one day at Air Defense Command headquarters while I was briefing General Burgess, ADC's Director of Intelligence, and he told me about his 4602nd Air Intelligence Squadron, a specialized intelligence unit that had recently become operational. Maybe it could help. He'd see what he could work out, he told me. Now, in the military, all commitments to do something carry an almost standard time factor. I'll expedite it means nothing will happen for at least two weeks. I'll do it right away means from a month to six weeks. An answer like, I'll see what I can work out, requires writing a memo that explains what the person was going to see if he could work out and sealing it in a time capsule for preservation so that when the answer finally does come through, the future generation that receives it will know how it all started. But I underestimated the efficiency of the Air Defense Command. Inside of two weeks, 
General Burgess had called General Garland. They'd discussed the problem, and I was back in Colorado Springs setting up a program with Colonel White's 4602nd. The 4602nd's primary function is to interrogate captured enemy airmen during wartime. In peacetime, all that they can do is participate in simulated problems. Investigating UFO reports would supplement these problems and add a factor of realism that would be invaluable in their training. The 4602nd had field teams spread out all over the United States, and these teams could travel anywhere by airplane, helicopter, canoe, jeep, or skis on a minute's notice. The field teams had already established a working contact with the highway patrols, sheriff's offices, police, and the other military in their respective areas, so they were in an excellent position to collect facts about a UFO report. Each member of the field teams had been especially chosen and trained in the art of interrogation, and each team had a technical specialist. We couldn't have asked for a better ally. Project Blue Book was once more back in business. Until the formal paperwork went through, our plan was that whenever a UFO report worth investigating came in, we would call the 4602nd, and they would get a team out right away. The team would make a thorough investigation and wire us their report. If the answer came back unknown, we would study the details of the sighting and, with the help of Project Bear, try to find the answer. A few weeks after the final plans had been made with the 4602nd, I again bade farewell to Project Blue Book. In a simple ceremony on the poop deck of one of the flying saucers that I frequently have been accused of capturing, before a formation of the three-foot-tall green men that I have equally as frequently been accused of keeping prisoner, I turned my command over to Airman First Class Max Futch, and walked out the door into civilian life with separation orders in hand. The UFOs must have known that I was leaving, because the day I found out that officers with my specialty, technical intelligence, were no longer on the critical list, and that I could soon get out of the service, they really put on a show. The show they put on is still the best UFO report in the Air Force files. I first heard about the sighting about two o'clock on the morning of August 13, 1953, when Max Futch called me from ATIC. A few minutes before, a wire had come in carrying a priority just under that reserved for flashing the word the U.S. had been attacked. Max had been called over to ATIC by the O.D. to see the report, and he thought that I should see it. I was a little hesitant to get dressed and go out to the base, so I asked Max what he thought about the report. His classic answer will go down in UFO history. Captain, Max said in his slow, pure Louisiana drawl, you know that for a year I've read every flying saucer report that's come in and that I never really believed in the things. Then he hesitated and added, so fast that I could hardly understand him, "'But you should read this wire.' The speed with which he uttered this last statement was in itself enough to convince me. When Max talked fast, something was important. A half hour later I was at ATIC, just in time to get a call from the Pentagon. Someone else had gotten out of bed to read his copy of the wire. I used the emergency orders that I always kept in my desk and caught the first airliner out of Dayton to Rapid City, South Dakota. I didn't call the 4602nd because I wanted to investigate this one personally. I talked to everyone involved in the incident and pieced together an amazing story. Shortly after dark on the night of the 12th, the Air Defense Command radar station at Ellsworth Air Force Base, just east of Rapid City, had received a call from the local Ground Observer Corps Filter Center. 
a lady spotter at Black Hawk, about ten miles west of Ellsworth, had reported an extremely bright light low on the horizon, off to the northeast. The radar had been scanning an area to the west, working a jet fighter in some practice patrols, but when they got the report, they moved the sector scan to the northeast quadrant. There was a target exactly where the lady reported the light to be. The warrant officer, who was the duty controller for the night, told me that he'd studied the target for several minutes. He knew how weather could affect radar, but this target was well-defined, solid, and bright. It seemed to be moving, but very slowly. He called for an altitude reading, and the man on the height-finding radar checked his scope. He also had the target. It was at 16,000 feet. The warrant officer picked up the phone and asked the filter center to connect him with the spotter. They did, and the two people compared notes on the UFO's position for several minutes. But right in the middle of a sentence, the lady suddenly stopped and excitedly said, It's starting to move. It's moving southwest toward Rapid. The controller looked down at his scope, and the target was beginning to pick up speed and move southwest. He yelled at two of his men to run outside and take a look. In a second or two, one of them shouted back that they could both see a large, bluish-white light moving toward Rapid City. The controller looked down at his scope. The target was moving toward Rapid City. As all three parties watched the light and kept up a steady cross-conversation of the description, the UFO swiftly made a wide sweep around Rapid City and returned to its original position in the sky. A master sergeant who had seen and heard the happenings told me that in all his years of duty, combat radar operations in both Europe and Korea, he'd never been so completely awed by anything. When the warrant officer had yelled down at him and asked him what he thought they should do, he'd just stood there. After all, he told me, what in hell could we do? They're bigger than all of us. But the warrant officer did do something. He called to the F-84 pilot he had on combat air patrol west of the base and told him to get ready for an intercept. He brought the pilot around south of the base and gave him a course correction that would take him right into the light, which was still at 16,000 feet. By this time, the pilot had it spotted. He made the turn, and when he closed to within about three miles of the target, it began to move. The controller saw it begin to move, the spotter saw it begin to move, and the pilot saw it begin to move all at the same time. There was now no doubt that all of them were watching the same object. Once it began to move, the UFO picked up speed fast and started to climb, heading north, but the F-84 was right on its tail. The pilot would notice that the light was getting brighter, and he'd call the controller to tell him about it. But the controller's answer would always be the same. Roger, we can see it on the scope. There was always a limit as to how near the jet could get, however. The controller told me that it was just as if the UFO had some kind of an automatic warning radar linked to its power supply. When something got too close to it, it would automatically pick up speed and pull away. The separation distance always remained about three miles. The chase continued on north, out of sight of the lights of Rapid City and the base, into some very black night. When the UFO and the F-84 got about 120 miles to the north, the pilot checked his fuel. He had to come back. And when I talked to him, he said he was damn glad that he was running out of fuel, because being out over some mighty desolate country alone with the UFO can cause some worry. Both the UFO and the F-84 had gone off the scope, but in a few minutes the jet was back on, heading for home. 
then ten or fifteen minutes behind it was the UFO target also coming back. While the UFO and the F-84 were returning to the base, the F-84 was planning to land, the controller received a call from the jet interceptor squadron on the base. The alert pilots at the squadron had heard the conversations on their radio and didn't believe it. "'Who's nuts up there?' was the comment that passed over the wire from the pilots to the radar people. "'There was an F-84 on the line, ready to scramble,' the man on the phone said, and one of the pilots, a World War II and Korean veteran, wanted to go up and see a flying saucer. The controller said, "'Okay, go!' In a minute or two, the F-84 was airborne, and the controller was working him toward the light. The pilot saw it right away and closed in. Again, the light began to climb out, this time more towards the northeast. The pilot also began to climb, and before long, the light, which at first had been about 30 degrees above his horizontal line of sight, was now below him. He nosed the 84 down to pick up speed, but it was the same old story. As soon as he'd get within three miles of the UFO, it would put on a burst of speed and stay out ahead. Even though the pilot could see the light and hear the ground controller telling him that he was above it and alternately gaining on it or dropping back, he still couldn't believe it. There must be a simple explanation. He turned off all of his lights. It wasn't a reflection from any of the airplane's lights, because there it was. A reflection from a ground light, maybe. He rolled the airplane. The position of the light didn't change. A star. He picked out three bright stars near the light and watched carefully. The UFO moved in relation to the three stars. Well, he thought to himself, if it's a real object out there, my radar should pick it up too. So he flipped on his radar-ranging gun sight. In a few seconds, the red light on his sight blinked on. Something real and solid was in front of him. Then he was scared. When I talked to him, he readily admitted that he'd been scared. He'd met MD-109s, FW-190s and ME-262s over Germany, and he'd met MiG-15s over Korea, but the large, bright, bluish-white light had scared him. He asked the controller if he could break off the intercept. This time, the light didn't come back. When the UFO went off the scope, it was headed toward Fargo, North Dakota, so the controller called the Fargo Filter Center. Had they had any reports of unidentified lights, he asked. They hadn't. But in a few minutes, a call came back. Spotter posts on a southwest-northeast line a few miles west of Fargo had reported a fast-moving, bright, bluish-white light. This was an unknown, the best. The sighting was thoroughly investigated and I could devote pages of detail on how we looked into every facet of the incident, but it will suffice to say that in every facet we looked into, we saw nothing. Nothing but a big question mark asking what was it. When I left Project Blue Book and the Air Force, I severed all official associations with the UFO. But the UFO is like hard drink. You always seem to drift back to it. People I've met, people at work, and friends of friends are continually asking about the subject. In the past few months, the circulation manager of a large Los Angeles newspaper, one of Douglas Aircraft Company's top scientists, a man who is guiding the future development of the super-secret Atlas intercontinental guided missile, a movie star, and a German rocket expert, have called me and wanted to get together to talk about UFOs. Some of them had seen one. I have kept up with the activity of the UFO and Project Blue Book over the past two years through friends who are still in intelligence. 
Before Max Futch got out of the Air Force and went back to law school, he wrote to me quite often, and a part of his letters were always devoted to the latest about the UFOs. Then I make frequent business trips to ATIC, and I always stop in to see Captain Charles Harden, who is now in charge of Blue Book, for a what's new. I always go to ATIC with the proper security clearances, so I'm sure I get a straight answer to my question. Since I left ATIC, the UFOs haven't gone away, and neither has the interest. There hasn't been too much about them in the newspapers because of the present Air Force policy of silence, but they're with us. That the interest is still with us is attested to by the fact that in late 1953, Donald Kehoe's book about UFOs, Flying Saucers from Outer Space, immediately appeared on bestseller lists. The book was based on a few of our good UFO reports that were released to the press. To say that the book is factual depends entirely upon how one uses the word. The details of the specific UFO sightings that he credits to the Air Force are factual, but in his interpretations of the incidents, he blasts away out into the wild blue yonder. During the past two years, the bulk of the UFO activity has taken place in Europe. I might add here that I have never seen any recent official UFO reports or studies from other countries. All of my information about the European flap came from friends. But when these friends are in the intelligence branches of the U.S. Air Force, the RAF, and the Royal Netherlands Air Force, the data can be considered at least good. The European flap started in the summer of 1953, when reports began to pop up in England and France. Quality-wise, these first reports weren't too good, however. But then, like a few reports that occurred early in the stateside, Big Flap of 1952, sightings began to drift in that packed a bit of a jolt. Reports came in that had been made by personal friends of the brass in the British and French Air Forces. Then some of the brass saw them. Corners of mouths started down. In September, several radar sites in the London area picked up unidentified targets streaking across the city at altitudes of from 44,000 to 68,000 feet. The crews who saw the targets said, not weather, and some of these crews had been through the bloody Battle of Britain. They knew their radar. In October, the crew of a British European Airways airliner reported that a strange aerial object had paced their twin-engine Elizabethan for 30 minutes. Then on November 3rd, about 2.30 in the afternoon, radar in the London area again picked up targets. This time, two vampire jets were scrambled, and the pilots saw a strange aerial object. The men at the radar site saw it, too. Through their telescope, it looked like a flat, white-colored tennis ball. The flap continued into 1954. In January, those people who officially keep track of the UFOs pricked up their ears when the report of two Swedish airline pilots came in. The pilots had gotten a good look before the UFO had streaked into a cloud bank. It looked like a discus with a hump in the middle. On through the spring, reports poured out of every country in Europe. Some were bad, some were good. On July 3, 1954, at 8.15 in the morning, the captain, the officers, and 463 passengers on a Dutch ocean liner watched a greenish-colored saucer-shaped object about half the size of a full moon, as it sped across the sky and disappeared into a patch of high clouds. There was one fully documented and substantiated case of a landing during the flap. On August 25th, two young ladies in Masjon, Norway, 
made every major newspaper in the world when they encountered a saucer man. They said that they were picking berries when suddenly a dark man with long shaggy hair stepped out from behind some bushes. He was friendly. He stepped right up to them and started to talk rapidly. The two young ladies could understand English, but they couldn't understand him. At first they were frightened, but his smile soon disarmed them. He drew a few pictures of flying saucers and pointed up in the sky. He was obviously trying to make a point, one of the young ladies said. A few days later it was discovered that the man from outer space was a lost U.S. Air Force helicopter pilot who was flying with NATO forces in Norway. As I've always said, you gotta watch those Air Force pilots, especially those shaggy-haired ones from Brooklyn. The reporting spread to Italy, where thousands of people in Rome saw a strange cigar-shaped object hang over the city for forty minutes. Newspapers claimed that Italian Air Force radar had the UFO on their scopes, but as far as I could determine, this was never officially acknowledged. In December, a photograph of two UFOs over Tormina, Sicily, appeared in many newspapers. The picture showed three men standing on a bridge, with a fourth running up with a camera. All were intently watching two disc-shaped objects. The photo looked good, but there was one flaw. The men weren't looking at the UFOs. They were looking off to the right of them. I'm inclined to agree with Captain Hardin of Blue Book. The photographer just fouled up on his double exposure. Sightings spread across southern Europe, and at the end of October, the Yugoslav government expressed official interest. Belgrade newspapers said that a thoughtful inquiry would be set up, since reports had come from control tower operators, weather stations, and hundreds of farmers. But the part of the statement that swung the most weight was, Scientists in astronomical observatories have seen strange objects with their own eyes. During 1954 and the early part of 1955, my friends in Europe tried to keep me up to date on all of the better reports, but this soon approached a full-time job. Airline pilots saw them, radar picked them up, and military pilots chased them. The press took sides, and the controversy that had plagued the U.S. since 1947 bloomed forth in all its confusion. An ex-Air Chief Marshal in the RAF, Lord Dowding, went to bat for the UFOs. The Netherlands Air Chief of Staff said they can't be. Hermann Oberth, the father of the German rocket development, said that the UFOs were definitely interplanetary vehicles. In Belgium, a senator put the screws on the Secretary of Defense. He wanted an answer. The Secretary of Defense questioned the idea that the saucers were real and said that the military wasn't officially interested. In France, a member of Parliament received a different answer. The French military was interested. The French general staff had set up a committee to study UFO reports. In Italy, Claire Booth Luce, American ambassador to Italy, said that she had seen a UFO and had no idea what it could be. Halfway around the world, in Australia, the UFOs were busy too. At Canberra Airport, the pilot of an RAAF Hawker Sea Fury and a ground radar station teamed up to get enough data to make an excellent radar visual report. In early 1955, the flap began to die down about as rapidly as it had flared up, but it had left its mark. Many more believers. Even the highly respected British aviation magazine Aeroplane had something to say. One of the editors took a long, hard look at the overall UFO picture and concluded, Really, old chaps, I don't know. 
probably the most unique part of the whole European flap was the fact that the Iron Curtain countries were having their own private flap. The first indications came in October 1954, when Romanian newspapers blamed the United States for launching a drive to induce a flying saucer psychosis in their country. The next month, the Hungarian government hauled an expert up in front of the microphone so that he could explain to the populace that UFOs don't really exist, because all flying saucer reports originate in the bourgeois countries, where they are invented by the capitalist warmongers with a view to drawing the people's attention away from their economic difficulties. Next, the USSR itself took up the cry along the same lines when the voice of the Soviet Army, the newspaper Red Star, denounced the UFOs as, you guessed it, capitalist propaganda. In 1955, the UFOs were still there because the day before the all-important May Day celebration, a day when the Soviet radio and TV are normally crammed with programs plugging the glory of Mother Russia to get the peasants in the mood for the next day, a member of the Soviet Academy of Sciences had to get on the air to calm the people's fears. He left out Wall Street and Dulles this time. UFOs just don't exist. It was interesting to note that during the whole Iron Curtain flap, not one sighting or complimentary comment about the UFOs was made over the radio or in the newspapers, yet the flap continued. The reports were obviously being passed on by word of mouth. This fact seemed to negate the theory that if the newspaper reporters and newscasters would give up, the UFOs would go away. The people in Russia were obviously seeing something. While the European flap was in progress, the UFOs weren't entirely neglecting the United States. The number of reports that were coming into Project Blue Book were below average, but there were reports. Many of them would definitely be classed as good, but the best was a report from a photo reconnaissance B-29 crew that encountered a UFO almost over Dayton. About 11 o'clock a.m. on May 24, 1954, an RB-29, equipped with some new aerial cameras, took off from Wright Field, one of the two airfields that make up Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and headed toward the Air Force's photographic test range in Indiana. At exactly 12 noon, they were at 16,000 feet, flying west, about 15 miles northwest of Dayton. A major, a photo officer, was in the nose seat of the 29. All of the gun sights and the bomb sight in the nose had been taken out, so it was like sitting in a large picture window, except you just can't get this kind of a view anyplace else. The major was enjoying it. He was leaning forward, looking down, when he saw an extremely bright, circular-shaped object under and a little behind the airplane. It was so bright that it seemed to have a mirror finish. He couldn't tell how far below him it was, but he was sure that it wasn't any higher than 6,000 feet above the ground, and it was traveling fast, faster than the B-29. It took only about six seconds to cross a section of land which meant that it was going about 600 miles an hour. The Major called the crew and told them about the UFO, but neither the pilot nor the co-pilot could see it because it was now directly under the B-29. The pilot was just in the process of telling him that he was crazy when one of the scanners in an aft blister called in. He and the other scanner could also see the UFO, being a photo ship, the RB-29 had cameras, loaded cameras, so the logical thing to do would be to take a picture. But during a UFO sighting, logic sometimes gets shoved into the background. In this case, however, it didn't, and the Major reached down, punched the button on the intervalometer, 
and the big vertical camera in the aft section of the airplane clicked off a photo before the UFO sped away. The photo showed a circular-shaped blob of light exactly as the Major had described it to the RB-29 crew. It didn't show any details of the UFO, because the UFO was too bright. It was completely overexposed on the negative. The circular shape wasn't sharp, either. It had fuzzy edges, but this could have been due to two things. Its extreme brightness, or the fact that it was high, close to the RB-29, and out of focus. There was no way of telling exactly how high it was, but if it were at 6,000 feet, as the Major estimated, it would have been about 125 feet in diameter. Working with people from the photo lab at Wright-Patterson, Captain Harden from Project Blue Book carried out one of the most complete investigations in UFO history. They checked aircraft flights, rephotographed the area from high and low altitude to see if they could pick up something on the ground that could have been reflecting light, and made a minute ground search of the area. They found absolutely nothing that could explain the round blob of light, and the incident went down as an unknown. Like all good unknown UFO reports, there are as many opinions as to what the bright blob of light could have been as there are people who've seen the photo. Some kind of light phenomenon is the frequent opinion of those who don't believe. They point out that there is no shadow of any kind of a circular object showing on the ground, no shadow, nothing solid. But if you care to take the time, you can show that if the object, assuming that this is what it was, was above 4,000 feet, the shadow would fall out of the picture. Then all you get is a blank look from the light phenomenon theorists. With the sighting from the RB-29 and the photograph, all of the other UFO reports that Blue Book has collected, and all of those that came out of the European flap, the big question, the key question, is, what have the last two years of UFO activity brought out? Have there been any important developments? Some good reports have come in, and the Air Force is sitting on them. During 1954, they received some 450 reports, and once again, July was the peak month. In the first half of 1955, they had 189. But I can assure you that these reports add nothing more as far as proof is concerned. The quality of the reports has improved but they still offer nothing more than the same circumstantial evidence that we presented to the panel of scientists in early 1953. There have been no reports in which the speed or altitude of a UFO has been measured. There have been no reliable photographs that show any details of a UFO, and there is no hardware. There is still no real proof. So a public statement that was made in 1952 still holds true. The possibility of the existence of interplanetary craft has never been denied by the Air Force, but UFO reports offer absolutely no authentic evidence that such interplanetary spacecraft do exist. But with the UFO, what is lacking in proof is always made up for in opinions. To get a qualified opinion, I wrote to a friend, Frederick C. Durant. Mr. Durant, who is presently the director of a large Army Ordnance Test Station, is also a past president of the American Rocket Society and president of the International Astronautical Federation. For those who are not familiar with these organizations, the American Rocket Society is an organization established to promote interest and research in space flight and lists as its members practically every prominent scientist and engineer in the professional fields allied to aeronautics. The International Astronautical Federation is a worldwide federation of such societies. 
Mr. Durant has spent many hours studying UFO reports in the Project Blue Book files, and many more hours discussing them with scientists the world over, scientists who are doing research and formulating the plans for space flight. I asked him what he'd heard about the UFOs during the past several years and what he thought about them. This was his reply. This past summer at the annual congress of the IAF at Innsbruck, as well as previous congresses, Zurich, 1953, Stuttgart, 1952, and London, 1951, none of the delegates representing the rocket and space flight societies of all the countries involved had strong feelings on the subject of saucers. Their attitude was essentially the same as professional members of the American Rocket Society in this country. In other words, there appear to be no confirmed saucer fans in the hierarchy of the professional societies. I continue to follow the subject of UFOs primarily because of my being requested for comment on the interplanetary flight aspects. My personal feelings have not changed in the past four years, although I continue to keep an objective outlook. There are many other prominent scientists in the world whom I met while I was chief of Project Blue Book who, I'm sure, would give the same answer. They've not been able to find any proof, but they continue to keep an objective outlook. There are just enough big question marks sprinkled through the reports to keep their outlook objective. I know that there are many other scientists in the world who, although they haven't studied the Air Force's UFO files, would limit their comment to a large laugh followed by an, It can't be. But it can't be's are dangerous, if for no other reason than history has proved them so. Not more than a hundred years ago, two members of the French Academy of Sciences were unseated because they supported the idea that stones had fallen from the sky. Other distinguished members of the French Academy examined the stones. It can't be. Stones don't fall from the sky, or words to that effect. These are common rocks that have been struck by lightning. Today, we know that the stones from the sky were meteorites. Not more than 50 years ago, Dr. Simon Newcomb, a world-famous astronomer and the first American since Benjamin Franklin to be made an associate of the Institute of France, the hierarchy of the world science, said, It can't be. Then he went on to explain that flight without gas bags would require the discovery of some new material or a new force in nature. And at the same time, Rear Admiral George W. Melville, then chief engineer for the U.S. Navy, said that attempts to fly heavier-than-air vehicles was absurd. Just a little over ten years ago, there was another it can't be. Ex-President Harry S. Truman recalls, in the first volume of the Truman Memoirs, what Admiral William D. Leahy, then Chief of Staff to the President, had to say about the atomic bomb. "'That is the biggest fool thing we have ever done,' he is quoted as saying. "'The bomb will never go off, and I speak as an expert in explosives.' Personally, I don't believe that it can't be. I wouldn't class myself as a believer, exactly, because I've seen too many UFO reports that first appeared to be unexplainable fall to pieces when they were thoroughly investigated. But every time I begin to get skeptical, I think of the other reports, the many reports made by experienced pilots and radar operators, scientists, and other people who know what they're looking at. These reports were thoroughly investigated, and they are still unknowns. Of these reports, the radar visual sightings are the most convincing. When a ground radar picks up a UFO target, and a ground observer sees a light where the radar target is located, then a jet interceptor is scrambled to intercept the UFO, 
and the pilot also sees the light and gets a radar lock on only to have the UFO almost impudently outdistance him, there is no simple answer. We have no aircraft on this earth that can at will so handily outdistance our latest jets. The Air Force is still actively engaged in investigating UFO reports, although during the past six months there have been definite indications that there is a movement afoot to get Project Blue Book to swing back to the old Project Grudge philosophy of analyzing UFO reports. Write them all off, regardless. But good UFO reports cannot be written off with such answers as fatigued pilots seeing a balloon or star, green radar operators with only 15 years experience watching temperature inversion caused blips on their radar scopes, or a mild form of mass hysteria or war nerves. Using answers like these, or similar ones, to explain the UFO reports is an expedient method of getting the percentage of unknowns down to zero, but it is no more valid than turning the hand of a clock ahead to make time pass faster. Twice before, the riddle of the UFO has been solved, only to have the reports increase in both quantity and quality. I wouldn't want to hazard a guess as to what the final outcome of the UFO investigation will be, but I am sure that within a few years there will be a proven answer. The Earth Satellite Program, which was recently announced, research progress in the fields of electronics, nuclear physics, astronomy, and a dozen other branches of the sciences, will furnish data that will be useful to the UFO investigators. Methods of investigating and analyzing UFO reports have improved a hundredfold since 1947, and they are continuing to be improved by the diligent work of Captain Charles Hardin, the present chief of Project Blue Book, his staff, and the 4602nd Air Intelligence Squadron. Slowly but surely these people are working closer to the answer, closer to the proof. Maybe the final proven answer will be that all of the UFOs that have been reported are merely misidentified known objects. Or maybe the many pilots, radar specialists, generals, industrialists, scientists, and the man on the street who have told me, I wouldn't have believed it either if I hadn't seen it myself, knew what they were talking about. Maybe the Earth is being visited by interplanetary spaceships. Only time will tell. End of chapter 17 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 18 of the Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt. Chapter 18. And They're Still Flying. Transcriber's Note. The following three chapters were added to the second edition text in 1960. Four years have passed since the first seventeen chapters of this book were written. During this period, hundreds of unidentified flying objects have been seen and reported to the Air Force. Pilots, with thousands of hours of flying time, are still reporting them. Radar operators, experts in their field, are still tracking them. And crews on the missile test ranges are photographing them. UFOs are not just a fad. The Air Force's Project Blue Book is still very active. Not a week passes that one of the many teams of its nationwide investigation net is not in the field investigating a new UFO report. To pick up the history of the UFO, the best place to start is Cincinnati, Ohio, in the late summer of 1955. 
For some unknown reason, one of those mysterious factors of the UFO, reports from this Hamilton County city suddenly began to pick up. Mass hysteria, the old crutch, wasn't a factor because neither the press, the radio, nor TV was even mentioning the words flying saucer. The reports weren't much in terms of quality. Some lady would see a bobbing white light, or a man putting his car away would see a star jump. These reports, usually passed on to the Air Force through the Air Defense Command's Ground Observer Corps, merely went on the UFO plotting board as a statistic. But before long, in a matter of a week or two, the mass of reports began to draw some official attention because the Ground Observer Corps spotters themselves began to make UFO reports. At times during the middle of August, the telephone lines from the GOC observation posts in Hamilton County, Greater Cincinnati, to the filter center in Columbus would be jammed. Now, even the most cynical Air Force types were begrudgingly raising their eyebrows. These GOC observers were about as close to experts as you can get. Many had spent hundreds of hours scanning the skies since the GOC went into the operation in 1952 to close the gaps in our radar net. Many held awards for meritorious service. They weren't crackpots. But still, the cynics held out. This was really nothing new. The Project Blue Book files were full of similar incidents. In 1947, there had been a rash of reports from the Pacific Northwest. In 1948, there had been a similar outbreak at Edwards Air Force Base, the super-secret test center in the Mojave Desert of California. In 1949, the sightings centered in the Midwest. None had panned out to be anything. Then came the clincher. On the night of August 23rd, shortly before midnight, reports of a UFO began to come in from the Mount Healthy GOC observation post northwest of Cincinnati. Almost simultaneously, Air Defense Command radar picked up a target in that area. A minute or two later, the Forestville and Loveland GOC posts, also in Hamilton County, made sightings. Now, three UFOs, described as brilliant white spheres, swinging in a pendulum-like motion, were on the ADC plotting boards, confirmed by radar. All pretext of ignoring the UFOs was dropped, and at 11.58 p.m., F-84s of the Ohio Air National Guard were scrambled. They were over Cincinnati at 12.10 a.m. and made contact. Boring in at 20,000 feet at 100% power, they closed, but the UFOs left them as if they were standing still. The battle in the Cincinnati sector was on. Almost every night, more UFOs were reported by the GOC. Attempts were made to scramble interceptors, but there were no more radar contacts, and a jet interceptor without ground guidance is worthless. At the height of this activity, it was decided that more information was needed by the Air Defense Command. Maybe from a mass of data, something, some kind of clue, could be sifted out. The answer? Establish a special UFO reporting post. The man to operate this post was tailor-made. On September 9th, Major Hugh McKenzie of the Columbus Filter Center contacted Leonard H. Stringfield in Cincinnati. Stringfield, besides being a very public-minded citizen, was also known as a level-headed saucer expert. Sooner or later, usually sooner, he heard about every UFO sighting in Hamilton County. He was given a code, Foxtrot Kilo 3-0 Blue which provided him with an open telephone line to the ADC Filter Center in Columbus. He was in business, but he didn't have to build up a clientele. It was there. For the next few months, Stringfield did yeoman duty as Cincinnati's one-man UFO center by sifting out the wheat from the chaff 
and passing the wheat on to the Air Force. As he told me the other day, half his nights were spent in his backyard, clad in shorts and binoculars. Fortunately, his neighbors were broad-minded, and the UFOs picked relatively warm nights to appear. Most of the reports Stringfield received were duds. He lost track of the number. The green, red, blue, gold, and white discs, triangles, squares, and footballs, which hovered, streaked, zigzagged, and jerked, turned out to be Venus, Jupiter, Arcturus, and an occasional jet. A fiery orange satellite which hovered for hours turned out to be the North Star viewed through a cheap telescope, and the whole formation of spaceships were the Pleiades. Then it happened again. On the evening of March 23rd, Stringfield's telephone rang. It was Charles Dininger at the Mount Healthy GOC post. They had a UFO in sight off to the east. Could Stringfield see it? He grabbed his extension phone and ran outdoors. There, off to the east, were two large, low-flying lights. One of the lights was a glowing green and the other yellow. They were moving north. Airplane! This was Stringfield's first reaction, but during World War II he had made the long trek up the Pacific with the famous 5th Air Force, and he immediately realized that if it was an airplane it would have to be very close because of the large distance between the lights. And as a clincher, no sound came through the still night. He dialed the long-distance operator and said the magic words, This is Foxtrot Kilo 3-0 Blue. Seconds later, he was talking to the duty sergeant at the Columbus Filter Center. A few more seconds and the sergeant had his story. Another jet was scrambled, and this time Stringfield, via a radio telephone hookup to the airplane, gave the pilot a vector. Stringfield heard the jet closing in, but since it was a one-way circuit, he couldn't hear the pilot's comments. Once again, the UFO took off. This was a fitting climax for the Cincinnati flap. As suddenly as it began, it quit, and from the mass of data that was collected, the Air Force got zero information. In the Mystery League, the UFOs were still ahead. Although the majority of the UFO activity during the last half of 1955 and early 1956 centered in the Cincinnati area, there were other good reports. Near Banning, California, on November 25, 1955, Gene Miller, manager of the Banning Municipal Airport, and Dr. Leslie Ward, a physician, were paced by a globe of white light which suddenly backed up in mid-air while in Miller's airplane. It was the same old story. Miller was an experienced pilot, a former Air Force instructor and air freight pilot with several thousand hours flying time. Commercial pilots came in for more than their share of the sightings in 1956. On January 22nd, UFO investigators talked to the crew of a Pan American airliner. That night, at 8.30 p.m., the Houston to Miami DC-7B had been a beam of New Orleans out over the Gulf of Mexico. There was a partial moon shining through small wisps of high cirrus clouds, but generally it was a clear night. The captain of the flight was back in the cabin chatting with the passengers. The co-pilot and engineer were alone on the flight deck. The engineer had moved up from his control panel and was sitting beside the co-pilot. At 8.30 it was time for a radio position report, and the co-pilot, Tom Tompkins, leaned down to set up a new frequency on the radio controls. Robert Mueller, the engineer, was on watch for other aircraft. It was ten, maybe twenty seconds after Tompkins leaned down that Mueller just barely perceived a pinpoint of moving light off to his right. 
even before his thought processes could tell him it might be another airplane, the light began to grow in size. Within a short six seconds, it streaked across the nose of the airliner, coming out of the gulf and disappearing inland over Mississippi or Alabama. Tompkins, the co-pilot, never saw it because Mueller was too astounded to even utter a sound. But Mueller had a good look. The body of the object was shaped like a bullet and gave off a pale, luminescent blue glow. The stubby tail, or exhaust, was marked by spurts of yellow flame or light. The size? Mueller, like any experienced observer, had no idea, since he didn't know how far away it was. But it was big. One sentence, dangling at the bottom of the report, was one I'd seen many, many times before. Mr. Mueller was a complete skeptic regarding UFO reports. During 1956, there was a rumor, I heard it many times, that the Air Force had entered into a grand conspiracy with the U.S. news media to stamp out the UFO. The common people of the world, the rumor had it, were not yet psychologically conditioned to learn that we had been visited by superior beings. By not ever mentioning the words, unidentified flying object, the public would forget and go on their merry stupid way. I heard this rumor so often, in fact, that I began to wonder myself. But a few dollars invested in martinis for old buddies in the Kitty Hawk room of the Biltmore Hotel in Dayton or the men's bar in the Statler Hotel in Washington, produces a lot of straight and reliable information, much better than you get through official channels. There was no silence order, I learned, only the same old routine. If the files at ATIC were open to the public, it would take a staff of a dozen people to handle all the inquiries. Secondly, many of the inquiries come from saucer screwballs, and these people are like a hypochondriac at the doctor's. Nothing will make them believe the diagnosis unless it is what they came in to hear, and there are plenty of saucer screwballs. One officer summed it up neatly when he told me, It isn't the UFOs that give us the trouble, it's the people. As a double-check, I called several newspaper editors the other day and asked, Why don't you print more UFO stories? The answers were simple. It's the old dog-bites-man bit. Ninety-nine percent have no news value any more. On May 10, 1956, the man bit the dog. A string of UFO sightings in Pueblo, Colorado, hit the front pages of newspapers across the United States. Starting on the night of May 5th, for six nights, the citizens of Pueblo, including the Ground Observer Corps, saw UFOs zip over their community. As usual, there were various descriptions, but everyone agreed they'd never seen anything like it before. On the sixth night, the Air Force sent in an investigator, and he saw them. Between the hours of 9 o'clock p.m. and midnight, he saw six groups of triangular-shaped objects that glowed with a dull fluorescence, faint but bright enough to see. They passed from horizon to horizon in six seconds. The next day, this investigator was called back to Colorado Springs, his base, and a fresh team was sent to Pueblo. The man really chomped down on the dog in July, and the UFO really made headlines. Maybe it was because a fellow newspaper editor was involved, along with the Kansas Highway Patrol, the Navy, and the Air Force. Or maybe it was simply because it was a good UFO sighting. About the time Miss Iowa was being judged Miss USA in the 1956 Miss Universe pageant at Long Beach, the city editor of Arkansas City Daily Traveler and a trooper of the Kansas State Highway Patrol were sitting in a patrol cruiser in Arkansas City. It was a hot and muggy night. Occasionally the radio in the cruiser would come to life. 
an accident near Salina, a drunk driving south from Topeka, another accident near Wichita. But generally, south-central Kansas was dead. The newspaper editor was about ready to go home. It was ten o'clock, when the small talk he and the trooper had been making was brought to an abrupt finale by three high-pitched beeps from the cruiser's radio. An important all-cars bulletin was coming. Twenty-five years as a newspaper man had trained the editor to always be on the alert for a story, so he reached down and turned up the volume. Within seconds, he had his story. The Hutchinson Naval Air Station is picking up an unidentified target on their radar, the voice of the dispatcher said, with as much of an excited tone as a police dispatcher can have. Take a look. Then the dispatcher went on to say that the target was moving in a semicircular area that reached out from 50 to 75 miles east of Hutchinson. A B-47 from McConnell Air Force Base at Wichita was in the area, searching. The last fix on the object showed it to be near Emporia in Marion County. The two men in the patrol cruiser looked at each other for a second or two. Like all newspaper editors, this man had had his belly full of flying saucer reports, but this was a little different. "'Let's go out and look,' he said, fully doubting that they would see anything. They drove to a hill in the north part of the city where they could get a good view of the sky and parked. In a few minutes, an Arkansas City police car joined them. It was a clear night except for a few wispy clouds scattered across the north sky. They waited, they looked, and they saw. Shortly before midnight, off to the north, appeared a brilliantly lighted, teardrop-shaped blob of light. Prongs, or streams of bright light, sprayed downward from the blob toward the earth. It was big, about the size of a 200-watt light bulb. As the group of men silently watched, the weird light continued to drift, and for many minutes it moved vertically and horizontally over a wide area of the sky. Then it faded away. As one of the men later told me, I was glad to see it go. I was pooped. The next morning, literally hundreds of people spent hours conjecturing and describing. After all these years of talk, they'd actually seen one. Several photos showing the big blob of light were shown around, and two fishermen readily admitted they'd packed up their poles and tackle boxes and headed home when they saw it. Editor Coyne summed up the feeling of hundreds of Kansans when he said, I have tended to discount the stories about flying objects, but, brother, I am now a believer. What was it? First of all, it was confusion. Early the next morning, Air Force investigators flooded the area, asking the questions, What size was it in comparison to a key or a dime? Would it compare in size to a light bulb? Was there any noise? As soon as they left, the military tersely announced that no radar had picked up any target, and no B-47s had been sent out. Then they pulled the plugs on the incoming phone lines. The confusion mounted when newsmen tapped their private sources and learned that a B-47 had been sent into the area. A few days later, the Air Force told the Kansans what they'd seen the reflection from burning waste gas torches in a local oil field. This was greeted with the Kansan version of the Bronx cheer. 1956 was a big year for Project Blue Book. According to an old friend, Captain George Gregory, who was then chief of Blue Book, they received 778 reports. And through a lot of sleepless nights, they were able to solve 97.8 percent of them. Only 17 remained unknowns. Digging through the reports for 1956, outside of the ones already mentioned, 
there were few real good ones. In Banning, California, Ground Observer Corps spotters watched a balloon-like object make three rectangular circuits around the town. In Plymouth, New Hampshire, two GOC spotters reported a bright yellow object which left a trail similar to a jet moving slowly at a very high altitude. At Rosebury, Oregon, state police received many reports of funny green and red lights moving slowly around a television transmitter tower. And in Hartford, Connecticut, two amateur astronomers looking at Saturn through a four-inch telescope were distracted by a bright light. Turning their telescopes on it, they observed a large whitish-yellow light shaped like a ten-gallon hat. Many other people evidently saw the same UFO because the local newspaper said, Reports have been pouring in. In Miami, a Pan American Airlines radar operator tracked a UFO at speeds up to 4,000 miles an hour. Five of his skeptical fellow radar operators watched and were confirmed. At Moneymore, Northern Ireland, a level-headed and God-fearing citizen and his wife captured an 18-inch saucer by putting a headlock on it. They started to the local police station, but put the saucer down to climb over a hedge and it went whirling off to the hinterlands of space. The 27th Air Defense Division that guards the vast aircraft and missile centers of Southern California was alerted on the night of September 9th. In rapid succession, a Western Airlines pilot making an approach to Los Angeles International Airport, the Ground Observer Corps, and numerous Los Angeles citizens called in a white light moving slowly across the Los Angeles basin. When the big defense radars on San Clemente Island picked up an unknown target in the same area that the light was being reported, two F-89 jet interceptors were scrambled but saw nothing. A few days later, investigators learned that a $27.65 weather balloon had caused the many thousand dollars worth of excitement. The matter of scrambling interceptors has been a sore point with the UFO business for a long time. Many people believe that the mere fact the Air Force will send up two, three, or even four aircraft that cost $2,000 an hour to fly is proof positive that the Air Force doesn't believe its own story that UFOs don't exist. The official answer you'll get if you ask the Air Force is that they scramble against any unknown target as a matter of defense. But over coffee, you get a different answer. They write the UFO scrambles off as training cost. Each pilot has to get so much flying time, and simulating intercepts against an unidentified light is more interesting than merely burning holes in the air. If appropriations are ever cut to the point where training must be curtailed, and, heaven forbid, there will be no more scrambles after flying saucers. And the colonel who told me this was emphatic. The year 1957 was heralded in by a startling announcement which ended a long dry spell of UFO news. At a press conference in Washington, D.C., Retired Admiral Delmer S. Farney made a statement. Newspapers across the country carried it complete, or in part, and people read the statement with interest, because Admiral Farney is well known as a sensible and knowledgeable man. He had fought for and built up the Navy's guided missile program back in the days when people who talked of ballistic missiles and satellites had to fight for their beliefs. First, Admiral Farney announced that a non-profit organization, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, NICAP, had been established to investigate UFO reports. He would be chairman of the Board of Governors, and his board would consist of such potent names as retired Vice Admiral R. H. Hillenketter, for two years the director of the super-secret Central Intelligence Agency, 
retired Lieutenant General P. A. Del Valle, ex-commanding general of the famous 1st Marine Division, retired Rear Admiral Herbert B. Knowles, noted submariner of World War II. Then Admiral Farney read a statement regarding the policies of NICAP. It was as follows. Reliable reports indicate that there are objects coming into our atmosphere at very high speeds. No agency in this country or Russia is able to duplicate at this time the speeds and accelerations which radars and observers indicate these flying objects are able to achieve. There are signs that an intelligence directs these objects because of the way they fly. The way they change position and formations would indicate that their motion is directed. The Air Force is collecting factual data on which to base an opinion, but time is required to sift and correlate the material. As long as such unidentified objects continue to navigate through the Earth's atmosphere, there is an urgent need to know the facts. Many observers have ceased to report their findings to the Air Force because of the seeming frustration, that is, all information going in and none coming out. It is in this area that NICAP may find its greatest mission. We are in a position to screen independently all UFO information coming in from our filter groups. General Albert C. Wiedemeyer will serve the committee as evaluations advisor, and complete analyses will be arranged through leading scientists. After careful evaluation, we shall release our findings to the public. Donald Kehoe, a retired Marine Corps major and author of three top-seller UFO books, was appointed director. The mere fact that another civilian UFO investigative group was being born was neither news nor UFO history, because since 1947, well over a hundred such organizations had been formed. Many still exist. Many flopped. But none deserve the niche in UFO history that does NICAP. NICAP had power and it raised a storm that took months to calm down. NICAP got off to a fast start. Dues were pegged at $7.50 a year, which included a subscription to the very interesting magazine The UFO Investigator, and the operation went into high gear. With such names as Farney, Wiedemeyer, Hillenketter, Del Valley, and Knowles for prestige, and Kehoe for intrigue, saucer fans all over the United States packaged up their 750 and mailed it to headquarters. Each, in turn, became a listening post and an investigator. Kehoe set up a panel of special advisors, all saucer fans, to impartially evaluate the UFO reports ferreted out by the listening posts, based on facts uncovered by the investigators. Even though the leading scientists Farney mentioned in his statement never materialized, NICAP was cocked, primed, and ready. To get things off to a gala start, Kehoe, as director of NICAP, wrote to the Air Force and set out NICAP's eight-point plan. In essence, this plan suggested, some say demanded, that the Air Force let NICAP ride herd on Project Blue Book. First of all, NICAP wanted its panel of special advisors to review and concur with all of the conclusions on the thousands of UFO reports that the Air Force had in its files. This went over like a worm in the punch bowl. First of all, the Air Force didn't feel it was necessary to review its files. Secondly, they knew NICAP. If every balloon, planet, airplane, and bird that caused a UFO report hadn't been captured and a signed confession wrung out, the UFO would be a visitor from outer space. The Air Force decided to ignore NICAP. But NICAP wouldn't be ignored. They bombarded everyone from the Secretary of the Air Force on down with telephone calls, telegrams, and letters. Still, the Air Force remained silent. 
Then NICAP headquarters called in the troops, and members from all corners of the nation cut loose. The barrage of mail broke the logjam, and just enough information to constitute an answer dribbled out of the office of the Secretary of the Air Force. But this didn't satisfy Kehoe or his UFO-hungry Nicapions. They wanted blood, and that blood had to taste like spaceships, or they wouldn't be happy. The cudgel they picked up next was powerful. The Air Force had said that there was nothing classified about Project Blue Book, yet NICAP hadn't seen every blessed scrap of paper in the Air Force UFO files. This was unwarranted censorship. While Congress was right in the middle of such important and crucial problems as foreign policy, atomic disarmament, racketeering, integration, and a dozen and one other problems, NICAP began to bedevil every senator and representative who was polite enough to listen. It's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease, and in November 1957, the United States Senate Committee on Government Operations began an inquiry concerning UFOs. I gave my testimony, and so did others who had been associated with Project Blue Book. A few weeks later, the inquiry was dropped. But NICAP had made its name. Of all of the thorns that have been pounded into the UFO side of the Air Force, NICAP drove theirs the deepest. In the midst of all this mess, Admiral Farney, General Wedemeyer, and General DeValley, politely and quietly, resigned from NICAP's Board of Governors. Neither the loss of these famous names nor the defeat at the hands of the Air Force has stopped NICAP. They continue to forge ahead, undaunted. In many UFO incidents, they have actually uncovered additional and sometimes interesting information. NICAP director Don Kehoe has taken a beating, being accused of profiteering, trying to make headlines, and other minor social crimes. But personally, I doubt this. Kehoe is simply convinced that UFOs are from outer space, and he's a dedicated man. While the big NICAP Air Force battle was going on, the UFOs were not waiting to see who won. They were still flying. At Ellington Air Force Base, Texas, a Ground Observer Corps team spotted a UFO and passed it on to a radar crew. Although the radar crew couldn't pick it up on their sets, they saw it visually. The lieutenant in charge told investigators how it crossed from horizon to horizon in 45 seconds. On March 9th, several passengers on a New York to San Juan Puerto Rico airliner were injured when the pilot pulled the big DC-6 up sharply to miss a large greenish-white clearly circular-shaped object which was on a collision course with the plane. The pilots of several other airliners in the same airway confirmed the sighting. Two weeks later, jet interceptors were scrambled over Los Angeles to look for a UFO. According to the records, the first report of the brilliant and mysterious flashing red light came from a man in the east part of Pasadena. But his report was quickly lost in the shuffle as more and more calls began to come in. As the flashing light crossed the Los Angeles basin from southeast to northwest, Hundreds of people saw it. Traffic was tied up on the Rose Parade famous Colorado Boulevard as drivers stopped their cars to get out and look. As it neared the Air Defense Command Filter Center in Pasadena, the Filter Center personnel, those that could be spared, went out and looked. They saw it. Police switchboards lit up a solid red as it crossed the San Gabriel Valley. Near midnight, a CAA radar picked up unidentified targets near the Oxnard Air Force Base at Oxnard, California, northwest of Los Angeles, and at almost that identical time, people on the airbase saw the light. This did it, and two powerful jets, equipped with all-weather radar, came screaming into the area. 
but it was the same old story. No contact. The UFO was gone. The Midwest was visited on the morning of May 23rd, when five observers in Kansas City saw four silver disc-shaped objects flying in formation at extremely high speed. At one point during their flight, two of the objects broke formation and veered off, but soon rejoined. It took the objects only four minutes to cross the sky. There were other reports during the first half of 1957, 250 of them to be exact, and many could be classified as good. But they were nothing compared to those that were to come. On November 3, 1957, a rash of sightings broke out in Texas, and they had a brand new twist. To do things upright, the powers that guide the UFO picked the town of Leveland, only 27 miles west of Lubbock, the home of the now traditional Lubbock Lights. It was with a tug of nostalgia that I read about these reports, because five years before, almost to the day, Lubbock had plunged the Air Force and me into the UFO mystery on a grand scale. According to the best interpretation of the maze of conflicting stories, facts, and rumors about these famous sightings, the only positive fact is that there were scattered storm clouds across West Texas on the night of November 4, 1957. This was unusual for November, and everyone in the community was just a little edgy. It was early in the evening, at least early for West Texas on a Saturday night, when Pedro Saucedo, a farm worker, and his friend Joe Salaz started out in Saucedo's truck toward Pettit, ten miles northwest of Leveland. They had just turned off State Highway 116 and were heading north on a country road when the two men saw a flash of light in an adjacent field. Saucedo, a Korean War veteran, and Salaz didn't pay much attention to the light at first. They only noticed that it was coming closer. It seemed to be paralleling us and edging a little closer all the time, Saucedo later recalled. Still, neither man paid any attention to the light. They drove on, Saucedo watching the road and Salaz talking. Then it hit. The first signal of something wrong was when the truck headlights went out. Then the engine stopped. Before Saucedo could hit the starter again, he glanced over his left shoulder. A huge ball of fire was rapidly drifting toward the truck. Without a second's hesitation, Saucedo did what the Korean War had taught him to do when in doubt. He shoved open the car door and hit the dirt. Salaz just sat. The thing passed directly over my truck with a great sound and a rush of wind, Saucedo later told County Sheriff Weir Clem after he'd started his truck and had driven back to Leveland. It sounded like thunder and my truck rocked from the blast. I felt a lot of heat. The thing which disappeared across the prairie looked like a fiery tornado. Five years before, and a little east of where Saucedo and Salaz were buzzed, I had talked to two women who described almost an identical UFO, and it remains unknown to this day. In Leveland, the two men's story would have been enough to keep Sheriff Clem busy for the rest of the night, but between the hours of 8.15 p.m. and midnight on the 2nd, the Leveland thing struck five more times. James D. Long, a Waco truck driver, came upon it four miles west of Leveland and fainted as it roared over his truck. Ronald Martin, another truck driver, was stopped east of Leveland, as was Newell Wright, a Texas Tech student. Jim Wheeler, Jose Alvarez, and Frank Williams added their stories to the melee. All of those who had been attacked told Sheriff Clem a similar story. The thing was shaped something like an egg standing on end. It was fiery red, more like a red neon light. 
It was about 200 feet long and was about 200 feet in the air. When it came close to cars, the engines would stop and the lights would go out. Everyone, Sheriff Clem said, seemed very excited. That night, everyone in West Texas saw UFOs. Sheriff Clem saw a brilliant light in the distance. Highway patrolman Lee Hargrove and Floyd Cavan reported similar brilliant lights at the same time, but from a different location. The control tower operators at the Amarillo Airport, to the north, saw a blue gaseous object which moved swiftly and left an amber trail. There were dozens more. It was a memorable Saturday night in Leveland. But, unbeknownst to Sheriff Clem or the residents of West Texas, they weren't alone on the visitors' list. At 2.30 a.m. on Sunday morning, only a few hours after the thing raised havoc around Leveland, an Army military police patrol was cruising the super-secret White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico. Here is their report as they gave it to Air Force UFO investigators. At approximately 0230, 3 November 1957, Source, together with Private First Class X, were on a routine patrol of the uprange area of the White Sands Proving Ground when Source noticed a very bright object high in the sky. This object slowly descended to an altitude estimated to be approximately 50 yards, where it remained motionless for about three minutes. Then it descended to the ground where the light went out. The object was not blurred or fuzzy, emitted no vapor or smoke. The object was in view for about ten minutes, and Source estimated that it was approximately two or three miles away. It was estimated to be between seventy-five and a hundred yards in diameter and shaped like an egg. Source stated that it was as large as a grapefruit held at arm's length. The weather was cold, drizzling, and windy, and Source stated no stars were visible. After the light went out, Source and Private First Class X continued north to the stallion site camp and reported the incident to the sergeant of the guard, who returned to the area but failed to find anything. The flap was on. On Monday, the 4th, the Leveland thing struck again near the White Sands Proving Ground. James Stokes, a 20-year Navy veteran and an electronics engineer, had the engine of his new Mercury stopped as a brilliant egg-shaped object made a pass at the highway. As it went over, Stokes said, It felt like the radiation of a giant sun lamp. Stokes said there were ten other carloads of people stopped, but if this is true, no one ever found out who they were. The Air Force wrote off Stokes' story as hoax, presumably suggested by the Leveland, Texas reports. Maybe the Air Force didn't believe James Stokes, but when the Coast Guard cutter Cibago radioed in their report from the Gulf of Mexico, wheels began to turn fast. On Tuesday morning, the 5th, the Seabago was about 200 miles south of the mouth of the Mississippi River on a northerly heading. At 5.10 a.m., her radar picked up a target off to the left at a distance of about 14 miles. This was really nothing unusual because they were under heavily traveled air lanes. The early morning watch is always rough, and as the small group of officers and men in the Combat Information Center quietly watched the target, with a noticeable lack of enthusiasm, it moved south, made a turn, and headed back to the north again. A few of the men noticed that the turn looked a little different, but this early in the morning they didn't give it much thought. At 5.14 the target went off the scope to the north. At 5.16 it was back, and the lassitude was instantly gone. Now the target was 22 miles south of the ship. No one in the CIC had to draw a picture. 
something, in two minutes, had disappeared off the scope to the north, made a big swing around the ship, out of radar range, and had swung in from the south. Word went up to the lookouts. They tensed up and began to scan the sky. The radar contacts continued. This second contact, south of the ship, was held for two full minutes as the target moved out from 22 to 55 miles. Then it faded. At 5.20, the target was back, but now it was north of the ship again, and it was hovering. Again, the lookouts were called. Could they see anything now? Their no answers didn't hold for long, because seconds later, their terse reports began to come in to the CIC. A brilliant light, like a planet, was streaking across the northwest sky about 30 degrees above the horizon. Unfortunately, the radar had lost contact for a moment when the visual report came in. At 537, the target disappeared from the scopes and was gone for good. The Seabago case was ended, but the UFOs continued to fly. Reports continued to come into the Air Force, and a lot of investigators lost a lot of sleep. The next day, at 3.50 p.m., the CO of an Air Force weather detachment at Long Beach, California, and 12 airmen watched six saucer-shaped UFOs streak along under the bases of a 7,000-foot-high cloud deck. On the same day, also in Long Beach, Officers and men at the Los Alamitos Naval Air Station saw UFOs almost continuously between the hours of 6.05 and 7.25 p.m. Long Beach police reported well over a hundred calls during this same period. During November and December of 1957, it was a situation of you name the city and there was a UFO report from there. Trying to sift them out and put them in a book would be like sorting out a plate full of spaghetti. And if you succeeded, you would have a document the size of the New York City telephone directory. Most of the reports were explained. The Leveland, Texas sightings were written off as St. Elmo's Fire. The military police at the White Sands Proving Ground saw the moon through broken clouds and the crew of the Coast Guard ship Seabago were actually tracking several separate aircraft. The 1957 flap was as great as the previous record-breaking 1952 flap. During 1957, the Air Force received 1,178 UFO reports. Of these, only 20 were placed in the unknown list. In comparison to 1957, the first months of 1958 were a doldrums. Reports drifted in at a leisurely pace, and the Air Force UFO investigating teams, blooded during the avalanche of 1957, picked off solutions like knocking off clay pipes in a shooting gallery. In Los Angeles, a few clear nights drove the Air Defense Command nuts. People could actually see the sky, and the sight of so many stars frightened them. Unusual atmospherics in Georgia made stars jump and radars go crazy, and a balloon hanging over Chicago at dusk cost the taxpayers another several thousand dollars, but the pilots made their flight pay. A statement by Dr. Carl Jung, renowned Swiss psychologist, was widely publicized in July 1958. Dr. Young was quoted as saying, in a letter to a U.S. saucer club, UFOs are real. When Dr. Young read what he was supposed to have written, the Alps rang with screams of, Misquote! No one got excited until the early morning of September 29th. Shortly before dawn on that day, a confusing mess of reports began to pour into the Air Force. Some came from the Washington, D.C. area. People right in NICAP's backyard told of seeing a large, round, fiery object shoot across the sky from southeast to northwest. 
a few excited observers, all from the country northwest of Washington, had seen it land, and even as they telephoned in their reports, they could see it glowing behind a neighbor's barn. Other reports, also of a huge, round, fiery object, came in from such places as Pittsburgh, Somerset, and Bedford, all in Pennsylvania, and Hagerstown and Frederick in Maryland. To add to the confusion, people in Pennsylvania reported seeing three objects flying in formation. When the dust settled, Air Force investigators took the first step in the solution of any UFO report. They plotted the sightings on a map and collated the directions of flight, descriptions, and times of observation. It was obvious that the object had moved along a line between Washington, D.C. and Pittsburgh. It was traveling about 7,000 miles an hour, and everyone had obviously seen the same object. By the time it had passed into Pennsylvania, it had split into three objects. But the hooker was the reported landings northeast of Washington. Too many people had reported a glow on the ground to write this factor off even though an investigator, dispatched to the scene shortly after dawn, had found nothing in the way of evidence. One possibility was that some unknown object had streaked across the sky, landed, and then took off again. Could be, but it wasn't. The next night the case broke. The glow from the landing was a bright floodlight on a barn. No one had ever really noticed it before until the object passed nearby. A few days later the object itself was identified. From the many identical descriptions, Project Blue Book's astrophysicist pinned it down as a large meteor. The meteor had broken up near the end of its flight to produce the illusion of three objects flying in formation. Of all the 590 UFO reports the Air Force received in 1958, probably the weirdest was solved before it was ever reported. About four o'clock on the afternoon of October 2, 1958, three men were standing in a group, talking, outside a tungsten mill at Danby, California, right in the heart of the Mojave Desert. The men had been talking for about five minutes when one of them, who happened to be facing the northwest, stopped right in the middle of a sentence and pointed. The other two men looked and to their astonishment saw a brilliant glow of light. It was so close to the horizon that it was difficult to tell if it was on the horizon or in the air just above it. At first the men ignored the light, but as it persisted they became more interested. They'd all heard flying saucer stories, and, they later admitted, this possibility entered their minds. As they watched, they speculated. It could be something natural, but all of them had been around this area for months, and they'd never seen this light before. About the time they decided to get a telescope and take a closer look, the light suddenly faded. All the next day, the men kept glancing off toward the northwest as they worked, but the clear blue sky was blank. Then at 4 o'clock p.m., the light was back. This time they had a telescope. All the men took turns looking at the object, and all agreed that it was about fifteen feet long, five feet high, and solid. It looked like the sun reflecting off shiny metal. It was about four miles away, they estimated, and almost exactly on the horizon. Now the men's curiosity was thoroughly whetted. Martian spaceship or whatever, they were going after it. But a several-hour search of the area produced nothing, and as soon as they left the mill they lost sight of the object. Darkness brought the search to a halt. The next day, at four o'clock p.m., a crowd had gathered and the UFO kept its appointment. Again the men studied the object and tension ran high. Someone had resurrected the stories of UFOs landing in the desert. 
at the time they'd sounded absurd, but now, standing there looking at a UFO, it was different. A party of men were all ready to jeep out into the desert to make another search when one of them made a discovery. There were guy wires coming out of the UFO and running down into the trees. Other people looked, and then the solution hit like a fireball. Exactly in line with the UFO and ten miles away, not four, was a set of antennas for the California State Highway Patrol radio. The sun's rays were reflecting from these antennas. They'd never seen this before because on only a few days during the year was the sun at exactly the right angle to produce the reflection. The men were right. In a few days, the Danby UFO left, and it never came back. 1958 was not a record year for UFOs. The 590 reports received didn't stack up to the 1,178 for 1957, or the 778 for 1956, or the 918 for 1952. But a new record was set when the percentage of unknowns was pared down to a new low. During 1958, only nine-tenths of one percent of the reports, or five reports, were classified as unknown. More manpower, better techniques, and just plain old experience has allowed the Air Force to continually lower the percentage of unknowns from 20% while I was in charge of Project Blue Book, to less than 1% today. No story of the UFO would be complete without describing one of these unknowns, so here's one exactly as it came out of the Project Blue Book files. On 31 October 1958, this center received a TWX reporting a UFO near Lock Raven Dam. A request for a detailed investigation was sent to the nearest Air Force base. The following is a summary of the incident and subsequent investigation. Two civilians were driving around near Lock Raven Dam on the evening of 26 October 1958. When they rounded a curve about 200 to 300 yards from a bridge, they saw what appeared to be a large, flat, egg-shaped object hovering about 100 to 150 feet above the bridge superstructure. They slowed their car, and when they got to within 75 or 80 feet of the bridge, their engine quit and their lights went out. The driver immediately stepped on the brakes and stopped the car. Attempts were made to start the car, and when this was unsuccessful, they became frightened and got out of the car. They put the car between them and the object and watched for approximately 30 to 45 seconds. The object then seemed to flash a brilliant white light and both men felt heat on their faces. Then there was heard a loud noise and the object began rising vertically. The object became very bright while rising and its shape could not be seen as it rose. It disappeared in five to ten seconds. After the object disappeared, the car was started, and they turned it around and drove to where a phone was located and contacted the Towson Police Department. Two patrolmen were sent to meet them. The two men told the patrolman of their experience. The witnesses then noticed a burning sensation on their faces and became concerned about possible radiation burns. They went to a Baltimore hospital for an examination. Both witnesses were advised by the doctor that they had no reason for concern. An extensive investigation was made concerning this incident. However, no valid conclusion could be made as to the possible nature of the sighting and it remains unidentified. So ended 1958, and in its final tally of sightings for the year, Project Blue Book added a new space-age touch. Earth satellites had accounted for 11 UFO reports. 
1959 came in with a good one. We used to call these reports ground air visual radar sightings, and they make interesting reading. At Duluth, Minnesota, in March, it's dark by five o'clock in the evening. It's cold. The temperature hovers around zero, and it's so clear you have a feeling you can almost reach up and touch the stars. It was this kind of a night on March 13, 1959, and as the officers and men of the Air Defense Command Fighter Squadron at the Duluth Municipal Airport moved, they shuffled along slowly because the heavy parkas and arctic clothing they wore were heavy. Then came the UFO report, and things speeded up. At 5.20 p.m. exactly, the operations officer noted the time, word came in over the comm line that someone had sighted an unidentified flying object off to the north. Word flashed around the squadron, and as people rushed out of buildings to look, they were joined by those already outside. And there it was, big, round, and bright, and it was moving at high speed. Some observers thought it was greenish, others reddish, but it was something, and it was there. The bearing was three hundred degrees from the base. It was an awesome sight, and it became even more awesome when a quick call to an adjacent radar site brought back the word that they had just picked up a target on a bearing of 300 degrees from the air base. They were tracking it and taking scope photos. In the alert hangar, the two pilots standing the alert had been listening to a running account of the sighting, so when the scramble bell rang, they took off of their airplanes like a couple of sprinters. As the two big alert hangar doors swung up, the whining screech of the jet starters, followed by thunder of the engines, filled the airfield. The atmosphere around the Duluth Municipal Airport was closely akin to Santa Anita, the instant the starting gates open. I've been around when jet interceptors scramble, and you can twang the tension with your finger. As the people on the ground watched, they could first see the flame of the jet's afterburner disappear into the night. Then the jet's navigation lights faded out on a bearing of 300 degrees. At the radar site, they still had the target, and there were many excited people watching the big pale orange scopes as two little bright points of light began to close on a bigger blob of light. Then the pilots gave the tally-ho. They were in visual contact. But the tally-ho had no more been given than the big blob of light on the target began to pull away from the fighters and was soon off the scope. The pilots kept visual contact, though, and the radio provided the details of the chase to the now blind crew in the radar room. The two jets bored north, with afterburner on, and the needles on their mock meters passed the 1.0 mark. But still, the UFO was just as far away as it had ever been. The chase went on for a few minutes more before the pilots pulled their throttles back into the cruise position, turned, and came home. Even before they landed, the people at the airbase saw the big, round and bright UFO rapidly begin to fade and then it was gone. So ended the glamour, and the dog work began. Each man who had seen the UFO visually was carefully interrogated. Weather reports were collected. Radar scope photos were developed. The two pilots received special attention. The exact bearing of the UFO was measured, and 300 degrees magnetic was correct. The bundle of data was packed up and sent to Project Blue Book. The panel of experts convened. First, the radar scope photos were examined. Those targets could be interference from other radars, said the radar expert, and he mentally ticked off a dozen and one other similar cases of known interference. The weather data and locations and frequencies of other radars were checked out. 
Beyond doubt it was interference from another radar that caused the target. Now the visual sighting. Balloon? No, the fighters could have caught a balloon in seconds. Airplane? Same answer. These jets were the fastest things in the air. Planet or star? Out came the almanacs, and the puzzle went to the astrophysicist. Venus was on a bearing of 300 degrees from the Duluth Municipal Airport at 5.20 p.m. on March 23rd. But Venus was just below the horizon at that time, and the observers said the UFO was moving fast. Once again, the weather charts were studied. The atmospheric conditions were such that it was very possible that, due to refraction, Venus would have been visible just on the horizon. The fact that the UFO faded so fast would bear this out, because the conditions for such refraction are critical, and a slight change in atmospheric conditions could easily have caused the planet to disappear. The speed. A common illusion. Further interrogation of the observers showed it had never moved. So the history of the UFO is almost brought up to date. End of chapter 18 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 19 of The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt Chapter 19 Off They Go Into the Wild Blue Yonder At 12.30 p.m. on Thursday, November 20th, 1952, history was made. At least, so says George Adamski, lecturer on philosophy and student of technical matters and astronomy. At 12.30 p.m. on Thursday, November 20th, 1952, George Adamski was the first man on earth to talk to a Venusian. At least, so says George Adamski. I was chief of Project Blue Book at the time, and the name Professor Adamski, he had a title then, wasn't new to me. He or some of his followers had been showering the Air Force with photos of flying saucers. Letters by the gross were coming in demanding recognition of the great professor and an analysis of his photos. We obliged, and the photos were examined by the experts at Wright-Patterson Photo Reconnaissance Labs. The verdict came back, They could be genuine, of course, but they also could have been easily faked by a ten-year-old with a brownie camera. For a few weeks we forgot George Adamski, but then the press began to clamor at our gates. The news was leaking out of Southern California. George Adamski had talked to a Venusian. We held out for a long time, but the pressure mounted, and I headed for California to find out what it was all about. As far as George Adamski was concerned, I was just another thirsty sightseer from the famous observatory on Mount Palomar when I walked into the little restaurant at the foot of this famous mountain one day in 1953. The four-stool restaurant, with a few tables, where Adamski worked as a handyman, was crowded when I arrived, and he was circulating around serving beer and picking up empty bottles. There was no doubt as to who he was, because his fame had spread. To the dozen almost reverently spoken queries, Are you Adamski? He modestly nodded his head. Small questions about the flying saucer photos for sale from convenient racks led to more questions, and before long the good professor had taken a position in the middle of the room and was off and running. In his slightly broken English he told how he was the son of poor Polish immigrants with hardly any formal education. 
To look at the man and to listen to his story, you had an immediate urge to believe him. Maybe it was his appearance. He was dressed in well-worn but neat overalls. He had slightly graying hair and the most honest pair of eyes I've ever seen. Or maybe it was the way he told his story. He spoke softly and naively, almost pathetically, giving the impression that most people think I'm crazy, but honestly, I'm really not. Adamski started his story by telling how he had spent many long and cold nights at his telescope at the request of the government trying to photograph one of the flying saucers everyone had been talking about. He'd been successful, as the full photograph racks on the wall showed, and he thought the next step would be to actually try to contact a saucer. For some reason, Adamski didn't know exactly why, on November 19th he'd decided to go out into the Mojave Desert. He'd called some friends and told them to meet him there. By noon the next day, the party, which consisted of Adamski and six others, had met and were eating lunch near the town of Desert Center on the California-Arizona border. They looked for saucers, but except for an occasional airplane, the cloudless blue sky was empty. They were about ready to give it up as a bad day when another airplane came over. Again they looked up, but this time, in addition to seeing the airplane, they saw a silvery, cigar-shaped flying saucer. For some reason, again he didn't know why, the group of people moved down the road where Adamski left them and took off into the desert alone. By this time the spaceship had disappeared and once again Adamski was about to give up. Then a flash of light caught his eye and a smaller saucer, he later learned it was a scout ship, came drifting down and landed about a half mile from him. He swung his camera into action and started to take pictures. Unfortunately, the one picture Adamski had to show was so out of focus the scout ship looked like a desert rock. He took a few more pictures, he told his audience, and had stopped to admire the little scout ship when he suddenly noticed a man standing nearby. Now even those in the crowded restaurant who had been smirking when he started his story had put down their beers and were listening. This is what they had come to hear. You could actually have heard the proverbial pin drop. Adamski told what went through his mind when he first saw the man, maybe a prospector. But he noticed the man's long, shoulder-length, sandy-colored hair, his dark skin, his oriental features, and his ski-pant-type trousers. He was puzzled. Then it came to his mind like a flash. He was looking at a person from some other world. Through mental pictures, sign language, and a few words of English, Adamski found out the man was from Venus. He was friendly, and that they, the Venusians, were worried about radiation from our atomic bombs. They talked. George pointed to his camera, but the man from Venus politely refused to be photographed. Adamski pleaded to go into the ship to see how it operated, but the Venusian refused this, too. They talked some more, of spaceships and of solar systems, before Adamski walked with his newfound friend to the saucer and saw the Venusian off into space. At this point, Adamski recalled how he had glanced up in the sky to see the air full of military aircraft. Needless to say, the rest of Adamski's party, who had supposedly seen the contact from a mile away, were excited. They rushed up to him, and it was then that they noticed the footprints. Plainly imprinted in the desert sand were curious markings made by ridges on the soles of the Venusian's shoes. At the urging of the crowd in the restaurant, Adamski took an old shoe box out from under the counter. One of his party that day had just happened to have some plaster of Paris 
and the shoe-box contained plaster casts of shoe-prints with strange, hieroglyphic-like symbols on the soles. No one in the restaurant asked how the weight of a mere man could make such sharp imprints in the dry, coarse desert sand. Next he showed the sworn statements of the witnesses, and the crowd moved in around him for a better look. As I left he was graciously filling people in on more details, and the cash register was merrily ringing up saucer picture sales. I didn't write the trip off as a complete loss. The weather in California was beautiful. Adamski held the UFO spotlight for some time. The Venusians paid him another visit, this time at the restaurant, and he photographed their ship. This, whether by Venusian fate or design, increased the flow of traffic to the restaurant at the base of Mount Palomar. It also had its side effects. An astronomer from the observatory that houses the world-famous 200-inch telescope on top of Mount Palomar told me, I hate to admit it, but the number of weekend visitors has picked up here. People drive down to hear George and decide that since they're down here, they might as well come up and see our establishment. But George Adamski didn't hold the front center of the stage for long. In rapid succession, others stepped forward and hesitantly admitted that they too had been contacted. Truman Bethurum, a journeyman mechanic of Redondo Beach, California, was next up. Actually, he admitted, he had been the first Earthman to talk to a person from another world. Back on the night of July 26, 1952, four months before Adamski, a group of eight or ten short, olive-skinned men with black wavy hair had awakened him while he was asleep in a truck in the desert near Mormon Flats, Nevada. These little men, unlike Adamski's, spoke any language. "'You name it,' they'd quipped to Bethurum. "'We speak it.' In a newspaper article that was voted Best Read of 1953, Bethurum told how the little man he met had been more cooperative and had actually taken him into their saucer, a huge job, 300 feet in diameter and 16 feet high. Once inside, Bethurum had met the captain of the scow, a true leader of men. Aura Rains was her name, and she was a Venus de Milo with arms and warm blood. When she spoke, her words rhymed. They chatted, and Bethurum learned that he was on the Admiral Scow, the command ship of Clarion's fleet of saucers. All in all, Bethurum made eleven visits to Aura's Scow. Each time, they'd sit and talk. Bethurum told her about the Earth, and she told of the idyllic Shangri-La-type planet of Clarion, a yet undiscovered planet which is always opposite the moon. But before too long, both Truman Bethurum and George Adamski had to move over. Daniel Fry, an engineer, stepped in. At a press conference to kick off the International Saucer Convention in Los Angeles, Fry told how he had not only contacted the spacemen two years before Adamski and Bethurum, he had actually ridden in a flying saucer. It had all started on the night of July 4, 1950, when Engineer Fry was temporarily employed at White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico. It was a hot night, and with nothing else to do, Fry decided to take a walk across the desert. He hadn't traveled far when he saw a bluish light hovering over the mountains, which rimmed this famous proving ground. He paid no attention. He'd heard flying saucer stories before, and just plain didn't believe them. But as he watched, the light came closer and closer and closer, until a weird craft came silently to rest on the desert floor not seventy feet away. For seconds, Fry, 
who had seen missile-age developments at White Sands that would have dumbfounded most laymen, merely stood and stared. The object, Fry told newsmen, was an ovate spheroid about thirty feet at the equator. Fry has a habit of drifting off into the technical. Its outside surface was a highly polished silver with a slight violet iridescent glow. At first Fry wanted to run, but his rigid technical training overrode his common natural urges. He decided to go over to the object and see what made it tick. He circled it several times, and nothing broke the desert silence. Then he touched it. "'Better not touch that hull, pal. It's hot,' boomed a voice in a Hollywoodian tone. Fry recoiled. The voice softened and added, "'Take it easy, pal. You're among friends.' After politely reading off the spaceman, or whoever he was, for scaring him, Pal Fry and the voice settled down for a friendly moonlight chat. Fry learned that the voice was indeed that of a spaceman, and they were down to pick up a new supply of air. After about four years of earth air transfusions, according to the spaceman, they would become adapted to our atmosphere and our gravity, and become immunized to your biotics. The craft, Fry was told, was a cargo carrier, unmanned and built to zoom down and scoop up earth air. The conversation went on, waxing technical at times, and ended with an invitation to look into the ship. Then the spaceman, possibly carried away by all the interest Fry was showing, offered a ride. Fry accepted, and they anti-demagnetized off for New York City. Thirty minutes later they were back at White Sands. Over New York City they came down from thirty-five to twenty miles, and Fry could read the marquee of the Fulton Theater. The seven-year itch was playing. He hadn't told the Air Force about his ride before, because he was afraid he'd lose his job. But at the press conference, he did plug his new book, The White Sands Incident. By this time, Adansky had already published his book, Flying Saucers Have Landed, and it looked as if Fry was going to cut him out. But Fry took a lie detector test on a widely viewed West Coast television show and flunked it flat. His stock dropped as fast as it had risen, but the decline was somewhat checked when a well-known Southern California medium wrote to her old friend J. Edgar Hoover about the situation. Hoover, the story goes, shot back an answer. Lie detectors are no good. But the damage had been done. The rigged lie detector test had unfortunately relegated Daniel Fry, engineer, missile expert, part owner of an engineering plant, and interplanetary hitchhiker to the Bush League. With Adamski and Bethurum on the stage and Fry peeking out of the wings, all hell broke loose. One could say that everyone tried to get into the act, but I'd rather think that each colony of space people tried to promote their own candidate. In England, one Cedric Allingham met a Martian on the Moors. In France, Germany, the United States, Portugal, Brazil, Spain, everywhere, people too uneducated to pull a hoax met green men, dark men, white men, big men with little heads, little men with big heads, and men with pointed heads. They wore motorcycle belts, baggy pants, diver suits, and were naked. One lady proudly announced that a Venusian had tried to seduce her, and within days another snorted in disgust. A Martian had seduced her. Then Adamski took a hop through outer space and back. 
saucers poured forth words of wisdom via radio, light beams, and mental telepathy. All of these messages were duly recorded on tape, and sales were hot at $4.50 per 10-minute tape. Not to be outdone by any other lousy planet, the Venusians picked up a young man from Los Angeles and actually took him to Venus. Not once, but three times. He packed in audiences by telling how he had been contacted one night and asked by a strange man if he would go on an important mission. Afraid, but not one to shirk his patriotic duties, he met the stranger at a prearranged spot and was whisked off to Venus. During a high-level conference up there, he was given the word, Tell the Earthlings to lay off their atomic weapons, or else... They're killing all our doves, and we make our flying saucers out of the feathers our live doves shed. The Venusians, this space traveler warned his audiences, were already infiltrating the Earth, and he intimated that they were ready to move in case we didn't cease atomic testing. His next two trips to Venus were purely social. The highlight of his lecture, when he awes his audience, is when he whips out his proof. One, a blood smear on a slide, genuine Venusian blood. Two, an affidavit from his landlady stating he wasn't home on three occasions. And three, a photo of a Venusian walking in Los Angeles's MacArthur Park. The mere fact that the Venusian looks like any Joe Dokes walking down the street is a picayunish point. Venusians look just like us. And it hasn't stopped. During the big UFO flap of 1957, a man stumbled into a landing saucer and chatted a while with its occupants. A few months later, soon after the atomic-powered USS Nautilus made its historic trip under the polar ice cap, this same man snorted in disgust. He packed his suitcase and started on a lecture tour. Months before, he'd been there in a flying saucer. Once again, people shelled out hard cash to hear his story. Wherever you are, Mr. P.T. Barnum, you are undoubtedly grinning from ear to ear. But there is a sober side to this apparently comical picture. The common undertone to many of these stories hot from the lips of a spaceman, is utopia. On these other worlds there is no illness, and they've learned how to cure all diseases. There are no wars, they've learned how to live peaceably, there is no poverty, everyone has everything he wants, there is no old age, they've learned the secret of eternal life. Too many times this subtle pitch can be boiled down to, Step right up, folks, and put a donation in the pot. I'm just on the verge of learning the spaceman's secrets, and with a little money to carry out my work, I'll give you the secret. I've seen a man, crippled by arthritis, hobbling out into the desert in hopes that his friend who talks to the Martians could get them to cure him on their next trip. I've seen pensioners, who needed every buck they had, shell out money to help buy radio equipment, to contact some planet to find out how they'd solve their economic problems. I saw a little old lady in a many times mended dress put down a ten dollar bill to help promote a peace campaign backed by the Venusians. She'd lost two sons in the war, but had four grandsons she wanted to keep alive. A couple died and left $15,000 to a man to build a longevity machine so others could live. The Martians had given him the plans. A woman died of thirst and exposure in the Mojave Desert, trying to reach the spot where a man told her he was going to make a contact. Some of it isn't comical. Even though the field is becoming crowded, through thick and thin, Martian and Venusian, 
the old maestro, George Adamski, is still head and shoulders above the rest. The hamburger stand is boarded up, and he lives in a big ranch house. He vacations in Mexico and has his own clerical staff. His two books, Flying Saucers Have Landed and Inside the Spaceships, have sold something in the order of 200,000 copies and have been translated into nearly every language except Russian. To date, he's had 11 visits from people from Mars, Venus, and Saturn. Evidently, Truman Bethurum's Aura Reigns put out the word about Earthmen because two beautiful space women have now entered Adamski's life. An incredibly lovely blonde named Kalna and the equally beautiful Ilmuth. Only a few months ago, while on one of his numerous nationwide lecture tours, a saucer unexpectedly picked Adamski up in Kansas City and took him on a galactic cruise before depositing him at Fort Madison, Iowa, where he had a lecture date. He wowed the packed auditorium with his proof, an unused Kansas City to Fort Madison train ticket. Last week in the Netherlands, Adamski's nationwide tours have expanded to worldwide tours, he repeated his exploits to Queen Juliana. But at Buckingham Palace, Mr. Barnum, all he saw was the changing of the guard. End of chapter 19 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 20 of The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt. Chapter 20 Do They or Don't They? During the past four years, the most frequent question I've been asked is What do you personally think? Do unidentified flying objects exist, or don't they? I'm positive they don't. I was very skeptical when I finished my tour of active duty with the Air Force and left Project Blue Book in 1953, but now I'm convinced. Since I left the Air Force, the age of the satellite has arrived, and we're in it. Along with this new era came the long-range radars, the satellite tracking cameras, and the other instruments that would have picked up any type of spaceship coming into our atmosphere. None of this instrumentation has ever given any indication of any type of unknown vehicle entering the Earth's atmosphere. I checked this with the Department of Defense, and I checked this through friends associated with tracking projects. In both cases, the results were completely negative. There's not even a glimmer of hope for the UFO. Then there's Project Moonwatch, the optical satellite tracking program for the International Geophysical Year. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, the director of Moonwatch, wrote to me, I can quite safely say that we have no record of ever having received from our Moonwatch teams any reports of sightings of unidentified objects which had any characteristics different from those of an orbiting satellite, a slow meteor, or of a suspected plane mistaken for a satellite. Dr. Hynek should know. He has investigated and analyzed more UFO reports than any other scientist in the world. And the third convincing point is that 12 years have passed since the first UFO report was made and still there is not one shred of material evidence of anything unknown and no photos of anything other than meaningless blobs of light. The next question that always arises is, but people are seeing something. Experienced observers like pilots, scientists, and radar operators have reported UFOs. To be very frank, we heard the words experienced observer so many times these words soon began to make us ill. Everyone, except housewives with myopia, were experienced observers. Pilots, scientists, a term used equally as loosely, 
engineers, radar operators, everyone who reported a UFO was some kind of an experienced observer. This man had taught aircraft recognition during World War II. He was an experienced observer. That man spent four years in the Air Force. He was an experienced observer. We soon learned that everyone is an experienced observer as long as what he sees is familiar to him. As soon as he sees something unfamiliar, it's a UFO. Pilots probably come as close to falling into this category as anyone, since they do spend a lot of time looking around the sky. But even those who can rattle off the names and locations of stars, planets, and constellations don't know about a few relatively rare astronomical phenomena. The bolide, or supermeteor, is a good example. Few pilots have ever, or will ever, see a deluxe model bolide, but when they do, they'll never forget it. It's like something shooting a flare in front of your face. There are a number of reports of bolides in the Blue Book files, and each pilot who made each report called each bolide a UFO. The descriptions are almost identical to the classic descriptions of bolides found in astronomy books. While on the subject of meteors, if most people realized that meteors can have a flat trajectory, they can go from horizon to horizon, they can travel in formation or groups, and they can be seen in daylight as large silver disks, the work of UFO investigators would be lighter. Enough of meteors, and back to our experienced observers. The example of pilots and bolides holds true in many, many other cases. Take high-flying jets, for example. To a person in an area where there isn't much high-altitude air traffic, a thin, blood-red streak in the sky at sunset, or shortly after, is a UFO. To anyone in an area where there are a lot of high-flying jets, even our myopic housewife, it's just another vapor trail. They're as common as the sunset. When the flashing red strobe lights, now used on practically all aircraft, were still in the experimental stage back in 1951, they gave us fits. Every time an airplane with one of these flashing lights made a flight, people within miles, including other pilots, called in UFO reports. Now these strobe lights are common, and no one even bothers to look up. The same held true, and still does, for the odd array of lights used on tanker planes during aerial refueling operations. Some phenomena are so rare and so little is known about them that they are always UFOs. The most common is the disk following the airplane. I've never heard an explanation for this phenomenon, but it exists, and I've seen it on three occasions. Maybe a dense blob of air tears off the airplane, floats along behind, and reflects the sunlight. Whatever it is, it gives the illusion of a saucer chasing an airplane. Sometimes it's steady, and sometimes it darts back and forth. It only stays in view a few seconds, and when it disappears, it fades and looks for all the world as if it's suddenly streaking away into the distance. Birds, bees, bugs, airplanes, planets, stars, balloons, and a host of other common everyday objects become UFOs the instant they are viewed under other than normal situations. Then there is radar. This poor inanimate piece of electronic equipment has taken a beating when UFO proof is being offered. Radar is not subject to the frailties of the human mind, is the outcry of every saucer fan, and radar has seen UFOs. Radar is no better than the radar observer, and the radar observer has a mind. And where there's a mind, there is the same old trouble. If the presentation on the radar scope doesn't look like it has looked for years, a UFO is being tracked. Radar is temperamental. The scope presentation of each radar has certain peculiarities, and an operator gets used to seeing these. 
occasionally, and for some unknown reason, these peculiarities suddenly change. For months, a temperature inversion may cause 50 or 75 targets to appear on the radar scope. The operator has learned to recognize them and knows that they are caused by weather. They are not UFOs. But overnight something changes, and now this same temperature inversion causes only one or two targets. The operator isn't used to seeing this, and the targets are now UFOs. Many times we'd stumble across the fact that after the first report of a UFO being tracked on radar, the same identical type of target would be tracked again many times. But by this time, the operator would have learned that they were caused by weather and it wouldn't be reported to us. It is interesting to note that, to my knowledge, there has never been a radar sighting classed as unknown when radar scope photos were taken. The reason is simple. The radar operator can take ample time to re-examine what he had to interpret in seconds during the actual sighting. Also, more experienced radar operators have a chance to examine the scope presentation. Mixed in with the fact that there are few really qualified observers on this earth is the power of suggestion. About the time someone yells, UFO, and points, all powers of reasoning come to a screeching halt. We saw this happen day after day. Few people I ever talked to, once they had decided they were looking at a UFO, stopped to calmly say to themselves, Now, couldn't this be a balloon, star, planet, or something else explainable? In one instance, I traveled halfway across the United States to investigate a report made by a high-ranking man in the State Department, an experienced observer. It was evening by the time I got to talk to him, and after he'd excitedly told me all the pertinent facts, how this bright fight had jumped across the sky, he said, Want to see it? It's still there, but it's not jumping now. We went outside, and there was Jupiter. Then there was the UFO over Dayton, Ohio, in the summer of 1952. I first heard about it at home. It was about six in the evening when the phone rang, and it was one of the tower operators at Patterson Field. The tower operators at Lockbourne Air Force Base in Columbus, Ohio, 60 miles east of Dayton, had spotted three fiery spheres flying in a V formation over their base. Two F-84s had been scrambled to intercept, and they were in the air right now. So far, the tower operator told me, the intercept had been unsuccessful, because the objects were traveling two to three thousand miles an hour and were too high for the old F-84s. He was monitoring the two jets' radio conversation and he puts his telephone near the speaker. I heard, At twenty-eight thousand and still above us. High speed. Headed toward Wright Patterson. Low on fuel. Going home. I made it to my car in record time and took off toward Wright-Patterson, about twelve miles from where I was living. It was still light, although the sun was low, and as I drove I kept looking toward the east. Nothing. I reached the gate, showed my pass to the guard, and had just written the whole thing off as another UFO report when I saw them. They convinced me. Off to the east of the airbase were three objects that can best be described as three half-sized suns. By the time I arrived at base operations, there were three or four dozen people on the ramp, all looking up. The standard comment was, Look at them go! About this time, a C-54 transport taxied up and stopped. It was the Kitty Hawk flight from Washington and I knew several people who got off. One passenger, an officer from ATIC, ran up to me and handed me a roll of film. "'Here's some pictures of them,' he said breathlessly. "'I never thought I'd see one.' The next passengers I recognized were two other officers, 
Ph.D. psychologists from the Aero Medical Laboratory. I knew them because they had visited Blue Book many times, collecting data for a paper they were writing on UFOs. The title of the paper was to be The Psychological Aspects of UFO Sightings. Almost climbing over each other in their effort to tell their story, they told me how they had watched the UFOs from the C-54. Both had seen them dogfighting between themselves. "'How fast were they going?' I asked. "'Like hell!' was their only answer, but the way they said it and the looks on their faces emphasized their statement. The crowd on the ramp had increased by now, and some of the newcomers had binoculars. The men with the binoculars were the focal point of several individual groups as they watched and gave blow-by-blow -blow accounts. Some of the crowd were talking about jet fighters, and it suddenly dawned on me that just across the parking lot was the operations office of the local ADC jet outfit, the 97th Fighter Interceptor Squadron. I ran over to Interceptor Operations and went in. I knew the duty officer because several times before the 97th people had chased balloons over Dayton. When I told him about the UFOs, all I received was a rather uninterested stare. When I said they were over the base, he did me the courtesy of going out to look. He came running back in and hit the scramble button. Three minutes later, two F-86s were heading UFO-ward. They soon disappeared, but their vapor trails kept the tense crowd informed of their progress. And believe me, there was tension. As the vapor trail spiraled up, first as two distinct plumes, and later only one, as they blended at altitude, more than one pilot standing on the ramp expressed his thankfulness for his unenviable position, on the ground, watching. The vapor trails thinned out and disappeared right under the three UFOs, and it was obvious that the two jets had closed in. Here were three that didn't escape. That night the 97th Fighter Interceptor Squadron added three more balloons to their record. The F-86s had been able to climb higher than the F-84s. The next morning photos confirmed the balloons. They had been tethered together and carried an instrument package. I had been fooled. Two Ph.D. psychologists who had studied UFOs had been fooled. A C-54 load of experienced observers, many pilots, had been fooled. The tower operators had been fooled, and so had a hundred others. This was an interesting sighting, and we used to discuss it a lot. All of the observers later agreed that what made them so excited was the tower operator's announcement, F-84s from Lockbourne are chasing three high-speed objects. This set the stage, and from then on no one even considered the fact that if the objects had been traveling 2,000 or 3,000 miles an hour, they would have been long gone in the 15 minutes we watched them. Secondly, I found out that the C-54, a slow airplane, had actually overtaken and passed the balloons between Columbus and Dayton, but none of the passengers I talked to had stopped to think of this. And I'm positive that in our minds the balloons, which were about 40 feet in diameter and at 40,000 feet, looked a lot larger than they actually were. I know the power of suggestion plays an important role in UFO sightings. Once you're convinced you're looking at a UFO, you can see a lot of things. But then there's the unknowns. Any good saucer fan, wild-eyed or sober, will magnanimously concede that a certain percentage of the UFO sightings are the misidentification of known objects. They drag out the unknowns as the proof. Technically speaking, an unknown report is one that has been made by a reliable observer, not necessarily experienced. The report has been exhaustively investigated and analyzed, and there is no logical explanation. 
To this, the Air Force says, the Air Force emphasizes the belief that if more immediate detailed objective observational data could have been obtained on the unknowns, these too could have been satisfactorily explained. I think the case of the Lubbock Lights is an excellent example of this. It is probably one of the most thoroughly investigated reports in the UFO files, and it contained the most precise observational data we ever received. Scientists from far and near tried to solve it. It remained an unknown. The men who made the original sighting stuck by the case and furnished the more detailed objective observational data the Air Force speaks of. The mysterious lights appeared again, and instead of looking for something high in the air, they looked for something low and found the solution. The world-famous Lubbock lights were night-flying moths reflecting the bluish-green light of a nearby row of mercury-vapor streetlights. I will go a step further than the Air Force, however, and quote from a letter from ex-Lieutenant Andy Flues, once an investigator for Project Blue Book. Flues's statement sums up my beliefs and, I'm quite sure, the beliefs of everyone who has ever worked on Project's sign, grudge, or blue book. Flues wrote, Even taking into consideration the highly qualified backgrounds of some of the people who made sightings, there was not one single case which, upon the closest analysis, could not be logically explained in terms of some common object or phenomenon. The only reason there are any unknowns in the UFO files is that an effort is made to be scientific in making evaluations. And being scientific doesn't allow for any educated assuming of missing data or the passing of judgment on the character of the observer. However, this is closely akin to being forced to follow the Marquis of Queensbury rules in a fight with a hood. The investigation of any UFO sighting is an inexact science at the very best. Any UFO investigator, after a few months of being steeped in UFO lore and allowed a few scientific rabbit punches, can make the best of the unknowns look like a piece of well-holed Swiss cheese. But regardless of what I say, or what the Air Force says, or what anyone says, we are stuck with flying saucers. And as long as people report unidentified objects in the air, it's the Air Force's responsibility to explain them. Project Blue Book will live on. No responsible scientist will argue with the fact that other solar systems may be inhabited and that someday we may meet those people. But it hasn't happened yet, and until that day comes, we're stuck with our space-age myth, the UFO. End of Chapter 20 Recording by Roger Moline. End of The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppelt.